finish. Um, I'm Ali Fatemi from the Kennedy Krieger Institute and um, was asked to moderate the morning session. So um, just a couple of housekeeping things. Um, first thing is that apparently if you hold the microphone down here, uh, that's when you can't hear. So yesterday it was on and off. That's because people are holding it down here. So hold it up there. Stays there. It's hard to read these days. Second thing is we're going to do, uh, because breakfast came late, we're going to do two, two micro breaks instead of one in the morning. So we're going to have the PMD group go first. Then we're going to take a little break. Um, I'll make sure everybody comes back. Otherwise, there might be consequences. And uh, then we'll do 4-H syndrome and salad disease. And then we'll take another break just before lunch um, to do the top, top 4-A. Uh, so we're going to get started with the PMD group, and the, and the work group leader is Dr. Nicole Wall from Amsterdam. Oh, here you are. And I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Ali. Um, oh, one more thing. I'm sorry. <laughs> I only want coffee. So uh, Dr. Vandenberg reminded me that for those of you who had the privilege to collect these pins, I only have one, by the way, just in case somebody wants to give me one, um, please show up after lunch with her and so she can count the number of pins you have received okay thank you okay thank you ali good morning everyone and welcome to the uh, pmd session um, um i will introduce uh, the session as you uh, saw it yesterday um we have uh, a colleague from uh, germany gesine Zaher who will tell us about uh, disease models um, and pathophysiology as one of the key successes. Um, one of the challenges is how do we plan... Oh, well. Okay, is it better now? Yes. Good. 
So, uh, Chloe, uh, Stuttart from Australia will talk about uh, the challenge of uh, planning clinical trials in an ultra-rare disease because some things are um, up and coming. And um, we heard uh, yesterday already several times the challenges um, uh, we, we see, um, for example, relating to geographical locations. Uh, Jigyasha Sinha from uh, Kolkata will talk about um, the challenges in the developing world. I thank uh, the work group members who all made time um, to uh, contribute to that session. So um, I think Pilitzer's Merzbacher disease or PMD is perhaps even the oldest uh, leukodystrophy. It was described in 1885 in a beautiful a uh, long clinical description by Pelizeus, and in 1915, the um, neuropathology was uh, um, elucidated. And also, uh, it's a beautiful paper with a lot of uh, uh, illustrations. Uh, and uh, the myelin lack and the fact that it's an X-linked uh, disease were already recognized then. Uh, we have a, quite a range of phenotypes from conatal Pelizeus Merzbacher disease presenting right after birth to milder forms, spastic paraplegia type one, type two, sorry. Um, it is said that the most frequent uh, variation, genetic variation, is duplication of the PLP1 gene. Uh, otherwise, we see emissions mutations, <coughs> deep intronic variants, and deletions. I think the la latter ones are quite rare. Typically, a uh, clinical presentation is uh, in early childhood or infancy with nystagmus. Um, developmental delay, hypotonia, progressing to spasticity, and ataxia. Uh, heterozygous females may manifest uh, mild to moderate signs of the disease, um, usually from adulthood. There is some genotype-phenotype correlation, but um, it's still um, difficult if we have a um, PRP1 variant to predict the disease, if it's a private variant. And perhaps I should mention that all, uh, more or less, all uh, genetic variants in PLP1 are pathogenic because it's uh, an extremely well-conserved protein. Um, there is an um, active uh, PMD community, um, a large patient population where it's not one of the ultra-rare diseases. We have rarer leukodystrophies, <coughs> of course, but it's a rare disease. Um, we have a, a clinical heterogeneity, um, but we still lack biomarkers, um, and uh, MRI biomarkers perhaps are a good way to monitor treatment successes. Um, there is one planned clinical trial repurposing Deferipron in the Netherlands, in our center, and there are approaches to start a treatment trial with um, antisense oligonucleotides. Um, I think uh, that um, one of the uh, biggest challenges are, um, is that um, we have uh, those symptomatic uh, female carriers um, uh, who are often not recognized as having symptoms due to their um, PLP1 variant. I think that's very similar to the situation in uh, adrenal leukodystrophy, and also the clinical presentation is very similar. Newborn screening is not yet uh, um, thought of, and uh, we, we still need disease-specific uh, standards of care in Pelizeus Merzbacher disease. Uh, the heat map re regarding the disease-modifying uh, therapeutic pa pathway is relatively green, so I was glad to see that because <laughs> in the next uh, session about 4-H, that looks really different. But um, we, we have uh, not yet access to disease-modifying therapies. And I think the access to diagnosis is very variable depending uh, on in what part of the world you are in. So um, I would stop here um, to, to keep it short and ask uh, Dr. Saher from uh, Göttingen uh, to tell us about the disease models. All right. So <clears throat> good morning again. Thank you for inviting me to this very stimulating. Can you hear me all right? Yeah? No? Um, session or meeting. Um, thank you for organizing this. Thanks to Omar. Thanks to all of this organizing team. And thank you, Nicole, for um, giving me the, uh, the opportunity. So I'm um, a 
researcher from, from Germany in, at the Max Planck Institute in the laboratory of Klaus Nave. Um, and I know that you don't need any introduction to myelin. Um, it's just two things I want to emphasize here. So if we talk about myelin, we also talk about lipids, because, uh, and especially cholesterol, because 70% of the brain cholesterol resides in myelin membranes. And moreover, um, particularly, it's PLP that directly associates with cholesterol. So you cannot, if you have a problem with um, PLP, you often have a problem with cholesterol. And the other thing I wanted to emphasize here is that, of course, you all know that myelin is there to um, allow saltatory impulse conduction, but it also um, reduces the energy demand of axons to fulfill this task. And this is um, uh, often a problem, I think, when, when it comes to neurodegeneration or damage to axons, that um, there could be an energy problem. Okay, you know, um, Nicole has told you this, and also that um, the mutations in the PLP gene um, can be very variable. I mean, there's a large spectrum of disease, um, or of mutations, and also of uh, disease presentations. Um, and this, um, to, to model this in, in uh, animal models, this led to the development of several um, models um, for conatal and more milder forms um, of the disease. And several uh, mutations have been introduced, many of which were spontaneous mu uh, mutations. So they were just being found. Um, we have uh, models in different species, like mice, rats, rabbits, dogs, monkeys. And of course, also patient-derived material um, will be instrumental in, in um, elucidating the mutation-specific pathology. So um, we have, although we have so many models, each of these uh, models uh, models only different aspects of the human disease, and none of um, these models will model the entire disease, which is, I mean, likely and has been um, uh, alluded to um, yesterday as well for other diseases. Um, but nevertheless, <clears throat> um, they are instrumental in, in understanding the mechanisms of pathogenesis in these models. And then, of course, for preclinical trials, evaluate the safety and efficacy uh, of potential um, drugs. So um, when we have a closer look at the myelination process uh, in the normal uh, wild-type situation in mice and also in men. Um, PLP here in this blue um, dot associates with cholesterol, and they get transported to the plasma membrane and then to the developing myelin sheath. And in this cross-section to the spinal cord of a normal mouse, you see there's myelination. And this is very different in case of uh, a PMD mouse model, in this case, um, an over PLP overexpression mouse, which models uh, the duplication situation most closely. So you see here that there's no myelin, and most of the PLP is uh, residing within the cell. So in case of the overexpression situation, this leads to an accumulation of PLP in the cell linked to an accumulation of cholesterol within the cell. And this um, perturbs the, um, the homeostasis also of lipids and of cholesterol trafficking within the cell. In case of other mutations of uh, the PLP, um, the relevance of the cholesterol homeostasis might not be so um, um, so pressing. However, what you can see is that not as a wild type PLP that gets transported to the plasma membrane here in cell culture, um, many of these mutant PLP forms uh, remain retained intracellularly, and in this case here uh, in the ER. And this, of course, uh, induces a stress response in the oligodendrocyte. So there are um, of course, mutation-specific stress responses, and we are far from understanding all these uh, differences here. But uh, what you can see is that there is cell stress, and um, sooner or later, um, it's very likely that this will lead to a loss of oligodendrocytes. Um, and coupled to this, 
there is uh, poor trafficking of PLP to the myelin sheath, and uh, we have poor myelination and thin myelin sheaths. And this is coupled, uh, um, of course, to the stress response here. So, but this is not the end of the story. Um, although we quite maybe understand the main uh, processes in the PMD uh, oligodendrocytes, this of course will lead to um, an inflammatory gliosis um, uh, triggered by um, the loss of oligodendrocytes, the loss of um, myelin, because the, the PMD myelin is often not stable. Um, so we have here a stress response, and this can, of course, add to the, <clears throat> add to the problem because uh, with disease chronicity, also microglia um, clean or the microglia cleanup of um, uh, debris um, uh, um, will, I mean, exhaust the whole system of uh, this repair will exhaust, and then finally. Um, this uh, is observed in mouse models as well as in patients that there's um, that this whole situation damages the axon and also um, the neuron and um, this is here shown in this electron micrographs where you can see here in this high pressure uh, material um, these like innocent looking circles these are the mitochondria and what you can see here in the uh, in a very young PMD um, overexpressor PLP overexpressor mouse that the mitochondria profiles are enlarged they are swollen and this is also uh, or this often reflects the functional uh, damage of this these organelles and lead finally to accumulation of uh, material in the axons and new degeneration. So if we look uh, at this disease situation uh, more closely, what could be potential strategies to ameliorate PMD? Um, and um, coming from this um, cell bio biology point of view, we can, of course, um, go down right to the core of the disease, so correct the mutant PLP. And as Nicole already said, there are several uh, strategies uh, to suppress uh, the gene expression, for example, um, by, which has been shown in, in mice by uh, Ken. He's somewhere. I don't see him. Uh, and also by Paul. Paul's lab, Paul's Isar's lab. Uh, there are cell-based uh, strategies, so uh, transplantation of um, stem cells or neural spheres. Um, then um, there's a large topic of providing support to the oligodendrocyte in addition to correcting the PLP. Um, this is, of course, um, a really mixed bag. Um, so. Um, and depends a lot of the uh, um, initial mutation uh, in the PLP gene. So what, uh, what one can do is improve the PLP trafficking to the plasma membrane, reduce the stress response, or at least help the oligodendrocytes to cope with this uh, mutant PLP, and then prevent the death of oligodendrocytes. And there, as also Nicole said already, uh, iron chelators um, have been um, found to be very um, effective in preventing the ferroptosis process of oligodendrocytes. And there's um, um, another uh, means to support uh, the PMD oligodendrocyte, which is the cholesterol supplementation. This is stems from our lab and is restricted, I think, to um, duplication patients. And uh, this is applied to at least one patient in the, uh, which is um, um, hosted um, by Steffi Kulachewski, Drea Kulachewski in Göttingen. Um, and I think um, it is crucial that also um, the, I mean, the non-informal um, um, information is spread that, um, I, I mean, how, how do these patients um, um, cope with these treatments and, and whether it's, I mean, successful and to what degree. I think um, you have to talk to more to each other and, um, 
uh, provide more information to each other uh, beyond uh, what you uh, write into publications. Um, and then there's a large topic, again, to, to support axons, neurons, and microglia. And there um, we have also developed a treatment, which is a ketogenic diet. And um, a couple of patients across the world are receiving now ketogenic diet. This is in, um, so from north to south. Uh, I know of a patient in Hamburg uh, with, um, uh, and in Göttingen is another. Uh, patient, and also in Italy, in uh, beautiful Milano. There are several patients and probably more to come. And um, so this is what our, I mean, how our research has, um, I mean, of all of us, um, has uh, triggered the one or the other attempt to, to translate uh, our findings. There will be, of course, more to come. And I would like to share with you just um, briefly um, at uh, a, an application of um, a, a cholesterol a synthesis intermediate squalene here, uh, which we have found in um, MS models, uh, but MS models are in a way similar to uh, leukodystrophies because they involve the uh, loss and repair um, of myelin sheets. And, um, I don't want to go into detail, but the cholesterol synthesis pathway in microglial cells is uh, really crucial to drive uh, the repair of demyelinated lesions. And this is not mediated really by cholesterol, but by the immediate precursor, desmosterol, which then leads to an LXR response that um, does two things. It, it helps the cholesterol efflux from the um, microglia, which, always, uh, which uh, with disease chronicity often internalize so much cholesterol and lipids that they suffocate from all of this uh, phagocytes material. And it has also the potential to resolve the inflammation, which then can promote a remyelination. So um, we have found this in models of MS, but have also applied this to um, our PLP transgenic mice. And what you can see that um, um, it helps a lot in reducing the motor phenotype of our mice, and it also reduces the T cell infiltration and the uh, myeloid, myeloid cells um, in the brain as well as in the spinal cord. Um, this is remarkable because we uh, had in another treatment arm, we combined the squalene together with the ketogenic diet, and uh, this was as effectful uh, in these um, measures. And so what I can say to this, um, we are not at the end. There will be more ideas, more targets. There will maybe um, the combination therapy as um, um, something to think about, personalized treatments to the different mutations of PLP, new targets. And um, yeah, the future will tell us. OK, and then I thank you for your attention and hand over to Chloe. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Chloe Studdard, a clinical geneticist in Melbourne, Australia. I'm grateful for the opportunity to present this morning on behalf of the PMD Working Group. And I'm going to discuss one of the key challenges identified um, in managing uh, how to coordinate multiple clinical trials. So as we've uh, just heard so beautifully, thank you, um, there are um, uh, several potential disease-modifying interventions um, being identified in preclinical studies. Um, and the fact that um, we've identified the coordination of trials as a, as a key challenge um, reflects great progress in this field, which is exciting. Um, so as we've heard, currently available uh, and being trialled are uh, the uh, ketogenic diet. Um, and this uh, trial is based on the evidence um, that's been published 
um, in a mouse model where um, there was uh, amelioration of axonal defects and promotion of myelination and improved motor function um, with the use of the ketogenic diet being a, a form of lipid therapy um, that um, ketone bodies being able to pass the across the intact blood-brain barrier, which ex we'd expect um, in this disease. And uh, as we've heard, that's being trialled in a couple of countries, a couple of patients, as I understand, uh, with a shared protocol, common endpoints, and um, a plan for, um, I think, motor primary primary endpoints being motor outcomes and a plan for interim analysis after two years. Uh, and the other trial, soon to start in the Netherlands, as a proof of concept trial um, in patients with the conatal form, um, trialling for one year the use of uh, deferoprone, the small molecule iron chelator. And um, as we've heard, this is based on cell studies that uh, identified hallmarks of ferroptosis in oligodendrocytes from affected patients and then uh, benefit of treatment of mice, uh, the, of the mouse model, the GIMPI mouse model, um, with deferoprone and uh, the observation that it rescued oligodendrocyte cell death promoted and promoted myelination. Uh, so the, as I, um, this is a, a registered trial and uh, the primary um, endpoints being motor outcomes, secondary endpoints being uh, myelination on MRI and exploratory endpoints looking for biomarkers in the CSF and blood. And this recent publication which showed um, benefit in the, in the mouse model of uh, suppression of PLP1 expression um, and this was initially with the use of CRISPR-Cas9 gene suppression and then using an ASO and in that mouse model there was observed um, improvement in myelination and uh, extended life expectancy. So that's um, an exciting new avenue to pursue. So then um, these, this great progress poses the challenge of how to coordinate several trials simultaneously and we heard yesterday we're not alone in this situation um, but we need to think about how to prioritise which therapies to pursue in a trial, particularly if they're available therapies such as the, as the ketogenic diet, then there's going to be limited funding to pursue these trials and how to prioritise patients for each therapy and how to compare efficacy between these different approaches. Uh, so I've been involved in the PMD natural history study, the retrospective study run from CHOP, but I'm not currently running any uh, clinical trials uh, for treatments for PMD. So in considering this issue, I've drawn on experience from treatment of other monogenic diseases at our centre. Um, several of you will be familiar with the trials for SMA and know that there have been several trials running simultaneously for different therapies and are now to the point where we're looking at trials for combination therapies, which is exciting. Um, and in my situation as a geneticist in the molecular therapies group, to date a lot of our trials have been for skeletal dysplasias because uh, we have expertise in that field at, at our centre. And specifically for achondroplasia, I appreciate very different to PMD. Um, for those that aren't aware, that's the most common genetic cause of short stature um, with life-threatening complications but a much higher level of function So, and very clear um, uh, measurable endpoints, but uh, I guess we can still learn from the experience of running multiple trials simultaneously for different agents. Um, so currently there's four available therapies and we're running um, at least eight trials uh, with different subgroups, different ages, different endpoints. So I think what I've drawn from that um, and from my uh, discussions with our neuromuscular team, in fact, it was only that, that, in fact, we haven't faced a lot of difficulty in um, identifying patients for specific trials when they become available because of the different timing, um, because of several issues, so these considerations, uh, the specific mechanism of action of the intervention, its expected efficacy, uh, meaning having uh, endpoints, which endpoints um, 
are available to measure the mode of delivery and the burden of trial participation, and I'll speak a bit more to that. But in the case of SMA, in fact, it's only in the most recent application to ethics for a trial, was it, they, uh, it was necessary to include the option that if there were several patients who were equally suitable to participate in the trial um, that exceeded the available number of places, then they would um, have the option to um, randomise that selection process. But that's the first time that that's actually needed to be uh, included. So in terms of um, the consideration of treatment mechanism, we've heard that uh, in PMD there are three distinct mutation types with a degree of genotype-phenotype correlation. And so obviously depending on the um, mechanism of the therapy, um, that may in itself limit the patients eligible to participate. Um, in terms of affected, uh, expected efficacy based on preclinical trials, that may also um, inform which patients are going to be most suitable. Obviously, if it's a, a mutation-specific therapy compared with perhaps an um, approach to modify an endpoint such as mitochondrial dysfunction, then we would expect that the benefit is likely to differ between those and we might um, prioritise different patient groups to those different studies. And most importantly, um, for all of these, we need uh, meaningful endpoints that we can accurately measure. And in PMD, that's quite challenging, in particular for the um, most common form, the classic form, because of the slow disease process, but also because of the uh, developmental phase that's seen followed by the degenerative phase. So there's the risk in the developmental phase of um, false positives um, in terms of attributing benefit to the intervention as opposed to the development that's seen in that phase, the normal development, I mean delayed, but there is development seen. And then in the degenerative phase, the consideration for, um, again, being able to appreciate benefit but weighing that properly against the risk of the intervention and the burden of the trial at that stage of disease. The mode of delivery can also dictate which patients are eligible. Uh, a gastrost gastrostomy tube is, I would say, probably essential for the use of the ketogenic diet. It's otherwise a very challenging diet to adhere to. Um, and for some patients in advanced stages of disease with uh, severe scoliosis or previous surgery, there may be contraindications to lumbar puncture, for example, if that's required for intrathecal administration or for uh, monitoring. Likewise, if a general anaesthetic is required regularly for MRI assessment and or intrathecal administration, then um, that may be a contraindication or a, an exclusion for patients with severe respiratory disease. There are several other considerations that can also dictate patient participation can include the trial, uh, travel to the trial centre, uh, certainly in our experience in Australia, which um, is the same size as continental US, obviously a lot less patients, but they're spread all around and we're the only trial centre. Um, that's going to be a, a, a consideration. And I think we have a real responsibility to properly um, inform families of the burden of trial participation and ensure they do fully understand what's required to adhere to the protocol and to you know, optimise um, retention in the study. Um, and, and I think you know, that, that's really our responsibility to ensure that we do select patients appropriately, um, considering the, the family context and, and, and how well they can uh, manage participation in a trial as well as the, the care needs of their child and that it's in the best interest of the child. And social context may be relevant, I'll uh, be interested in people's thoughts. Um, there may be cultures where patients put more pressure on clinicians for participation in trials when it may not be 
um, in our opinion, in the patient's best interest. So that may be a factor also for us to consider. So in conclusion, I think we need to remember that the priority is for us to conduct high quality trials um, to accurately determine efficacy and safety of interventions and uh, first do no harm and make this our goal rather than treating our patients' desperation. In the, I think in the long term we owe it, um, this, is, this is really our, our goal and so we need to continue to focus on preclinical and or proof of concept studies to select um, uh, potential therapies with good evidence of um, or a, a good chance of efficacy to focus on those and for the, for the situation where the, the therapies are already available and approved I think it's critical that we collaborate um, on trialling those interventions uh, with shared protocols, uh, common consistent endpoints and as we've um, as the example was given yesterday for vanishing white matter disease that's just absolute ideal model of the vanishing white matter disease consortium and the um, ML, the approach in MLD where there is a collaboration in trialling these therapies because we really need to avoid the risk of uncontrolled trials. We've seen that happen in other conditions where an available therapy um, is, is uh, uh, trialled in an uncontrolled fashion, perhaps there's a false positive result. Um, that therapy is then available to patients worldwide. There may be significant associated risk and very hard then when the community believes that that's beneficial to ever go back and run a proper placebo controlled trial and determine efficacy. So I think we, as tempting as it is to jump in and try these therapies and we obviously all want to do everything we can for our patients, uh, we really owe it to them to run these trials um, uh, properly. So I don't think I've answered any questions but uh, or solved any problems but hopefully provided some food for thought and further discussion. Thank you for your attention. Good morning and namaste to everyone and I am very glad today to be here because uh, Nicole being a very close friend of mine, she uh, could actually help me uh, out with this because it's uh, uh, coming from a developing nation, it is very difficult and challenging for us actually and since yesterday I have been seeing how therapeutics have really taken over but for us even diagnostics is still uh, a challenge. So with this at the outset I would really thank uh, the organizers, the GLIA committee, uh, Mario and Nicole for giving me this opportunity to be talking here. Uh, I would also uh, let you know that, uh, you know, just to get my visa, I had uh, an appointment of February 2024. And it would, uh, it, thanks to Omar, if he wouldn't have been there, I would not have been able to make it to this meeting as well. So I'm really thankful to everyone. And with this, I would just start my talk of perspecting, uh, perspective of a developing nation uh, on these rare disorders, especially PMD. So as we look at the developing nation, uh, the demographics, uh, the population demographics has always been that it's always, you know, it's on the, like a sigmoid curve, it keeps rising and rising. However, the developed nations have it in a stable fashion. And that is where we, you know, lack uh, in terms of resources and everything. So when we talk about the Indian subcontinent, it caters to almost 2 billion population. So we can imagine how much of a disease burden we do have also in our countries. And when we talk about the Indian subcontinent, it consists of Bangladesh, Bhutan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, and India. And these people from these nations also go to each uh, neighboring nations to get the treatment. Especially we have a huge load coming from Bangladesh and Bhutan to get treatment. 
So health has always been a very low priority for us. Hardly 1.2% of our GDP goes into the health sector. And we have been uh, uh, very, uh, this is a very big challenge for us actually to, uh, you know, fight it out for our patients. So when we talk about leukodystrophies in India, it is rather uh, uh, the uh, we have very limited studies on the spectrum of the leukodystrophies in India, and there have been two large studies published uh, from two centers, and. Uh, uh, so in a five-year study period at done at All India Institute of Leuk uh, Medical Sciences, we had about 80 confirmed cases of leukodystrophies, and we found that the major chunk comes from the MLC group. So because of the Agarwal community and the inter-community uh, marriages, consanguinity and all those genetic factors, MLC remains very high on the list, and this is followed by me metachromatic leukodystrophy and followed by PMD. So as we see, it's not that uh, low in numbers. And this is also followed by adrenal leukodystrophy. And when we talk about PMD and PMLD in India, we have seen all sorts of mutations, whatever has been reported. But there are only isolated case reports in our country. And we have an unknown case burden still in our country. Uh, so how do we deal with our patients in uh, in our setup? So we have a major population from the village and a very small population. I would say about 60% uh, comes from village and 40% from the city. And from the village, actually, 80% of them are lost in the village itself. So they do not, they are not able to reach the proper clinician also for a treatment. And uh, that is uh, mainly because of illiteracy, social taboo, uh, being poor, etc. We are trying to bridge this gap by organizing camps, peripheral clinics. We are trying to reach out to them, but it is still a challenge for us. And they are usually seen by one general physician who caters to all sorts of clinical work. And from there, he might like to refer to a pediatrician who is often based in a city. And the pediatrician actually uh, identifies the developmental delays and early signs. And from there, they go to a neurologist or a child neurologist. Now, here also we lack uniformity because the referrals may not be very integrated. They may be fallouts. And there is a large patient load. So in a day, uh, you know, a general pediatrician might be seeing about 60 patients also. And a specialist would be seeing around 30, 40 patients in the outpatient department. So it is very challenging. And uh, from the neurologist, actually, uh, uh, the way to approach the patient remains quite similar to the Western world. We do our investigations, but there remains the challenges of, again, the cost burden, lack of resources. Genetic diseases are still not insured, uh, and there is dearth of diagnostic experts, including that we do not have very good neuroradiologist access also uh, in uh, the major cities as well. From there, uh, when we offer symptomatic care, uh, it is with medications and rehabilitations, but then again for genetic counseling and genetic uh, uh, support, the un there is a lot of uh, difficulties over there. We have uh, very few experts over there as well. And then we have these regular follow-ups, which we do not have the support from the government, so we have a lot of defaulters then there itself. Uh, we have very limited patient support groups in only certain diseases. We do not have it in leukodystrophy. That is on my mind still. And we do not have a registry. We have institutional registry still, but we do not have a registry in the country which is uniform. So some of the observations at my center where I work in last two years, this I have just put up because this is the amount of, you know, caseload that we have. Uh, so uh, I just picked up hypomyelinating leukodystrophy at my center and we identified about 27 cases. This is an unpublished data. And we could identify uh, 14 of PLP1, which is uh, in which we saw there were nine missense mutations. So initially, uh, uh, 
uh, we were thinking that maybe duplications are more common, but I'm also not very sure whether it's because that we go for the clinical exome sequencing that is picking up the missense mutations before, uh, or what exactly is the reason, but we do have to look into that. And we have the other mutations also. We could pick up seven novel mutations, and the youngest child which we could diagnose was three months old, and the oldest was 23 years old. This is in the pediatric neurology department. Uh, so there's definitely a need for registry, and we really need, uh, coming from a developing nations, uh, some cost-effective tools uh, for identification of these disorders. So talking about the challenges, we have challenges from the clinical uh, clinician's perspective as well as the patient's pers perspective. Like, uh, like I said, there is lack of integrated referrals and trained workforce. Uh, resource constraints is what we talked about. We do not have facilities of MRI, MRS, uh, also in certain cities also. And we are jack of all trades and master of none. So we are supposed to be seeing all uh, pediatric neurology cases, and we have very limited time to dedicate to a, sp a specific specialty uh, or a subject. But we do, do try to find time for that also. There has been undiagnosed cases due to uh, cost of investigations, and there have been a frequent fallout. The moment they realize that they have to pay this much money for the testing and facility, and they know it's uh, probably a general disorder, they usually fall out. For the patients, there is lack of awareness and low understanding. There is still no understanding of genetic disorders as such, and there is high consanguinity. Um, apart from that, there is always a difficult trajectory to reach the expert. There is longer wait until diagnosis. Affordability remains always an issue, and there is lack of patient advocacy groups, foundations, and genetic counselors. So talking about the average cost of testing and care in our country, uh, 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 this is like in a good uh, infrastructure uh, hospital, I would say. MRI would cost anything between $100 to $200. A genetic test would cost about maybe uh, $300 to $350, and uh, an array would cost around $90. And in totality, if uh, I just uh, tried to put uh, a cost uh, bracket to this, so it would come around $500 to $1,000, but they do not have that much also. And a regular clinician visit or clinician fees would be around $10 to $20, with a rehabilitation visit $10 to $20. So uh, this much of affordability is also not there, and the government is uh, trying to bridge this gap, but it's still way too far. So how can we contribute from the developing nations? We have a vast population, and there is a lot of case burden. And there has been intercommunity marriages and consanguinity adding to the case burden. So there is access to healthcare facilities in the larger cities. We are trying to reach out to our village population also. And there has been a gradual decline in the cost of the genetic testing, and more setups are gradually being built up. Uh, there has been reach out groups uh, in the form of camps and peripheral clinics, and we have extended uh, health care to our neighboring nations as well. One good thing is that we have a close knit at least pediatric neurology as well as neurologists working together for the registry and foundation. So I am sure that, uh, like Mario and Nicole have taught me, uh, take small steps with each day and we would reach somewhere definitely. Thank you very much. I would really like to thank all my mentors and my team at my country. Thank you. Hi, I um <clears throat> I really enjoyed your talk, and I I wanted to ask as a um, patient advocate leader, how how do you recommend we go about um, <clears throat> finding patients in our disease area? Um, we have one patient in Bangladesh um, who reached out to us via Facebook, but is there a way we as patient advocates can can be more proactive in in trying to assist um, in your efforts? 
Well, thank you very much for this uh, because uh, it's very nice to know that you are, uh, you know, you want to extend your support. Uh, yes, I would say that um, uh, if we have a, uh, you know, formal uh, group or foundations, we do, we still do not have any uh, foundation. This is on my mind. I am uh, very soon working on it to have, uh, you know, a leukodystrophy foundation, something similar to uh, what the Western world is having, so that we can have one proper platform where we can actually reach out for help also, and we can collaborate on those grounds. And we are working on social pla platform also, like maybe, uh, you know, Facebook and all those groups where we can connect to our people as well as to the uh, other parts of the world. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your talks. I also have a question for you. Is it your sense that if the barrier to genetic testing could be removed, if there were ways of offering, you know, globally uh, uh, panels that were that were free or very inexpensive, would that remove the barriers to access, or would the barriers to getting to a doctor, and then the the implications of a genetic diagnosis culturally and then the post-care still be such barriers that it wouldn't make a difference? I guess that's my question. Uh, well, thank you very much, Adeline, for that question. But uh, uh, I do agree that there are multiple barriers, but genetic barrier is also one uh, big barrier. And we have to start it at some point where we can go one by one as well. So I think if we can uh, take uh, the genetic part uh, we, if we can take care of the genetic part, I think that would really probably uh, uh, take 50% of our problems away as well. So that is also a big, uh, that would also be a big help, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, my last question here. Over here. Sure. Uh, so in India, you can't send DNA out to collaborate with research institutions, can you? So that is probably going to be a limitation. There are regulatory bodies for that, uh, but it's not that difficult. We have certain papers and all to be uh, filled up and certain uh, government-related. We have a research body called... Uh, ICMR, and we do have, uh, we have to write to them. We have our ethical board meetings and everything. But once it's through the process, it, it could be done, definitely. Because there are, are uh, initiatives such as with Illumina yeah. and other, other companies. For example, we're involved in a, in a project with India, with uh, Bangalore, yeah. uh, NIMS, and yeah. AIMS yes, to do NIMS. that. Yes. It's a bit paperwork heavy, but yes. if you're willing to do that, then that would be a distinct way of getting all of your patients analyzed. That would be really nice. Because interpretation is another matter in, in, in diverse populations. That's yep. quite hard. We have a lot of genetic facilities also, but the thing is that uniformity is not there. Probably one genetic uh, uh, center may vary from the other in terms of analysis. So that is where, uh, again, challenge comes. So, yeah, yeah that would be nice, actually. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, well, thank you very much. It was a great presentation. So we're going to take a, uh, I guess, let's call it, it's 9.18, 9.30 sharp. Uh, we'll be starting no matter what. Thank you. Does it they sound better? And then do the questions sound better?
own slides. You? Own slides. Okay. All right. Not slides, hello. Good morning, sir. How is it going? Oh, that's my group now. Page, huh? It's there, look. Oh, it's there? No, I'll, I'll still call it for it. Oh, good. It's easier than Polar 3 Relay. Yeah. <laughs> actually, the, the... But Polar 3 related disorder is actually a point. That's true. Yes, it, it, it no, 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 no. I, I completely agree with you. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I know, yeah. I've been trying to tell people up there too. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It really makes a difference compared to. So I, have a, I, have a I know, I had to get one to I had to, actually, I had to fight for the first time. I didn't have any desk. I had to fight for the first time. So I'll, when am I getting my $10,000 bill? Oh, I am going to write you guys when the... the so we're still waiting for her to actually get an appointment in the embassy so to make sure that... Actually, come in. Yeah. But I mean, we approved the, the yeah. School of Medicine accepted her for the fellowship program. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to be nice because she's going to become both certified in chemical genetic and biochemical genetics, so she can actually run a lab as well. Nice. Nice. Um, nice. But uh, she has to get the J1 visa. She hasn't gotten the appointment yet. And I, I felt like I'm going to send invoices and she has the money. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, it'll be great to get, you know, yeah. Anne's knowledge transferred to somebody else, right? Like, yeah. she's just got so much no, great scary. knowledge, right? You know? I know. I know. Yeah. I know. She's uh, doing a lot for us. Okay, why don't, why don't we get started again? Because uh, we're running behind. And uh, uh, maybe I'll go close the door. Okay, the next, the next uh, group is on 4-H syndrome or uh, polar 3 related uh, disorders and uh, uh, Dr. Bernard will be leading the group as a work leader. Go ahead. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes? Okay. So um, <clears throat> I want to thank you uh, first for the invitation to present and um, I'm very happy to be here today and I will talk to you about uh, 4-H. Um, so I am from McGill University in Montreal and then I will give you an introduction about um, 4-H and where, where, what we start, when we start, what, what, what we started and what, where we're at right now. And then Dr. Wolf is going to talk about the key successes and challenges. Um, so our uh, work group was quite uh, big. Uh, we were lucky to have uh, people from different um, field, uh, and um, and I think we had a very nice discussion. So, um, polar tree related leukodystrophy or polar tree related leukodystrophy is also uh, or polar tree related disorders um, is also known as 4H leukodystrophy. 4H standing for hypomyelination, hypodontia, and hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Um, so patients have hypomyelination, so they have neurological dysfunction. Uh, they typically would present um, in early uh, childhood with um, motor delay or regression, uh, and they'll have the, the the phenotype is predominated by uh, cerebellar features, so ataxia 
dysmetria, dysarchy, and tremor. Um, there are patients that present a little bit later with uh, more cognitive and learning difficulties, uh, and almost invariably, T patient will have uh, pyramidal and extrapyramidal signs, most commonly uh, dystonia but usually it's not the predominant uh, neurological uh, involvement. Um, we realized over the years that it's not only hypodontia, but multiple dental abnormalities, so oligodensia, delayed dentition, natal teeth. You can also have uh, abnormal shapes of the teeth, uh, etc. cetera. Um, same for the endocrine manifestation. Um, so the classic is hypogonotropic hypogonadism, which can present with uh, delayed, arrested, or absent puberty. Uh, but we, we now know that about 50% of patients have short stature, um, and other hormones abnormalities are possible. I think I will let people sit down. It's okay. So uh, the MRI characteristics uh, um, uh, are very specific for 4-H. Uh, so you have... Uh, and I'm, do you see my, oh, good. Um, you have diffuse hypomyelination, and then you have uh, preservation or relative preservation of myelination in certain structure. Uh, but you also have um, uh, cerebellar atrophy in some patients, as well as a thin corpus callosum. So the structures that are typically preserved are the dentic nucleus, uh, the optic radiation, the uh, anticollateral nucleus of the thalamus, as well as the globus pallidus. So uh, the genes for 4-H were discovered, uh, the first genes in 2011. Um, so uh, it's a recessive disease, so it's caused by biologic pathogenic variants in Polar tree A, Polar tree B, both found in 2011, Polar 1C, 2015, and Polar tree K, if I'm not mistaken, 2018. Um, and uh, uh, the uh, RNA polymerase tree uh, is one of three polymerases. Uh, and it's responsible for the transcription of small non-coding RNAs. Uh, we're not going to go through all this, but that's a nice summary of all the um, um, small uh, non-coding RNA that are transcribed by uh, uh, POP3, and it's, uh, they're all very important for cellular homeostasis and uh, for translation. So as, uh, as all of you probably know already, uh, when a gene is discovered, then the spectrum enlarges. So we, uh, we um, realized that uh, if you have a specific combination of polar tree A um, uh, variants with a, with a um, leaky splice uh, at a very specific position in polar tree A with a stop mutation on the other allele, uh, you have a very severe disease um, uh, with an onset be between one to three months of age, uh, with severe developmental delay, regression, uh, severe dysphagia, failure to thrive, and early, uh, earlier death. And there is a specific MRI uh, pattern with this uh, form of the disease. Uh, and then for the typical patient that we talked about, typical onset in toddlers and some later childhood um, uh, presentation, and again, a typical MRI finding. And then we also know now that there are adult uh, onset of uh, polar poly tree-related leukodystrophy uh, with typically more uh, myelin in the brain. And also, the, we do know that some of these patients are diagnosed incidentally uh, because they have an MRI for another reason. So they uh, probably get a much later disease, uh, but they're very probably very under-recognized. But then the disease spectrum expanded even further uh, when we realized that uh, hypomyelination was not uh, obligate for uh, 4-H. Um, so that's where the polar tree-related uh, disorder um, names started to be more used. Uh, and then um, we also realized that uh, you can have ataxia and specific mutation in polar tree A. You can also have... Um, um, uh, a hereditary spastic paraparesis type, type phenotype as well. Uh, and then we also um, realized that some patients uh, have a um, progyric uh, syndrome uh, with specific polar tree A mutation. Uh, and then we, uh, when we found the gene in 2015 for uh, polar 1C um, related uh, leukodystrophy, we realized that there was an overlap with treacher Collins syndrome. So some patients have uh, polar 1C mutations and treacher Collins only. Others have a leukodystrophy only, but some patients have both. And finally, very recently, uh, we realized that some very um, specific um, 
a sporadic muta um, a dominant mutation, um, uh, the novo mutation in PolarH3B leads to a completely different phenotype of ataxia spasticity, demyelinating neuropathy, and for some patients, epilepsy. So um, the research challenges and successes. So I think one of the huge success uh, of the last few years is uh, the patient advocacy group, the Yaya Foundation for, for H. leukodystrophy, who uh, received a rare, rare as one um, grant from the Chen Zuckerberg Foundation and has started a registry uh, for the patients. Um, what are the, one of those success is the uh, understanding better the molecular uh, disease mechanism and some development of disease models, some of which are published, others are not. Uh, one of the, some of the challenges that Dr. Wolf will discuss uh, later is, the, of course, for future clinical trial is the clinical heterogeneity as well as uh, variable cellular targets and the lack of biomarkers. And at this point in time, there's no clinical trial for this disease. Um, so a little bit of uh, background about the successes. So we now know that we know it's a hypomorphic disease. Uh, so you can have the disease if you have less, uh, less uh, amount of a specific subunit. Uh, you can also have uh, in, uh, some variants that lead to abnormal assembly of the complex because of abnormal um, interaction between two subunits. And you can also have uh, disease for because of uh, like um, decreased interaction with uh, the DNA for transcription. So there has been uh, several transcription, tra transcri transcriptomic studies. Um, unfortunately, it's hard to have like a, a clear uh, pathogenesis mechanism. The tRNA seems to be a very important driving mechanism, but uh, the studies have been done on different form of the disease with different cells uh, and different phenotypes um, and different experimental approaches. So it's hard to conclude at this point, but hopefully in the next uh, several a few years, we'll be able to um, have more uh, data on the RNA-seq and understanding better the um, transcriptomic aspect of the disease. So there's been some published and unpublished um, uh, animal and cellular models. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about um, the mouse models. So um, we know that if you have a homozygous knockout, the, it's embryonic lethal. Um, there is a, a, the group of Bernard Bray who did a, a polar tree A with a common uh, Quebec mutation for polar tree A. Uh, the mouse has no phenotype. Uh, the, and like another polar tree B mutation was tried, but the mutation causes a too severe of a, of a complex assembly uh, defect. Uh, so it's embryonic lethal. And then another trial. Another thing that they tried is to combine a uh, homozygous uh, polar tree A mutation with uh, one copy of the severe polar tree B mutation, and again, no phenotype. Mm -hmm. But in very but recently, um, Dr. Willis's lab published a mouse model of polar tree A with two subsequent uh, polar tree A mutation. Um, this uh, combination of mutation was chosen based on yeast studies, and uh, this is the first animal models of this disease because that's so that's very good news for uh, for the community. Uh, the the mouse has a growth phenotype. It has a neurobehavioral abnormalities. Unfortunately, and uh, yeah, and, and um, fortunately, impaired myelination, but unfortunately, no motor deficits, um, and no non neurological features. But still, a very good model to to understand the disease pathogenesis and hopefully eventually test some uh, potential therapies. So clinical challenges and successes now. Um, so a clinical care is well described, including the systemic manifestation. We're still working on, on them, but uh, we've done quite a bit of work uh, regarding this. Um, the diagnostic, uh, I think we've heard it very well in the PMD uh, session, uh, is dependent on uh, the availability of next gene, gene sequencing, either uh, genome, exome, or panels. Uh, so it's not every uh, country that have access to this. Um, there's no uh, pathway to newborn screening at this point. Um, and it's, I think the diagnostic awareness is still a challenge. Uh, there's still some, uh, it's, the disease is not as well known as other leukodystrophies. 
I think the clinical care has been relatively well described, but still there is uh, work to do to understand, uh, for example, the benefit of hormone replacement therapy um, for patients with um, with uh, hormone deficiencies uh, and optimize uh, versus uh, bone health versus potential side effects. Uh, same for the. Um, ophthalmological uh, manifestation, which is most commonly myopia, um, and it progresses over several years, so it's important that the patients are uh, followed regularly by an ophthalmologist, um, and, uh, and uh, it's often become very severe. So, uh, and lastly, there's no uh, disease-modifying therapy available, but hopefully the, at the next, uh, or a few, a couple of meetings uh, later, we'll have good ideas um, for, uh, for this disease. So the heat maps, um, so there's uh, some red and orange, uh, but more yellow than what we used to have. And I think for a relatively new disease, it's, uh, it's encouraging. And hopefully next time we'll have more yellow and perhaps some blue. I'll let uh, Nicole Wolf uh, talk about the challenges and uh, successes. Uh, thank you, Genevieve. Uh, I have uh, to say that um, 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 I'm quite glad that uh, this presentation is after the Pilitius Maspera presentation because both uh, leukodystrophies are hypomyelinating leukodystrophies. But um, I personally have uh, uh, much more trouble understanding uh, the um, um, disease mechanisms in 4-H um, than uh, Genevieve uh, just um, explained. Um, it's a, as, as she said, it's a very new disease. I mean, the genetic cause was identified uh, by Genevieve's lab in uh, 2011, so that's uh, uh, not very long ago. Uh, so we have a long way to go um, until we really understand it. And it's not a simple enzyme like arylsulfatase A in uh, metachromatic leukodystrophy, where we know if the enzyme is not there, you have this... Um, built up of sulfatides. Um, here it's much more complicated. Uh, and uh, um, I also, perhaps it's not uh, right, but I also always think that the uh, polar 3 um, um, role is so tightly regulated because it's such a central process in a, in a cell um, um, uh, working uh, on transcription um, that um, probably um, we have m much less... Um, uh, leeway to um, influence that uh, activity, uh, which makes it uh, quite a difficult uh, um, disease to um, treat. I think the biggest success, at least in my eyes, is the nice collaboration uh, with the uh, uh, Montreal team and also the uh, team uh, of uh, Adeline. Um, and uh, um, this uh, transatlantic cooperation uh, has led to large studies um, in spite of actually scarce funding uh, I, I think I can say that. Um, and that's also thanks to a lot of, of you who contributed patients uh, and uh, um, didn't write a case report but contributed your patients to those large disease series. So um, all three of us are very grateful um, for, for this. I think uh, that's my successes. Uh, I go on to the challenges. Um, we have still difficulties uh, to um, understand the genotype-phenotype relationships. Um, I come to some of the specific uh, variants who give you specific, uh, which give you specific uh, um, disease forms uh, in a minute. Uh, Genevieve has already alluded to it, but um, um, it's still uh, uh, not well understood. The disease models uh, you just heard, uh, they are coming. Um, there are some mouse models uh, um, underway, and uh, we hope that they are good replications of the human disease or parts of the human disease. And uh, um, the other question I have is, um, is 4-H leukodystrophy uh, a leukodystrophy at all? And I will show you an example. Um, of course, uh, I think it is. But um, um, we see so many patients now without leukodystrophy that... Um, I think we have to ask us uh, this question. Uh, and uh, that actually also um, entails uh, um, the problem how relevant is the myelin deficit in this disease. So um, 
Genevieve already told you about the different uh, variants and all started with the 4-H leukodystrophy, um, the typical MRI here, and we also have uh, severe cases, milder cases, cases with a cognitive presentation. Um, but we also have patients without uh, hypomyelination, mainly with variants in polar 3B. Uh, we then have uh, um, the severe Wiedemann-Rautenstrauch syndrome uh, caused by specific variants, uh, severe loss of function variants in polar 3A. We have the polar 3A related basal ganglia disease, um, and all patients have um, on at least one allele, one of uh, those uh, splice set uh, variants. And then we have uh, the um, group of patients, uh, I have never seen one, uh, with a later, um, often adult onset spastic ataxia, and on one allele, uh, this um, intronic uh, variant um, in polar 3A. And uh, how all those um, uh, disorders are related and what causes one or the other is um, not well understood. Um, there have, has been a big process, uh, progress, of course, in the structure of the human uh, polymerase 3. Um, there is now a crystal model. Um, in the first uh, um, publications, um, all of the variants were mapped uh, on, um, I think, a yeast uh, polymerase 3. Um, so that helps already, of course. Um, you see that uh, some uh, variants uh, um, uh, seem to cluster um, in some parts of the protein. Um, especially the Treacher Collins uh, uh, variants um, caused by polar 1C variants. Um, you have this uh, Varicella zoster uh, um, virus susceptibility, uh, which uh, gives you um, a very severe uh, Varicella zoster infection. That's quite interesting because the very first uh, 4-H patient uh, in my very first cohort I saw in, 2020, uh, in, in 2000, so more than 20 years ago, had already um, had, had uh, indeed uh, quite a severe varicella infection. Um, and uh, we do have patients uh, who have uh, immunodeficiency, um, and uh, um, that is something completely um, um, yeah, not, not researched uh, um, at the moment. Um, so um, we start to have um, an idea where some mutations are located in the protein um, and uh, give you uh, the specific uh, forms, but why um, it's still a problem. So what is the primarily affected cell type? Um, is it only one cell type uh, for the typical forms? Uh, is it oligodendrocytes because of the hypomyelination that uh, seems to be uh, obvious? Or is it neurons? Um, and if it's neurons, is it cerebellar neurons, cortical neurons, or the deep gray matter uh, neurons um, in the um, basal ganglia variant? And what of the polar 3 functions is primarily affected? Is that different between the different, very different phenotypes and how tightly regulated is it? And uh, uh, what I uh, mentioned already, how careful do we need to be in influencing it? I think th these are all important questions before we start thinking of, um, of treatment trials. So uh, what we um, uh, uh, showed um, uh, some years ago that um, in the patients with hypomyelination, so the typical MRI, the severity of the myelin deficit correlates with the clinical severity uh, when you um, map it like that. Uh, it's not a very strong correlation, but it, uh, it uh, seems uh, that that was uh, our idea. And <clears throat> I think when I uh, think of my hypomyelinating um, 4-H patients, I would also say it uh, confirms what we see in the clinics. Um, we've seen uh, recently some very severely affected typical 4-H patients, and they have a, um, a very hypomyelinated brainstem. I don't know whether you have the same experience, um, and that's perhaps something we need to look uh, more closely um, at. So that um, seems to be um, quite straightforward. Um, it's also uh, the case when you look um, at the patients with Pelletier's Merzbacher disease uh, and the degree of myelin deficit, there you also have a correlation 
um, between the severity of myelin deficit and severity of clinical presentation. And perhaps it's also important to uh, remember that there are patients with a quite severe hypomyelination and actually um, almost normal um, motor function. Um, this is something um, which, which uh, um, surprised us, uh, of course, and when I was uh, seeing those first patients uh, as, a, as a registrar in, uh, in child neurology, I um, actually went to um, uh, Odile Bösflug uh, Tongi, uh, who is an expert on Pelletia Smerzbacher disease because it's a hypomyelinating disorder. And I, uh, I asked her, have you seen uh, um, this kind of patients? And she actually um, didn't believe uh, that those four age patients were able to walk. Uh, she said that's not possible with an MRI like that. Um, so that's... Uh, uh, how it uh, all started. Uh, of course, those uh, patients, we all know them, uh, there are many patients who are quite mildly affected. And those are two patients um, I see um, in my clinics, uh, uh, both of them with the uh, Polar 3B variants. Um, and uh, when you've seen many patients with 4H, um, you um, recognize them, they have this severe myopia, they have a a very um, typical behavior also. Very f many of them are very friendly. Some of them have quite uh, some autistic features, which is also an under-recognized uh, part of the um, presentation. But um, the, um, uh, they're, they're, uh, without being dysmorphic, their uh, facial features um, are very much uh, similar. So, um, and they are ataxic, so these patients uh, look quite alike, but are still different. And I would like to ask you um, a question um, about uh, clinical severity. So this is uh, one patient you see um, with a normal myelination, a uh, normal corpus callosum, uh, cerebellar atrophy, and that patient has a, a clear hypomyelination, a thin corpus callosum, cerebellar atrophy. Both are uh, 18, 20 years old at the time of uh, the MRI. And uh, uh, who, who of you thinks um, both of them are uh, similar in their neurological severity? <laughs> no, uh, no, no. Who, who, who of you thinks uh, this one is more severe? This, this one, uh, the hypomyelinating one here on the. Okay, so um, this is a patient who is 20 years old. He has a normal IQ. Um, he has a mild uh, autism. He has a mild ataxia, um, uh, which is very slowly progressive. Uh, he has myopia and delayed puberty. Uh, that girl is 19 years old. She has moderate intellectual disability, a clear ataxia. She's barely able to walk without support. Um, she also has myopia and delayed puberty. Um, so uh, that's my problem, and that's, I think, one of the challenges in 4-H um, um, where we have to um, ask ourselves uh, what is the most important part in this disease to try to influence, for example, in a clinical trial. Is it uh, the myelin? Um, those two patients would perhaps argue no. Um, is it the cerebellar atrophy? Then we have a problem because uh, how could we influence, how, how could we treat that? Um, so I, I really am very curious as to what you think about that, uh, that question. And I think probably you have made the same experiences uh, in your patients. Some patients don't have cerebellar atrophy. Yes, that's uh, true as well. Um, so, Virginia, you have just said some patients don't have a cerebellar atrophy but still are very ataxic. Um, so that makes it even more complicated. Yeah. Um, the other thing is uh, um, the primary outcomes in clinical trials. I, I think um, because we have those really different um, presentations like the basal ganglia um, phenotype or the spastic ataxia with those um, uh, specific uh, genetic variants um, that we need to stratify clinical trials alongside those important presentations. 
um, the question is, uh, do we need to look at stabilization or improvement? I think that's a question for all the, of the logodystrophies, and stabilization would be the first goal. But it's a very slow disease um, in um, many patients. Um, so um, um, to, to look for, um, certainly in those very typical for age patients, uh, um, to, to look for stabilization is um, uh, something um, uh, which is also, uh, given the scarce, precise natural history data we have, uh, still a challenge. Um, we don't have established body fluid biomarkers. We don't have good biomarkers for myelin. Um, and uh, for example, what uh, Mark uh, England yesterday already said, the neurofilament uh, as uh, the um, universal neurology marker um, is uh, also not well understood. Although I think uh, um, that it might uh, be helpful but we need many more patients to um, really understand its role for 4-H for syndrome. And uh, I think we have also to look for better biomarkers. Uh, um, and uh, the question is what? Other open questions I have just from seeing um, quite a few 4-H uh, patients. We have, um, of course, we have this wiedemann rautenstrauch syndrome, which is a, a progeria uh, syndrome. But also in typical 4-H patients, we see um, certainly um, as they get older, um, progeria-like signs um, in those patients. Um, we have the immune deficiency in some patients. Um, and I think uh, as soon as you start really looking for, for example, um, antibody production after vaccinations, we probably find many more children who have uh, those problems. And then... Um, the failure to thrive and growth deficit um, half of the patients have, um, does it correlate to the severity of the neurological involvement? I would think at least a uh, part of it. Um, so those were my thoughts. Um, um, and I think we are both grateful to uh, the support uh, we had um, uh, to look further in, uh, in this uh, uh, difficult disease. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is great. Uh, what about um, other features of the MRI? So uh, all the diffusion weighted uh, fiber uh, density and, you know, all kinds of other things that I'm sure spectroscopy, et cetera, et cetera. Did you look at those things to uh, see if uh, you can explain uh, some of the uh, surprising findings that you described? Um we did look at, uh, <coughs> but it doesn't uh, help us uh, really further at, at the moment, at least. Great talks. I was curious, and this just shows my ignorance here. What is known about the early developmental expression of polar 3A, polar 3B? And I'm wondering how much of this is a, is a dynamic uh, that is unfolding postnatally that is really reflecting something that's happening embryonically and that we, we, we just can't put our finger on because we're coming late in, in a developmental program. That's, that's a very difficult question. Um, I don't think we have an answer to that. Um, we know uh, we have patients that have con a congenital form of the disease um, that we was like we were recently aware of. Um, I think um, I think that if you want to like a, a general um, a hypothesis is that um, there's a threshold. Um, for the, uh, the, you need transcription of these very very important transcript, and so if you don't have that threshold, you you have disease. But 
I think you probably have different types of threshold according to how uh, severe the disease is and how um, how much um, how much more you get from in, on top of the hypomyelination. And also uh, looking, we're looking at that more deeply, but looking at specific variants, uh, the 1771 minus seven and minus six are very, very specific for basal ganglia involvement. And we're also trying to find out like exactly what happened. I think it probably starts in epitamina and then you get what are in the generation and involvement of other structures afterwards. But that's, uh, and so, and I wonder whether or not the polar 3 b patients that don't have hypomyelination also have a very different mechanism. We do think that the de novo polar 3 b variants leading to developmental delay ataxia and uh, peripheral neuropathy and epilepsy also have their own mechanism. So I think it's going to be, um, hopefully we'll be able to have different mechanism for different um, form or muta and mutation. Um, yeah, I um, I agree. Um, and uh, um, why are, uh, for example, in the basal ganglia phenotype, the basal ganglia are, are affected? And what does it mean? Also, uh, when you, um, um, what does it mean for polar three function? Um, what does it mean when you try to design treatments? Because it's a leaky splice site, huh? so there is some function, but. Uh, how exactly is it affected to lead uh, to this uh, um, um, putaminal abnormalities? So that's um, that's puzzling, at least uh, for me. Um, I also think that the um, non-hypomyelinating um, polar three B patients um, probably have a different disease mechanism. Um, as a group, I would say um, they are um, uh, they have a more a severe intellectual disability uh, than the typical for each patients, um, and uh, um, I won. They have if if patients have epilepsy with the polar three variants, it's usually the normally myelinated patients. Um, so I wonder whether that is um, a cortical neuronal uh, phenotype in contrast to the basal ganglia form, or but this is a. Uh, um, of course, all um, hypotheses. Um, and uh, those patients, although you can uh, perhaps even uh, separate them from the classical hypomyelinating patients, um, still look like the same disease, uh, if you understand what I mean. The basal ganglia patients look different, but the hypomyelinating and the non-hypomyelinating um, patients, if I would have uh, six of them at the same time in my waiting room, I think uh, everyone would say they have exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. And also uh, interesting that, that in the last uh, uh, three or four years, we, we identified more of the non-hypomyelinating um, patients due to exome sequencing uh, than the typical 4-H leukodystrophy patients. I don't know whether you had uh, the same experience. Just related to that, is there a, uh, any correlation between the remnant? How people looked at the remnant enzyme activity of the polymerase and whether that correlates, the enzyme activity correlates with the severity of the disease or the phenotype? So um, it's, um, it's not an easy um, assay to do. Hmm. And if I can uh, ask uh, Dr. Willis to please comment on that, do you mind? Oh, she's coming. The correlation between structure and function, really, we don't have that yet. Um, the assays are involved, but they're certainly very doable, and it's just a matter of uh, getting the mutations uh, made in uh, cell lines, purifying the enzyme and doing the work. So it's a very feasible thing to, to contemplate, is uh, trying to correlate the disease severity with mutational severity and enzyme activity, and I think this is a worthwhile endeavor. But there's more than 250 mutations, though. Mm -hmm. but, but the assumption is there's no, it's not a null mutation, right? That there is some, the assumption is that there is remnant activity. You have to have. Uh, you have to have. Uh, you have to have some activity, yeah. 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 yeah but it's, is it only the enzyme function or um, are the other functions also important and in what way? The 
basal ganglia phenotype, uh, we've got a couple of patients with abnormal DAT scans, um, surprisingly. And uh, one of the questions is whether we treat them with L-DOPA. I haven't done that yet. But uh, do, do you see that? And have you tried that? Um, I treated one uh, patient with L-DOPA. Uh, but it was a patient that was living a, a further away. So I, I couldn't... Um, have my uh, like I couldn't examine him in person uh, as much as I would have liked to, um, but he was not very affected. So the patients that have the seven, like the homozygous for seventeen seventy one minus seven or minus six, or they have one of of each, they're relatively mild, at least in my experience, and the progression of the disease is very slow. Um, so so they the dystonia is not as um, problematic that that you want to treat them, but I would like I like I would do for any young patient with with dystonia. I usually start with cinemet and see. Yeah. Uh, perhaps I may add uh, that um, we saw uh, also quite a, a few patients with the basic ganglia phenotype in the last years. Um, again, more than the high leukodystrophy phenotype, um, and. Um, there are those very severely affected young children with a um, infantile onset, and there are those mild, more, more mildly affected patients uh, with an onset in uh, early childhood uh, and a slowly progressive disease, which most looks like uh, juvenile Parkinsonism. And uh, we did treat uh, uh, various patients with LDO, but without any success. Uh, and the very frustrating in those patients is uh, the um, bulbar involvement. Uh, they have uh, they develop uh, anarthria and uh, uh, severe dysphagia. Um, and there's also um, the possibility of a big, huge intrafamilial um, um, very variation of uh, disease severity also in this group of patients. I have a brother and a sister, and the, the sister is almost not affected besides... Uh, a mild learning difficulty, and uh, her brother is uh, almost not able to speak anymore and uh, has a severe Parkinsonism. And, uh, and the same MRI, uh, by the way. Yeah, and the infantile form with the patients that have a stop in a minus 7 or a minus 6 is also very different. Uh, the MRI pattern is, is a combination of some hypomyelination with basal ganglia involvement and cerebral atrophy, and their movement disorder is different. They're very hyperkinetic. They're very dyskinetic. Um, so they're like they um, they are also recognizable in the waiting room. Hmm. And, and you wouldn't do a DBS for that anarthria or the dystonia. It doesn't get that bad. Well, um, we discussed it with the DBS uh, colleagues, uh, and I saw two patients uh, with the DBS uh, team. Um, and just the anarthria is something which they think uh, will respond not well to the um, DBS. Would you? Right. Oh. I find it does help some patients anarthria as well, DBS as well as the dystonia. Um, oh. I can't tell you why, but they have a lot of. Um, um, oropharyngeal and, uh, and yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, I guess if there's more questions, we can do it during the break. Yeah. I want to do one in the next group, and then take again a quick break, and then do the final one before lunch. So the next group is salad disease or free sialic acid storage disorders. Dr. Wasserstein is the whole group leader. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here to present free sialic acid storage disease. <laughs> <laughs> so 
So I'll be presenting um, FSASD with my colleagues David Adams and Mariam Hoisung from NHGRI. Here is a list of our work group, which represents um, people from across the United States as well as uh, France and Finland. So the free sialic acid storage disorders are a spectrum of neurodegenerative disorders resulting from increased lysosomal storage of sialic acid. FSASD is inherited as an autosomal recessive disorder and is caused by biallelic pathogenic variants in SLC17A5. The gene product, Cyalin, is a transmembrane lysosomal protein whose function it is to export the charged sugar, um, N-acetylneuraminic acid or sialic acid, out of lysosomes. Um, FSASD is a lysosomal storage disorder and like all lysosomal storage disorders, there is a spectrum of clinical severity. And like many lysosomal storage disorders, we're undergoing a rebranding. So the most severe form um, used to be known as infantile free sialic acid storage disorder, or ISSD. We're now transitioning to the term severe FSASD. And the purpose of this transition in, in nomenclature is just to kind of acknowledge the allelic nature of these various phenotypes. The onset of, free, of severe FSASD is prenatal to neonatal. It's rapidly progressive, multi-systemic disease with severe neurodegeneration, and death is typically um, at around a year of age. Clinical features can include fetal and neonatal high drops, coarse facial features, hepatosplenomegaly, cardiomegaly, failure to thrive, dysostosis multiplex, nephrotic syndrome, and again, a rapidly progressive neurodegeneration. At the other end of the spectrum is what's classically known as solid disease, um, or less severe, FSASD. Um, in between is intermediate severe FSASD. And both intermediate and less severe FSASD um, present during infancy to early childhood. They have a more variable presentation in terms of age of onset, progression, and degree of neurovisceral involvement. We can often kind of distinguish between those with intermediate severe and less severe disease based on age of onset, rate of progression, and genotype is often very helpful here. Clinical features can include truncal ataxia, hypotonia, neurodevelopmental delay and disability, short stature, spasticity, facial coarsening, nephrotic syndrome, uh, multiple neuroendocrine abnormalities, and brain abnormalities. So there's been a lot of momentum in the field of FSASD over the past few years, and that's largely due to the creation of the FSASD Consortium. And this began only five years ago, um, in 2017, when I saw a child in my clinic who was newly diagnosed with solid disease, um, and he was diagnosed through whole exome sequencing. When uh, I saw the child uh, chatting with his parents, and like most parents of children with ultra rare diseases, they were, they were just desperate to find out more information about what to expect. And there was a really surprising lack of information available that we could share with them. So we invited the family to participate in Einstein's uh, Rose F. Kennedy IDDRC's newly started program, which was called Operation IDD Gene Team. And Operation IDD Gene Team was created to connect families who have a poorly understood neurogenetic condition, to connect them with basic scientists from the Albert Einstein College of Medicine who are either studying that disorder or related disorders. So we invited them to participate. They were actually our first family to participate in this. And we had them meet with Steve Walkley, who you can see in that picture, and Costa Dubrenis. And they had a tutorial about what was known about FSASD. The family then called us a couple of days later and said, we're inspired. And they decided that they wanted to start a foundation called the Sala Treatment and Research Foundation, or a STAR, a STAR is born, which is really appropriate because mom happens to be a professional opera singer. So um, based on, on this and the formation of STAR, we held our inaugural FSASD think tank a few months later. And at our think tank, we invited um, um, scientists and clinicians from seven centers across the world to sit together and discuss 
what we knew about FSASD at the time and to really brainstorm together about what the next steps would be, what we needed to do. And it was also the first opportunity for FSASD families from around the world to meet each other and to offer to support. And this is a picture from that meeting. Over the next couple of years, the momentum grew, the FSASD consortium began to mature, and fundraising by store was critical. In 2021, we began having formal meetings. Uh, we had eight focus group Zoom meetings. Um, now, instead of just seven centers, we were up to 13 centers, and the plannings and collaborations began to take off. We started a patient registry, a knock and mouse model was created, and an FSASD review was published. And this is a nice picture of one of those Zoom calls. And more recently, in 2022, we've had almost 10 subgroup Zoom meetings now with 15 centers. Cellular models, including IPSCs, were created, and therapeutic targets are under investigation. And um, this is a picture from our hybrid full consortium meeting, which was just about two weeks ago. This graphic kind of represents the focus of the FSASD consortium. Um, the consortium is now composed of three main groups, including STAR, the NIH, as well as academic clinical scientists from around the globe. Uh, one big focus is raising awareness for FSASD through improving diagnostic testing. Another big focus is basic and translational research. Um, to try to kind of help us understand better the pathophysiology of the FSASD disorders. Also working on identifying treatment and drug candidates, as well as natural history studies, and those studies are really kind of focusing on clinical trial readiness. Uh, this is what our consortium looks like now, representing 15 centers, four countries, and 40 investigators. So here's our heat map, and I think what is kind of noticeable about our heat map is that it's a lot redder than a lot of the other heat maps that we've seen today. And I think this, this just really reflects the youth of our organization and the youth of these organized efforts to understand FSASD. Uh, our strengths right now are in patient advocacy and preclinical scientific development, but there's really a lot of progress that is being made in the other groups, so I'm hoping that the next time we meet, this will be a lot more in the green and blue area. Um, and to share with you some of the challenges and progress that we've made, um, David Adams is first going to present the clinical aspects, um, and then Marianne Huizing is going to present the cellular mouse models, methods and tools, and therapeutic approaches that we've been working on. Pass the buck. Hi, I'm David Adams. I'm a pediatrician, a biochemical geneticist. I work in the NIH intramural program. And uh, if, if we don't say it at another point in our talk, thank you so much for including us in this uh, community and to, uh, to the organizers. Um, it's, we've learned a lot even over the last uh, day of talks. Um, as noted previously, um, the free sialic acid storage disorders are associated with the uh, SLC17A5 gene. And the term solid disease originates from a municipality in Finland where a founder mutation is, uh, is more common than in the rest of the world. And this is a PR39C. It's a hypomorphic mutation that causes a, an intermediate to uh, mild uh, FSASD phenotype. And the term solid disease is frequently used for mild disease in general, even though we're, um, as we mentioned, we're trying to change the names a little bit. Officially, solid disease is this mutation, uh, but it's also used for mild disease in the literature, and that's important to know. And then there's a severe form that, uh, as with many lysosomal storage diseases, is related to gene function. This is one of, just as a biochemical geneticist, and put this in a category, this is one of a few diseases that are described for lysosomal transporters, along with cystinosis and uh, cobalamin F. In the context of leukodystrophies, um, this is, uh, has severe delayed myelination with a markedly thin corpus callosum, and we've heard about that in a number of other talks, so this isn't particularly specific. Uh, we, in the literature, there's some suggestion that um, 
that central myelination may improve over time, although it's rarely seen peripherally, even in older patients. And in the uh, MRIs that we've reviewed for a short natural history study that I'll describe, we've essentially seen no evidence of uh, myelination progression uh, in the first uh, half or two-thirds of a decade. The prevalence is interesting. There's about 250 cases worldwide. This is a slide that Dr. Hoising um, uh, put together. Uh, and about 200 of them either have one or both of their alleles as R39C. We did some prevalence calculations based upon uh, mutation frequency rates in NOMAD and came up with a, a rate of about three in a million um, uh, outside of the SALA region and about 35 in a million um, in the SALA region. So this, what we'd really like is the incidence, but this suggests that there's quite a few people who are unidentified um, uh, around the world. There are, to support that, there are multiple ethnicities that are associated with sialic acid. We've got some patients from Brazil uh, and other parts of the world that don't have any uh, connection with the, the frequent mutation. And it's likely underdiagnosed. And to under, underline that, this has been added to some direct consumer testing, the R39C. And actually, there have been some diagnoses made based on that direct to consumer testing, which is sort of an interesting way for things to, to pop up. In terms of diagnosis, you can measure uh, free sialic acid in the urine. It's 10 to 100-fold um, above normal, depending upon uh, the severity of the mutations. So that's available as a clinical test. And then there's a molecular test, of course, that you can do for mutations uh, in the gene. Uh, and pathology, there are often enlarged lysosomes and fibroblasts, and there's inc increased fibroblast free sialic acid, but those are uh, not really used as clinical tests very often. I'd just like to underline this probably undiagnosed, um, which is important because as we think about how to construct a study, you know, should we for focus just on the, um, the R39C mutation or should we have a, a broader base to our investigations? The largest uh, natural history studies have come out of the Finnish population, as you would guess. The most recent paper is the one referenced below, which builds on a 2002 paper that examined a, a cohort fairly soon after the disease was described. Um, and from that most recent paper, they had 24 subjects that were aged 16 to 65. Um, there's excess mortality after 30. It's progressive but highly variable between individuals. So we may need to look at something like a rate of progression rather than an absolute progression connected to age for that reason as an outcome measure. Um, motor skills in, um, overall improved until age 20 and then plateaued, which is you know, challenging in terms of setting up a, a study and thinking about the time scale. Um, dyspraxia and dysarthria as I demonstrate, are uh, present in older patients, and um, there are marked motor deficits. And I was interested yesterday in to, that several groups talked about uh, motor scales that we might think about using in this population, since um, hypotonia and developmental delay are things that usually um, are present at the time of diagnosis, usually eight months to two years or so is typically when the kids get diagnosed. Um, and ataxia is prominent childhood and then can be replaced by athetotic movements as the disease progresses. This is also from that paper. So the y-axes are in months. The top graph is motor development. The bottom graph is uh, developmental age. This group used the Bailey and several other recognizable um, tools to make these assessments. The, um, the x-axis is chronologic. Uh, age. The blue lines are x equals y, just for my own reference. So those are added by me. But you can see that there's um, uh, not a lot of progression once you get past a certain age. And interestingly, some of the patients live to be um, in, into their 60s. Um, all of those folks essentially have one or two of the R39C mutations as opposed to the severe disease. So there's a bit of a paucity of information for pediatric patients, and given the fact that as soon as we've the, seen MRIs from that we reviewed anyway, um, they have hypomyelination, it suggests that early intervention would be uh, desirable. And so we'd like to see if there are, collect additional longitudinal information about the, the young kids. And this was really touched off um, by, the, uh, by the STAR organization and 
uh, pulling together researchers over the last few years. Um, so we have a pilot natural history study um, at the NIH Clinical Center. We do a sedated MRI, which and a bunch of other associated procedures with that. Laboratory testing, we collect biospecimens, have them evaluated by uh, several subspecialists, photographs, skeletal surveys, all that sort of thing. Um, and that data is still very preliminary. Uh, clearly, the neurodevelopmental piece is important. And um, in addition, we found some um, unusual signals on uh, mass spectrometry evaluation that's typically used for CDGs. And so we're following up on those to see if there's any interesting uh, biomarkers there. It's a fairly busy week for families. You can see that their schedules are pretty blocked off. It's a, uh, it's a bit exhausting, but we're trying to get essentially everything done in one point in time. But this is not really going to be uh, sustainable for uh, the longitudinal neurodevelopmental evaluation. So we have some other ideas in mind for that. One is that STAR is, uh, has started work on a patient registry, which would collect medical records. And we're trying to encourage them to collect uh, DICOM MRI images as well, so that we have those available for uh, longitudinal evaluation. And then uh, Dr. Audrey Thurm, who's a neurodevelopmentalist, also in the intramural program and has done work in autism and um, other cognitive impairment-related disorders, uh, has some tools that she's used where um, the, the family can either fill in a form by themselves or that can be mentored remotely to, uh, to collect that data rather than bringing families in and we're exploring those as well. So the challenge is, familiar to everybody here, um, the collection of uh, the connection between disease manifestations and the cause of the disease is incompletely understood. Um, and the primary clinical manifestations are fairly nonspecific and change slowly over time and vary from one individual to the next. Um, and then the other decision we have to make, I alluded to earlier, is we have at present a cohort that's really dominated by one particular variant. And so it, should we you know, focus our attention on that variant or should we work on better ascertainment around the world to um, understand what the uh, global population looks like? And then strengths you've heard about, really the consortium has uh, injected a huge amount of energy into these efforts. Um, and uh, the existence of a mouse model and ongoing work on biomarker identification we'll hear more about during the next talk by uh, Dr. Marianne Hoising. Thank you. Okay, um, so then I will uh, proceed with um, uh, the challenges and successes in uh, the FSASD basic science aspects. And we uh, have, um, have divided this in three groups, cell and mouse models, methods and tools, and therapeutic approaches. So starting with the cell models, um, we've really started uh, collecting human and mouse cell models for about two to three years now, and we have, um, um, we've collected this group of ten, about 10 fibro human fibroblast patient cell lines, uh, some lymphoblastoid lines, uh, three iPSC lines derived from patients' fibroblast, and which are now um, in the process of being um, um, transformed to neural stem cells, and we're discussing which other uh, cell types or 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 embryo or, or or 3D models we should differentiate these in. Uh, regarding mouse cell models, there are two mouse models available. Uh, we have uh, embryonic fibroblast from both lines, and primary neuronal cells can be created from the mouse brain uh, knockout uh, at uh, Einstein Medical Center. And we're also working on um, unstable human cell lines with a complete knockout uh, by CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology or by knockdown technology, it's still in process. And uh, we're trying to tag endogenous SLC17A5 with CRISPR-Cas9 technology to, um, to, to see where this pro what this protein does in the cell. So some challenges at this point that we're working on is the um, how, in which cell types um, to 
to um, differentiate the, the available iPSCs and which brain-like organoids we should, we should work on. Um, all of this requires specific experience, time, it's time consuming, it requires personnel. Uh, our consortium is, uh, you know, limited in resources and personnel, so we have to make good uh, and, and wise choices there. We um, were lucky to have included the NCAT stem cell translational lab in our consortium, which hopefully can help us advise or create some of these uh, models. And we also have to uh, think about creating isogenic cell lines. Now we're at the start of this differentiation process because it may be important uh, to have, have a good control for, for the therapeutic and pathogenic uh, pathomechanism studies. Um, yeah. So then uh, regarding mouse models, um, a, a knockout mouse, mouse model has been available for, for quite a while and has been described in the literature. It's currently being studied at Einstein Medical Center and it's also available through the MRRC uh, repository. Uh, this mouse model has a short lifespan, one to three weeks uh, after birth. Um, and uh, we created uh, at, at NIH with uh, CRISPR-Cas9 technology and R39C, the Finnish mutation uh, knock-in mouse model. Um, this mouse model um, um, replicates the human disease. It has a longer lifespan. Five to seven months are actually mice uh, older, way older than seven months now. Um, the, these knock-in mice show hypocyalation uh, and a thin corpus callosum uh, mimicking the human disease and uh, have increased urinary free sialic acid. Further characterization of the mouse model is ongoing. Um, so some challenges regarding mouse models that we're facing at this time is that the knockout mice uh, live short, live, have a short lifespan, which um, which may be difficult for therapeutic studies or for pathomechanism studies. Uh, but the knock-in mice, the knock -in mice um, are much more relevant uh, for, for therapeutic studies. Uh, however, we need to um, choose wise outcome parameters in this mice, and um, neurobehavioral studies are being analyzed now. Uh, and we, again, we need, since, since we have such a, a small research group, limited resources, limited time, we need to make wise choices on, on, um, on planning using these mice for therapeutic studies. And we have to do this in a collaborative way. Uh, so then regarding methods and tools, we uh, face several challenges. Some of them we, we more or less solved. Uh, so first, um, access to free sialic acid assays or total sialic acid assays. Um, we, um, we thought this was important that all consortium um, collaborators use the same assay, the same method, so we, we, we can, uh, we can um, uh, compare the same sialic acid levels across different uh, groups. So Greenwood Genetic Center, also part of our consortium, uh, received uh, a grant from the Star Foundation uh, to perform uh, free sialic acid assays at no cost for all consortium uh, members. A, a great help, uh, a great step forward. Um, we have uh, a small subgroup working on antibodies, recognizing human and mouse, um, uh, SLC 17A5, it's quite a challenge. Um, also, some alternatives for that are being uh, researched with this small working group, including tagging, as I said, the, the endogenous gene. Uh, we have to discuss uh, biomarker discovery, again, make smart choices with our funding, resources, personnel, uh, see which omic studies on which cell types, or which tissues we need to uh, pursue, and um, it would be good to characterize the stored material uh, in lysosomes. Uh, and then uh, we did a big, uh, we're doing a big focus on uh, disease-specific cell assays that we could potentially use for screening uh, drugs. Um, so in this regard, we have already um, researched, uh, we've already 
Uh, looked at a lot of different uh, markers, uh, like uh, lysosomal membrane markers, endolysosome size, pH markers, looked at stored material, salic acid, gangliosides, uh, or others in, in lysosomes. And um, we're pursuing uh, validating this uh, already published assay where uh, labeled uh, alkyne or azide labeled uh, free sialic acid is incubated with cells. Cells take them up through endocytosis, brought to lysosomes. Uh, in control cells, these, uh, these labeled sialic acids get incorporated in, uh, in glycans in the cells, uh, but in FSASD cells, this, this labeled free sialic acid cannot exit the lysosomes because of the defective transporter and, and do not get incorporated. Uh, this is uh, quite relevant uh, this week because we uh, detect this, this labeled sialic acid with the click chemistry assay, just, um, just received this technology, just received the Nobel Prize. Um, and then finally, uh, therapeutic approaches. Um, so we, our, our goal is to perform translational studies that are, are meaningful for patients now, for current patients. And uh, um, we have um, identified a variety of therapeutic targets already known from other lysosomal storage disorders or, or other, other diseases. And um, several groups are pursuing different, um, um, different uh, targets and all in collaboration. Um, so gene editing, especially for the R39C finish mutation, is under investigation. Uh, or full gene therapy, substrate reduction therapy, chaperone folding um, therapies um, using uh, 3D modeling, uh, followed by biochemical assays, uh, the mTORC1 TFAP pathway, um, interacting drugs or, or mechanisms are being researched. Uh, we have not focused on remyelination drugs quite yet. We, we should get into those as well. And uh, as I said, we're uh, planning drug screening panels once we have a validated robust cell assay. Uh, challenges in this um, is that, uh, as in, in many other leukodystrophies, the exact pathomechanism remains unknown. So continued basic research is needed. Uh, which model to use for meaningful drug testing? We testing that on cells and organized or, or, or organized or mouse models, and uh, if if any of these uh, initiatives uh, yield a, a good candidate drug, how are we moving forward? Which which candidate drug are we going to uh, to pursue in preclinical studies, and which models and and resources are we going to use for this? Um, so, in conclusion, um, the, the chart that Melissa put up uh, in, the, in the beginning of the meeting, we are addressing uh, most aspects of this chart. Uh, as, as David said, uh, the clinical aspects are being addressed. Um, we're working on improved diagnosis, increased awareness. Um, one uh, SLC 17A5 is now included in many uh, um, CLIA certified gene panels in, in the U.S., uh, which is very nice, and we, uh, we hope to identify more patients uh, through that. Um, inclusion of the SALA FSASD in, in, this, uh, in this CLIA meeting is another uh, great success and uh, will increase awareness of the disease. Now, then I talked about the mouse models, the cell models, and that we're exploring therapies. So as other consortiums have shown in the past, also this FSASD consortium demonstrates again how collaborative efforts uh, can truly accelerate therapeutic development for rare diseases. We're really only three years in and we have achieved so many uh, aspects of clinical uh, translational research uh, already. Uh, we, uh, we have non-disclosure agreements in place, so it's freely... Uh, we have a free uh, and, and material transfer agreements and research collaborative agreements, but we have a free exchange of data, of uh, uh, knowledge, and of materials, and it, it goes uh, very easy. Um, we have regular full consortium meetings, some subgroup meetings, and, and this really fosters high energy, committed, and motivated collaborations. It's really a pleasure to have, the, we look forward to having these consortium meetings and telling each other what what we're doing. So I, I think it's, 
it's a, a way forward for rare, for rare diseases. So thank you. about using a severity term and, and how that might come across to patients hearing you have severe disease or you have intermediate disease and then whether or not that's setting up for exceptions to those, those types of classifications. It's, that's a good point. I mean, I think that the reality is, is that somebody with severe you know, with the severe phenotype, it's very obvious because it's an infantile onset, infantile fatal disorder. The concept of using, and I learned this way back when I was training, of using mild when you're talking about a disease like any kind of LSD, we think of it in the healthcare profession, yeah, it's mild, it's okay, it's milder than the others, but for the family, it's far from mild. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more sensitive way. You know, we think it's still, you know, it's a disease. It's not going to, you're not going to make it better by calling it one thing or the other. But um, I think that the less severe families still have a fatal disease on their hands. So... Right. And, and I don't know the right answer, right? If, if you call it infantile, it, like I, it, we're, we're struggling with these other disorders too. Like Absolutely, we, yeah. We worry about families starting up. Right. And we also have, you know, other lysosomal disorders which have type 1 or type A or whatever it is, and it's extra confusing then as well. <laughs> so. Uh. Great to see you again. Um, I, I just want to remind uh, that uh, you don't have to have uh, elevated uh, sialuria. I mean, sialuria, you can have it without it, as we showed it to patients in collaborations with you. Uh, do you check it in the spinal fluid uh, uh, at, at, at the NIH? Uh, this one turned on? Yes. Uh, I to you. Um, we are routinely making sialic acid measurements in the spinal fluid. Interestingly, I brought this up with the Greenwood Laboratory, which is doing testing, and they haven't had, to their knowledge, they have never had a, uh, uh, a false negative for somebody who ended up turning out to have sialic acid with the urine study, which was interesting because of that paper um, that uh, described some patients that had um, elevated sialic acid only in the CSF. So I guess I would, on my to-do list is to follow up with um, uh, Keith Highland and Medical General Genetics and maybe Mayo, other places that are doing that testing and find out if, uh, if they've made some preliminary diagnoses based upon uh, CSF and then later found out that the, the urine values were normal. So I think it's a good point. I don't have new information yet, but I'd like to explore that. So, oh. Maybe I could just make a comment on both of those questions. I mean, for some diseases, an age-related terminology, late infantile, juvenile, adult, is somewhat easier for families to cope with, I think, than the terms mild and severe or AMB or 1 and 2. And then also for some other lysosomal storage diseases, with as patients age, the metabolites literally disappear under certain circumstances. And so if you're measuring say, glycosmonic glycans in an older MPS patient, you may not see them, even though the patient has the disease. And I think we all know that, but it's probably worth reinforcing it in this context. Great. Thank you. I think it, those, are, uh, those are good points and something to consider as we're designing the follow-up studies going forward. All right. Well, thank you all. Thanks again. Great presentations. <laughs> so, uh, so we're going to take an, another brief coffee break, but I'm going to ask everybody to be back precisely at 11, and we're going to start. Once we come back, 
But once we finish the last morning session, we're going to be uh, doing a group picture. Because we're a large group, we're going to do it on the stairs of the main hospital. Um, it's a it's a one block walk away. So when we finish the next session, we're going to um, we're going to just all walk as a group. My team will be available to help walk people there. We'll literally go there, take a picture, and come back so we have enough time for lunch and all the the networking we want to do. Please make sure to recall that masks are obligatory in the hospital setting, and you must grab your mask and wear it as soon as you walk in the hospital. We'll take all the masks for pictures, put them back on, and come back. All right. So take a short break. Be back promptly at 11, and then we'll have plenty of time for networking at lunch.
I don't I don't see your slides. Uh, anyway. Wait, wait, wait. Uh, I don't see her. I can't start with her. My slides are not there. No, the slides are not there. Are the slides there? No, it's not there. Uh, okay. Let me go find Henry. Okay. <laughs> It's a different folder, man. It huh? It's uh, it's yeah, going. So Probably take another minute. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a huge file. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I had it in there. Of course, it's all about changes. Yeah. 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, we're going to get started. We may have a somewhat uh, abbreviated content just because we're we have a speaker missing in action, which is why we delayed a little bit. Um, but we're going to go ahead and, in the interest of time to get started. So it's my pleasure to talk now about top 4A uh, related leukodystrophy. Um, we. Uh, we benefited um, from a multidisciplinary uh, work group, um, uh, including both our advocacy partners, um, our uh, basic uh, science group, um, a group focused on clinical outcome measures that's part of a collaborative team that's working on a retrospective natural history study in tub 4 a um, and also from uh, some industry partners that are uh, interested in, in developing therapeutics. And then finally, also from members of a clinical advisory board that's working towards uh, planning for clinical trials 
uh, for the reasons that you'll see during our, um, our talk. Um, top 4A loop dystrophy is a spectrum of disorders that, like many of the disorders we've been talking about the last two days, is really a lifespan uh, disorder. And the uh, MRI findings range from a very uh, severe um, sort of early onset phenotype with um, severe hypomyelination plus or minus cerebellar atrophy through a childhood onset uh, version with uh, typically hypomyelination um, and atrophy of the basal ganglion cerebellum, which is where the term HABC comes from, all the way to an adult onset dystonia with no visible um, imaging abnormalities whatsoever. So like many of those words we've been talking about, there's a, likely a range of cellular phenotypes and, um, and, uh, and therefore clinical manifestations. It's inherited in a sporadic or autosomal dominant fashion depending on the severity. Um, there's a single recurrent mutation that represents 20% of affected individuals in pediatric cohorts. Um, that is uh, a D249N variant, um, and that's closely associated with the phenotype of HABC, which was originally uh, the pediatric leukodystrophy phenotype that was described. Um, and um, uh, over time, individuals uh, progress, uh, likely due to, to de neuronal degeneration based on um, our animal models, and patients can become G-tube dependent and lose speech and ambulation. There's a strong component of dysarthria and dysphonia, so that some children even who are still motorically fairly um, uh, uh, intact and adults who are motorically fairly intact will have uh, a whispering dysphonia and have issues with um, the ability to produce a sound. Um, there are no current um, clinical trials. Um, and on a clinical basis, um, although uh, advocacy and collaboration between our advocates and clinician scientists is a real strength of the community, um, and we have multiple uh, registries and multinational uh, natural history studies are ongoing, um, we, we still have a lot of work to do um, in understanding how that, how that impacts uh, clinical uh, management. Um, we also have a, a lot of good luck with preclinical models because they replicate the phenotype uh, fairly uh, well, which as, as we've seen in talks is not always uh, the case. And so they reproduce both the phenotype of neuronal injury and hypomyelination. They reproduce the loss of cerebellar granule cells and striatal uh, uh, neuronal injury. Um, that is seen um, in very nice work done by, uh, by Mahine Bugiani on, um, and others on the um, pathology of this disorder. However, we need to clarify more about how we get from microtubule dysfunction to those cellular phenotypes. And part of the reason why that isn't as clearly defined is really because those experiments are very difficult. Um, you know, both biochemical and polymerization and sort of other assays related to microtubule function are technically challenging and that expertise is still very much needed. Um, in this field. Another thing that's going to be very difficult from a research perspective is the significant phenotypic heterogeneity that I described uh, earlier because you're not going to be able to define an outcome measure that works for the early infantile phenotype and that also works for the adults. And so I think that um, thinking together across that pediatric and adult spectrum is going to be important um, as we think about um, clinical outcome measures that might be useful for clinical trials. Um, biomarkers for target engagement and therapeutic response are still lacking, and correlation of imaging features with clinical phenotypes is lacking because our most severe patients might have less uh, um, uh, phenotypic invo um, imaging involvement than those patients who present later on after a period of normal uh, development. So um, from a clinical uh, perspective, you know, we're still probably lacking in diagnos diagnosis. Most patients are not diagnosed based on recognizable clinical phenotypes because when children present, they might not yet have the full imaging uh, characteristics, and so they can present really with very nonspecific delay delayed appearing myelination early on. Um, and a lot of our patients are identified based on, um, on next-gen sequencing approaches, which as we saw in talks earlier today, are not available worldwide and also are not available across the age spectrum. So it tends to be much more difficult for adults to get access to the type of genetic testing that is needed um, to accurately diagnose these individuals. Newborn screening will probably require molecular testing implementation because there's no clear way that you'd get a blood-based mechanism into a mass spect approach. Um, and symptomatic management approaches are not well defined. Much as we sort of discussed with 4-H, uh, people are trying different um, things like deep brain stimulation, um, SDR, back and pumps, and orthopedic surgeries to manage the very significant uh, dystonic and extrapyramidal um, symptom complex seen in this disorder. Um, and the impact and outcome of these interventions is not yet well understood. And then finally, the clinical phenotypes are not well stratified, you know, limiting ability to, to provide prognostication for families at time of diagnosis, because within the group of patients, just as a small snippet of uh, who present, you know, with an initial period of early development, 
you have one group that we know retrospectively might progress um, very rapidly uh, over the course of a couple years to significant motor impairment, need for G-tube support, and things like that, and another group that might, you know, maintain ambulation for a very long time. Um, multidisciplinary care teams will be needed to manage symptoms, and in particular, uh, the advent of new clinical trials once they are possible. So when we look at our um, heat map and overview, we're grateful for our strengths, but we also recognize that therapeutic development is a significant gap right now, um, and, that, um, and that access to those therapies um, uh, will be important, in particular as we think about, you know, the age spectrum. So we've picked, in our successes and challenges, we've picked two presentations. One which is focused on the preclinical models, their successes, and the, and the explorations right now in therapeutic interventions. And then the second, um, which is a presentation um, on specifically the adult phenotype of this disorder so that we sort of expand our understanding and thinking into the adult age uh, spectrum. So it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Sunetra Sass um, from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia who's going to talk about her work um, in the therapeutics on, in preclinical models in HABC. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adeline. Um, I have been working uh, with this model since last uh, four to five years, and uh, I'm really happy that we have come here, that we have a successful model now. And before beginning, I would like to give a nice introduction, um, but Adeline al already like kind of uh, explained that it is caused by the mutation in gene B tetable in 4A. Uh, and TEF4A is exclusively or predominantly expressed in the brain, and 60% of um, the total beta tubulin comprises of TEF4A. So uh, the importance like gets there where you can see how much it is expressed in the brain, specifically in the myelinating oligodendrocytes and newly formed oligodendrocytes, uh, with uh, some extent in the OPCs, which are precursor cells and neurons. Uh, so this stuff for a dimerizes with alpha tubulin to form microtubules. And the microtubules are then important for neuronal polarity, axonal outgrowth, synapse formation, uh, myelin formation, and for the oligodendrocyte functioning. So then this thus like mutations then cause a different like spectrum of diseases. And one of the spectrum is HABC, which is hypomyelination with atrophy of basal ganglia and cerebellum. So uh, this mutation, uh, which is D249N, is a recurring mutation. And as Arlene mentioned, it is found in more than 20% of the patient population of uh, TEF4A-associated leukodystrophies. It, and it's suspected to cause toxic gain of function. Uh, it typically begin, begins in toddler years, where patients have uh, dystonia, ataxia, and the motor function is so progressive that uh, kids lose the ambulation before the end of the first decade of life uh, since they are diagnosed. Uh, there is associated uh, myelin loss and progressive striatal atrophy, which is shown here on the right side of the image, where the dotted line is hypomyelination and thin line is atrophy of basal ganglia. And if you can appreciate here, the cerebellar atrophy for the HABC. And there are no treatment uh, approaches available. So the, to find the treatment, we need the models. And that's what uh, since like last few years we have been de uh, doing. And we have now mouse models as well as we have the IPSC models, the cell models, which we are not presenting here, just on a sense of time. But this beautiful model recapitulates HABC phenotype, which was published in eLife uh, in 2020. So we uh, generated this model in a heterozygous form. And heterozygous has mild phenotype. Uh, but here I'm present, I'm showing you the homozygous mouse, which shows the phenotype starting from P9 and this is wild type, and this phenotype gets severe, uh, where if you can see at P21, they are pretty tremulous, and they walk, attacks, they walk with a toxic gait. The phenotype gets severe, where uh, they get highly dystonic, uh, they, can, they don't ambulate that well, they have seizures, and they die from the seizures, where we have plotted the kaplan meier survival curve, where they die around P30 to P35, and uh, they also present with hypomyelination and cerebral atrophy, which I'm coming across. So to switch a little bit gears, which is not like completely switching, but to understand the function, we generated the knockout uh, of this. Uh, or we didn't, but we ordered the knockout. And what we did is uh, we double-crossed them to s obtain the double knockout, which were completely viable. 
and they, they were breeding fine. So just to give you an overview, now we uh, characterize these four mo models along with our severe double mutant model. So we have the double knockout. This model has one copy of mutation and no tough for it. And we compared uh, these all models to really see if we can rescue uh, the phenotype or HABC phenotype. So this is survival in here. And if you see the knockout are completely normal. They live uh, as long as wild type. Uh, they are happy. There is no any behavioral issues. We have done long-term behavioral issues, et cetera, et cetera. And then if you see the D249 knockout or the compound heterozygote, which I'm going to call, it has like three to five times uh, better survival than the double homozygote. We did the behavior on them, uh, which, uh, which are like different series of tests, but this is like the tremor test, like I mentioned, and we just measured the tremor amplitude, and this, this, these are mainly to just set the outcome measures so that when we establish the treatment, we could use this. So we have a like nice uh, tremor major where they show severe, severe tremors, but then they are deceased, but this, these uh, D249 knockout have much uh, less severe early on, phenotype early, but then it gets, uh, it, it gets there. Uh, even the rotor or which is a motor dysfunction paradigm, um, so this double mutant have, uh, are, as I said, they are less ambulatory and they are not performing well at this point, uh, while the D249 and knockout uh, can perform uh, better early on, but they, uh, they, uh, like they progress or they have progressive motor dysfunction, but it's much more attenuated as compared to the double mutant. The second uh, we checked was the hypomyelination uh, because uh, like that's what we see in patient population. And for the hypomyelination, we chose this different ages. Uh, just to justify the myelination in the mouse begins by P0, then it peaks at P21, and it completes around P48. And we chose these other time points uh, these basic, uh, specifically, this is end stage of this double mutant, and then this is end stage of uh, the compound heterozygote. And we did myelin assessment using ereochrome cyanine stain, which stains the myelin, um, which is the blue in color here. And if you can see, uh, there is much more pro profound loss in this double mutant versus there is preserved myelination and no loss in a knockout, which is plotted here as a graph at different ages. We also did um, electron microscopy uh, in optic nerve as well as in corpus callosum at, again, at two different end stages. And if you see, these are beautiful axons, and there is nice myelin around here, which is much more deteriorated in the double mutant. And uh, we have plotted here as percent of uh, person myelinated axons, where there are thin myelinated, normal, and unmyelinated. And the unmyelinated axons were a lot more in the double mutant, while in, uh, in this uh, compound heterozygote, there was more thin myelinated axons. And of course, by the end stage, uh, it looked like they, uh, they had more unmyelinated, but still there was some preservation of thinly myelinated axons. So um, this again shows that how with the knockout we can rescue this phenotype. Then we also checked if we can, uh, what we see at the oligo uh, oligodendrocytes. So in, we, we, have, we, had al we already know that the oligodendrocytes are reduced in the double mutant model. And we wanted to check uh, if, uh, what, to what extent this compound heterozygote has loss of oligodendrocyte or redu reduced number of oligodendrocytes. And we do see that they are, um, they are lost but, or they are reduced, but they are well preserved as compared to this double mutant. And no, there is uh, no oligodendrocyte phenotype in the knockout, which, uh, which again is a uh, take home message is the knockout uh, really um, is really a uh, good model uh, where we can see that it is a viable treatment strategy. Again, we checked what happens with the cerebellar atrophy. So we again checked 
these time points and um, just to give overview, this is the mouse cerebellar architecture which is stained by the new one and you can see a nice um, staining of the new one uh, which has strained, uh, stained the granule neurons and if you see this is like the area for the double mutant where they have lost many uh, cerebellar granule neurons and the death occurs which is like plotted here as the caspase and we have also counted the neurons and obviously by the end stage uh, of this d 249 and knockout we do see the um, loss of the cerebral cranial neurons but it's much more less severe than what we see in the double mutant so uh, this again like uh, same message that it rescues the cerebellar atrophy hypomyelination and um, and the motor phenotypes so this shows that how we can use this model, how we can uh, use this approach uh, as an advantage to find the clinical treatment. So there is also, a, this paper, this is a recent publication which resonates with our finding where they have used another HABC mutation which is n 41 4K. There are very few patients for this mutation, and they show similar thing with the knockout or normal. And more the dosage of the mutation, more more is uh, the toxic gain of function or poisoning tubulin, which causes the defects and causes the phenotype to be severe, intermediate to severe. So this, like with the one, like just if I'm having one copy of wild type, uh, the phenotype is mild, and that's what we see as well. And then, uh, again, this is uh, JITNAL, which is N414K mutation, and then which is similar to our compound heterozygote, which has, uh, like, in-between phenotype, and this is the strongest phenotype. So... So as I said, this is a viable treatment approach, and that's why we focused on antisense oligonucleotides. And I think uh, the group now already knows what are antisense oligonucleotides, where uh, they just like um, bind uh, bind to the target mRNA, recruit the RNAs H, of course, depending on the type of ASO you use, and then they are degraded and the mutated protein is reduced. And that's what we are aiming here, and we screen some ASOs against the 4 a and we um, have some pilot data which shows that we can see rescue in some of the animals. So we did the injections at P1 because we want, want to target the pediatric population and the blue <coughs> color here, 1316, is the ASO uh, which we had screened and all these other like black and gray are the controls. So this is just the video which shows uh, at P35 basically they are like not ambulatory and this <coughs> mouse is still hanging. It's not perfect. Uh, it's not there yet, but it's still like better than uh, the other mice which are there. And we can see here, like we have plotted this graph, and we see a better rescue of the motor phenotype. <coughs> we also did grip strength, uh, and we, we saw better grip of these mice as compared to untreated controls. Uh, then we, uh, this is survival, we plotted uh, the survival curve. The survival is not extensive, but we saw uh, seven to eight days uh, survival, uh, better survival. And if you see these, this is the, I, I'm going to play with the video again. So this is much more ambulatory than the untreated, and it it, it is exploring, it's behaving a little normal than the uh, untreated mouse. So again, uh, the amazing thing which we saw was the seizures, which we were not expecting at all. So these uh, mice have really clonic tonic seizures where they kind of like go stiff and their t t tail goes like this and they are, but in, when we counted the seizures over 12 hours, we see that there are, there were no seizures or very few seizures in, the mouse, in this mouse where we injected ASO. So that was like the amazing thing which we saw with this ASO. Um, then next we check what is happening at the pathology level, and we do see some preservation of myelin, both in uh, corpus callosum as well as in cerebellum. And the data which I've not shown here is the cerebellar granule neurons, which we are not able to uh, rescue, but we are, we are currently synthesizing more ASOs and we are working on them. So we are hoping that we'll get there, but uh, at least we see some proof of concept. 
Sorry. So to conclude, uh, this is a good model where we can use to develop the treatment strategy. Um, again, the knockout doesn't have any phenotype, this, uh, which shows that these mutations are caused by toxic gain of function. Again, the disease co co correlates with the oral expression of mutant F4A and relative preservation of wild type. And the knockdown is a viable treatment approach, as you see that ASO treatment alleviates the, some of the HABC phenotypes. Uh, again, treatment is not mutation specific, so it could be applicable to other tf associated leukodystrophies. And with this, I would really like to thank everybody, especially the lab team and our amazing research techs who have helped me to do this work. Louis is uh, our IPS tech and Julia is our mouse tech who has done uh, work and then collaborators and of course all the f foundation partners, Synaptics Bio, who funds our research and affect patients and affect their family. Thank you. So thank you again, and thank you for inviting me. Um, this is a very clinical talk, really. I probably should have gone before you, and we could have seen the patients, and then your very nice mouse work, which really, really would, would be very good in the patients I'm about to show you. But it's to show you some of the phenotypes, and this is a very heterogeneous disorder. Um, we see patients both with milder and severe phenotypes, as you've shown with the particular mutation in your mouse model. So I see all sorts of patients with neurogenetic conditions, and we video everybody. And this is why I like to show videos of patients as well. So as, as we've talked about, over 180 mutations um, in TUB before. Uh, the main questions really are the genotype phenotype. Can we predict progression? What scales perhaps to use? Best management for patients? And talking about heterogeneity, which is... Uh, a, a problem with many of these rare disorders. Um, we don't quite understand why there's such a spectrum of clinical heterogeneity. And my last slide, I'll talk a little bit about newborn testing, which uh, it, it may be slightly controversial and differs in different countries, but I think it's a very important thing to consider. So I'll run over this quite briefly, but uh, basically clinically, MRI, but genetics. Genetics is changing the things we do. As we've spoke about, many people are testing older adults now genetically and picking up some unusual mutations and some unusual phenotypes. Uh, there's a differential here, including TUB B4. We've heard about some of the other genes today and yesterday. But TUB B4, we have two, what shall we say, a spectrum of phenotypes from the predominantly DIT4, which was considered really a dystonia, but we consider it now probably more broader than that, to the uh, HABC, which we've just heard about. I mean, this is not quite up to date in terms of mutations. Uh, there's many more mutations. Um, but we have probably three sections of the gene. Um, we have a, a, an N-terminus, second domain, middle part, and then a C-terminus. The N-terminus is where the first uh, mutations were found, and I think that came out just about the same time as Adeline's paper uh, in, in American Journal uh, was the finding of the, uh, the DIT4, or the Heacham family, which was very much a dominant uh, dystonia, but quite complex. And as we've heard about with the tub before, the, the 249 mutation, which uh, was, was first presented in the American Journal paper, and the mouse model. So in terms of thinking about genotype, phenotype, I, I go back to, to a nice paper by uh, Adeline and colleagues, and uh, she also shared with me a nice poster looking at all of these mutations. And I think we can see a genotype, phenotype effect in terms of where the mutations lie, according to the age of onset, according to the imaging, and according to the clinical features. So if you have mutations in either end of the, the gene, the phenotype, in my uh, opinion, is milder. The imaging tends to be less dramatic, as opposed to if you have mutations in the middle of the gene, which is the mutations of the 249 or the 255, around about that second domain. 
So if we look at some of the clinical phenotypes, I'll put the volume up because we've heard about whispering dysphonia, but probably very few people in the audience know what whispering dysphonia is. Uh, so this is the original family, and they were first from a place called Heacham. I'll just stop the video. Heacham is just there. So I was born about 10 miles away from Heacham. And that's where the original family came from. And then they migrated over to Australia, probably as prisoners. And uh, that's where the original family started. And most of the family now are in, uh, I think in, a, in a place called Townsville in Queensland. And this is the, the video the of the puppy patient. bit the tape. We mow our lawn all year. So this strained dysphonia. Um, so it's, it's vocal cause dys, dystonia that's causing it, and it's very strained. It does sometimes improve with Botox in patients. Not always, but it does. You have to. <laughs> and this is patients with a mutation at the end terminus, and it's the dysphonia, the dystonia, and then this classical hobby horse gait. Excellent. I've never ridden a hobby horse. I couldn't tell you whether that was a hobby horse, but it's a very unusual gait, and it's quite classical in this uh, particular mutation in this family. I'm getting right close to the tongue if you can. The puppy bit the tape. A puppy bit the tape. Now this one. We eat eels every day. So she improves with, uh, with, with tetrabenazine, and some of the family also improved with DBS as well. And this seems to be a feature of patients at the end or the C-terminus in terms of their, their response to treatment, as opposed to patients in the middle of the, the gene. So if I take you through to another patient, there's another patient with a, with a mutation at codon 2. And uh, on the left, preoperatively, this is why I quite like... DBS in certain patients, and I think it improves anarthria in certain patients. Well, I haven't just said. She's anarthric. And she's got an abnormal gait. And the main reason she went to, to, to DBS mainly was because of the anarthria. And the anarthria was improved a little bit, but the gait was significantly improved. And so was her dystonia rating scores. So that's the, the, the end terminus. Now, if you look at the middle of the gene, this is where there's more of a severe phenotype. This is much, very much a spastic dystonia, early onset, ataxia, ocular abnormalities. And they often have this unusual, painful oculogyloric crisis, which we've seen in older patients. I couldn't tell you about the younger patients, but certainly it's present in older patients. And I'll give you just an example of, of this. Some of them do have the whispering dysphonia, but the, the features of patients with mutations in the middle of the gene, they tend to rapidly progress. This is a young girl from our series at Queen Square. Hopefully it will play. Maybe it won't. I'll describe what she sees. But basically, she's got a early-ish onset, childhood onset, not, not in the first year. I think onset was two or three. She presents with a whispering, mild dysphonia, mild dystonia. And she does OK until she gets into her 20s when she develops more of a generalized dystonia and spasticity. So it's, it's and I think this kind of fits with some of Adeline's work in her poster where they, they they can be a little bit milder in the early phase, and then they progress more rapidly later on. And these are patients with mutations in the middle of the gene. And then if we look towards the C-terminus, again, very similar to the N-terminus patients. Earlier onset, slower progression, but they do, often they get certain events that make them progress more rapidly, like this lady in her 50s. And then can you lean your head like that? Good, and then the other side. She's got this unusual crawling gait, 
And then when she uses a, a, a walker, it's kind of a hobby horse gait as well. Similar the rainbow to is a... And I'll just take you through that. So again, DBS helps her with her speech, helps her with her gait. And I think um, in terms of pre-DBS, this is, this is quite dramatic for patients in terms of patients with an N or a C-terminal mutation. So thinking of the phenotypes, I think the main phenotype group that we have to con consider without very much successful treatment are the patients in the second domain, in the middle of the gene, just like the mice that were presented. That's the area of need. And they would be the ones that I would want to target with ASOs. I mean, you should probably target any patient, but I think they're the ones that we have nothing for and don't respond to um, uh, DBS, don't respond to your typical drugs such as your anticholinergics. They don't, uh, they don't do at all well. And then Adeline also shared with me a poster, but only last night. So this is an addition quite, but she quite nicely looked at 180, I say he, she, and team looked at 180 patients, including some of our patients from Francesca in, in London. And uh, she found similar things that we found in terms of certain patients have an early infantile presentation. Um, but then there's others, more commonly the late infantile presentation, where they, they, they don't do badly initially. I mean, I, this is sort of in the first few years of life, but they tend to rapidly progress later on in terms of their dystonia. Uh, they need a peg feed, so there's obviously anarthria as well, swallowing problems, uh, and, and that seems to be a limitation in the mutations in the middle of the gene. So we're all overall thinking about how to, how to manage patients. Um, I think, as we said, I think patients with uh, certain mutations are very responsive to certain treatments, such as DBS. I think uh, the dystonia, the swallowing of the spasticity are the key things to look at in terms of improvement. I'm not sure about the imaging. It, 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 there is some, some myelination abnormalities, but I'm not sure how susceptible that would be to improvement in terms of treatment, given the main features are atrophy, and I can't see ASOs actually putting that back into the brain of these patients. Um, and then the other thing I want to mention is, is the tub 4 phenotypic variation and the mosaicism. So many patients, or well, I say many, I know of four, but that's only because of me thinking about them. I'm sure there's others have, it's de novo, but when we use next generation sequencing, we see one of the parents has also got a percentage of mutations. So I've got two patients, one with 20%, um, another one with, with only 10%, but we see it on next generation sequencing. So is that, is that part of the phenotype? Do we see that mosaicism, both gonadal and somatic, affecting the phenotype? Perhaps we're going to see parents presenting with late onset dystonia as well if they carry 20% of the mutation. We, we don't know this. And my last slide is just um, thinking about moving forward in our hospital and perhaps in your hospitals as well. So we have a system in our hospital where we, we, uh, we take blood on everybody that consents, that walks in the door. Um, in common disorders, we're looking at polygenic risk, risk to pre predict problems, to prevent problems. So that's number three at the bottom here. Everybody walks in, gets that. I mean, they can say no, but they're offered that and 99% uh, of people take it. Then we have a second one where we take blood for Mendelian disorders, and we do whole genome on every patient that is part of the, of the testing registry. So pretty much all inherited disorders, leukodystrophies, neuropathies, ataxias, spastic paraplegias, are part of that are genomes as a trio on the NHS, so they don't pay any money. But the thing we're doing at the moment over the next three years is doing a pilot of 500,000 newborns. And this is going to be a layer cake approach. So what we want to do is, is sequence these children. We will have actionable initial layer cake tests, such as um, um, treatable conditions, manageable conditions. And then later on, we may consider talking about things like uh, Bracker and Huntington's once they're over the age of 18. But under the age of 18, we will avoid any 
contentious issues such as Huntington's, BRCA mutations, and only deal with the actionable genes. So that's the plan with the, the genome sequencing. But then the other thing is talking about some of you in the audience may have patients with a single allele in a recessive disorder. And what do you do if the patient fits that uh, clinical picture? This is another initiative we have is, is looking at RNA sequencing and then doing long read sequencing. I've talked to a few of you about long read sequencing in known genes as well as in that gene. Because what we've found is, is deletions, inversions, insertions that actually, when you look at them, fit and, and, and can hopefully diagnose patients and then, then allow them to be part of a trial when they're genetically proven. I think the last slide is, is more contentious, but I think in 10 years, we're going to be genome sequencing, certainly in the UK anyway, all babies, I imagine. It has to be careful in terms of how we report these mutations and how we look at them. There'll be problems. We'll probably get sued a few times, but I think it's very unlikely that this won't happen. Thank you very much. Uh, really nice talks. Uh, Sunitra, I had a question for you. So um, in your double mute, obviously the double mutant mouse is more severe than the single mutation. Um, and then when you say you cross the double mutant to the knockout, you say you kind of improve the phenotype? Oh, uh, sorry. We didn't cross double mutant. We crossed the heterozygous. Sorry, the heterozygous. Yeah, yeah. So wouldn't the more appropriate comparator be the heterozygous mutation as comparing the heterozygous to the knockout? Yes, we are, so we do have that data, but I just didn't show. So we have like all the animal cohorts together, including the D249N and, and the wild type. And those are wild, uh, like mild, those are at the milder side. That's why like I included the slide, which included Carol's uh, work, right. which showed like uh, similar what we see, which resonated with our work. Right, because it sounds like the improvement in the phenotype when you cross it with the knockout is because you're reducing one mutant allele yes. rather than knocking down the uh, yeah. wild type allele. Yes. So I think the ASOs would be targeting the mutant allele rather than knocking down the total uh, amount of tubulin. Yes, I. Uh, the ASOs. ASOs is targeting like just all tafuri. It's just yeah. not targeting mutant tafuri. Right, right. Yeah. What I'm trying to say is that the improvement is not necessarily because you're reducing the overall tubulin, but specifically because you're targeting the mutant allele. But we have not tried that in D249 and knockout yet. Uh, so this the ASO treatment which we have tried is in double mutant. Yeah. Right. So when we try in the single mutant. Uh, but there will be no tafuri, so we will still decrease the mutant tafuri in the mouse. But, but importantly, yeah. the, we importantly did not want to do personalized to one, one single mutation, even though we do have that common mutation, because we wanted the, um, the therapeutics to be accessible for all patients with tafuri mutations, right? So we are knocking down, you know, it's very difficult because there's not great antibodies for tuporay compared to other tubulins because there's just a lot of homology. I won't get into the details, but we're not knocking down more specifically the mutant versus the the wild type. We're just knocking down, and and a knockdown is helpful. Right, right. Like, and it's effectively, what you're doing is you're permitting competition. And there's Drosophila uh, data for this and things like that. That when you have any tubulin, not just tuporay mutation, if you knock it down, it's well tolerated because other tubulins take its spot, right? So there's an upregulation of other tubulins and then and then they're basically subbed in, right, for the for the missing tubulin, which is the mutant one or the wild type one of that type. Does that make sense? Right. Yeah, I think maybe you can talk after this yeah. I have another specific And we also do see that data like what Adeline is saying in our nanostring panel. Yeah. So we see upregulation of other tubulins in response, and the 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 tub for a wild type has symptom uh, has a phenotype, but it's much milder. And it takes so long that it's not really realistic from a preclinical model therapeutic perspective because you'd have to wait a long time, right, to see effect. And so um, our primary goal in this is to develop a a testing platform for therapies. 
Also, tough for a D249 and wild type has a mild, like just the myelin fee, uh, behavioral, but not the behavior phenotype, just the myelin uh, degeneration. Right. Okay. This question over here. Is this working? I'm going to send it to Adeline because I know she can take my harder questions. Um, but the but the all of you can respond. When we're thinking about new therapies, moving beyond the gene and thinking more about what disease modifying act targeting. I didn't do anything. Okay. Um, remyelination. I know that's why I'm like not covering anything. Remyelination versus neuro repair. Which would you prioritize? Because each has its, its advantages and disadvantages, but I'd like to hear your perspective. We can't do everything, but it would be good to get that perspective on what would you target. All right. I'll, I'll take a first pass, and then I'll, I, Henry, maybe you can also comment. So I think that, you know, we've heard about a number of different hypomyelinating disorders this morning, right? And, you know, in reality, it's likely that a lot of them have both a neuronal and a glial phenotype, right? And I think, and I, I love, Nicole, your example where you have the, the person with the worse cerebellar atrophy, but the better myelination is actually doing less well than the person with the better cerebellar atrophy, but the worse myelination, right? And so I think that that we really need to think about probably and understand better what's driving the worst symptoms, right? And I think that it's not clear to me that the glial cells are driving the, the biggest symptomatic burden. And so I think we're going to have to think very carefully about, about, um, about cellular compartments as we develop these therapeutics. And I think, you know, the adult data with the DYT4 where they don't actually have a visible at least myelin phenotype but have a very prominent neuronal phenotype is a good example that you can be highly symptomatic. And, you know, interestingly, in the, in the, we have patients with mutations at that same salt bridge R2, but who are early infantile onset. And they have, they have some hypomyelination, but they don't have, ser they don't have like the, the basal ganglia atrophy and everything else, but they have clinically a very prominent sort of extrapyramidal presentation, much like the adults. So I think there's a lot we don't understand about the cellular compartments. And I think that we're not going to tease that out until we start treating one compartment and see see where our deficiencies are. I don't know if that is helpful, but I think that's the experience we're going to live through. Yeah, I very much agree. I mean, there's a difference in adults and children, but yeah, I, I think uh, it's interesting that you think of neuronal versus glial. Uh, certainly in the adults, I'm not convinced that there's particularly any cognitive problems in these patients. You know, I, I'm quite surprised that there's not. Um, correct me if I'm wrong from, from the audience, but so there, there is certainly a difference in, in, in that spectrum. But I, I agree with Adeline. Yeah, and then within the neurons, there's different compartments of cortical, which is going to give you more dementia, and, you know, basal ganglia and cerebellar, which might give you, you know, these things are, which may be easier to treat, yes. I'm biased. I see mostly patients with that phenotype. So for me, it's very easy. But not always. Question, Florian. I'm just curious. Um, what are your mice dying of? And uh, seeing that you're treating a T1 and not seeing much extension of survival is the cause of the death of the in those people? So the cause of the death, we believe, is the degeneration of the cerebral granule neurons uh, because we see the hypomyelination from the beginning, but the uh, loss or death is mainly because of this uh, degeneration of the granule neurons. And that's what we are trying now to like target. Maybe if we could save them, then we would be able to reverse the phenotype much more efficiently than um, like hypomyelination. Hmm. I think that's starting in utero because... No, that's... That's that's toxic gain of function. So it's starting somewhere from P14 to P21, and then it's getting worse uh, by the end stage. Yeah, it, um, conventional antisense approaches don't aren't equally penetrant across all cell types, right? And and people know that as they've tried um, antisense approaches in different um, compartments, like you know Huntington's disease and things like that. And so I think that that we're going to have to 
become more sophisticated in cell delivery as we sort out the best cellular targets. Good question over there. Uh, the antisense oligo, uh, the treatment is very promising, so possibly can translate to the clinical use. I just wonder, uh, just as Eileen said, is not every cell type is even penetrate. Is any area different of the penetration? How efficient the antisense oligo to equal the knockdown, right? So, so do you try different route or different dosage? for compare the effects, and uh, here's a question one. Second is uh, for the mutation, the tubulin for A, looks like they generate uh, a toxic, gain toxic function protein. So if you knock down, possibly have a threshold, not necessary to go completely eliminate protein, if a threshold is there. Possibly you can test you know, how low the protein need may be eliminated the phenotype. Yeah, uh, those are very good points. So to answer your first question, uh, whether you're asking to use different routes and different methods, so we are looking into that, and we are currently exploring different routes, which is cystina magna, which is close to the cerebellum, to see if we can target the granule neurons. Then second is we are, uh, again, trying different approaches, like the AV gene therapy, and also like... Uh, uh, other like uh, nanoparticles, like biomaterials, to see if we can target uh, the cerebellar granule neurons. And then for the second thing is, yes, we do, uh, but we don't see, like you say, we are not completely any eliminating the protein. And unfortunately, we cannot see how much protein we have eliminated because we don't have very good antibody. But we are checking at the mRNA level, and in vivo where we are seeing the knockdown is somewhere from 40 to 50 percent. Uh, and I think with if if we could like achieve that target everywhere in the brain, at least we would be able to have some intermediate phenotype, like like the mouse model which I showed. Thank you. Do you want to add something? Right. Maybe last question. So um, my question was, uh, do you have any idea on the differential expression of the different cells in the central nervous system? Because, uh, you know, different isotypes have different expression. If there is a bias in the expression of the different cell types in the central uh, nervous system. That's an excellent question, and I didn't show the data. So we have four different variants, uh, and... Variant 3 is uh, highly expressed, as, at least in humans. And in mouse, we are exploring that using RNA scope and have not shown that data. But we do see uh, that the expression starts at P0 in mice, and it uh, linearly increases uh, like after P7. And then it, it kind of gets steady. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, I think it, it, it is mapping... Right. Again, these are experiments that are going, but it's it's similar to the experiments that have been already done on single cell RNA seq. Um, that it's highly expressed in um, cells of the glial lineage, right? But what we don't know is, you know, is it's maybe that a little bit of expression in um, certain cell types is sufficient to cause significant problems, especially at a specific developmental age. Okay. All right. Thank you all. All right. All right. So just a. Oh, go ahead. I clap for my colleagues here. Thank you both for giving excellent talks. So just as a reminder, when you step outside, please take your masks. And everybody who's not photophobic um, uh, is uh, hopefully going to accompany us to the main hospital for a quick uh, photo op. And then when you come back, we'll have lunch where breakfast was served this morning.
Yeah, I think it's ten past one, so I think by the time we finish, we have till two o'clock then, yeah? All right, if everybody can take their seats, we're going to get started shortly. Can you take that laser pointer off so we don't have that red dot? Yeah, there you go. I think it has to be turned off. I don't know. Do you know how to do it? No, I just don't want to see the red dot if we can avoid it in the middle of everything. I'm going to end the show and start again. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so we just want one more round and then we'll start. Excuse me. Am I allowed to have the laser pointer, or did you not like that? Pardon? Did you not like the laser pointer? Then? Oh, are you going to use it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, just keep it down the side. The was for two of them. They didn't use it. They left it right in the middle, so on all the slides. Just no, sit I'm going to be moving it around. Okay, I'll, I'll try and keep yep. it down here. Yeah, yeah. when, you, when okay. you're done with it, just uh, take it off. Then. Yeah, that's what happened. They left it, so we had two lectures where I'm just this red dot sitting in the center of the hole. No, I plan on using it. I'm just going to grab a microphone. Give me one minute. Just a minute. Just a quick little box time with the CTX. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you guys for being here. All right, so we're headed into the home stretch here, um, and we're going. We're we're finishing up somewhat uh, age appropriately with uh, a number of primarily adult onset disorders, um, and I'm so I'm personally so glad to see these disorders um, be represented today because I think that um, the adult community has long been underserved, with the exception, of course, of AMN. The adult community has long been underserved in our um, in our field, and I'm really excited to see these groups uh, present their data. Before, um, before we get started, I just want to announce the two winners, unless somebody else has more than 10 pins, the two winners of the uh, challenge, the pin challenge, and it's uh, Catherine Ortman and Geneviève Bernard, for the most connections made with advocacy group. I'll bring you your gifts so I get out of the way. All right, and it's my pleasure um, to introduce the CTX working group now. Great, thanks. Um, well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, firstly, I would like to thank the organizers for including CTX as one of the leukodystrophies for the 2022 GLIA scientific meeting. And especially thank you to Omar and Rachel for their organizational help for the CTX work group. I'm honored to be here today on behalf of the CTX work group. I will be providing an introduction and a heat map overview for CTX, followed by a presentation on a key success for CTX entitled Biomarkers for CTX. Then Dr. Robert Steiner will be providing a presentation on a key challenge for CTX entitled Availability of Treatment for CTX. Uh, the information presented here is the result of very interesting discussions held by the CTX work group. 
Uh, and I would like to thank again uh, these members of the work group that contributed to the work that will be presented here today. So that includes Dr. Robert Steiner um, from Wisconsin, USA, Dr. Antonio Federico um, from the University of Siena, Italy, Dr. Hida Huda Cooper from University of Medical Center Rotterdam in the Netherlands, and Jean Pickford, a patient advocacy leader from the CTX Alliance. So cerebrotendinous anthomatosis, or CTX, is caused by a deficiency in the sterol 27 hydroxylase enzyme, which is important in the pathway from cholesterol to the primary bile acids, chenodeoxycholic acid and cholic acid. It is characterized by decreased concentrations of the primary bile acids, in particular chenodeoxycholic acid, and increased concentrations of bile acid pathway intermediates and derived cholestanol and bile alcohols. CTX is inherited in an autosomal recessive manner with biallelic pathogenic variants in the CYP27A1 gene. Affected individuals can present with a history of infantile onset diarrhea, also infantile cholestasis, juvenile bilateral cataracts in the childhood period, followed by a slowly progressive neurobehavioral phenotype associated with psychiatric disorders, seizures, cerebellar ataxia, pyramidal features such as spasticity and cognitive decline. Characteristic tendon and cerebellar xanthomas may be present. Premature atherosclerosis and osteoporosis may be present. CTX can be treated with chenodeoxycholic acid and cholic acid, the bile acids missing in the disorder, as well as inhibitors of HMG-CoA reductase. Treatment outcomes may be improved by early treatment before the age of 24 and 25 years of age in different studies. But really, additional data on disease treatment from the pre-symptomatic and early stages is needed for this disease. So um, EMA has approved chenodeoxycholic acid to treat CTX and cholic acid to treat inborn errors in primary bile acid synthesis, including CTX. The FDA has not approved uh, chenodeoxycholic acid to treat CDX, CTX, but has approved cholic acid to treat CTX. Um, there is a consensus amongst experts in favor of chenodeoxycholic acid therapy for CTX, except where cholic acid is required. And Dr. Steiner will be talking about this more in his talk. So in terms of the heat map for CTX, I was struck yesterday um, when CTX... Um, the heat map was provided in relation to the other leukodystrophies by the amount of green and blue present for CTX. But really, this in large part reflects the research and clinical advances made about 30 to 50 years ago for this disease. For example, characterization of the biochemical and ge uh, genetic defect and identification of a therapy for CTX in the form of chenodeoxycholic acid. Um, that uh, 40 years ago, when it was demonstrated that this was an effective treatment, uh, chenodeoxycholic acid was approved by the FDA to treat gallstones. And it's currently still approved to treat gallstones, not to treat CTX. Despite the green and blue, there are still a number of research and clinical challenges that need to be addressed for CTX. So in terms of the research challenges and successes, the genetic and biochemical defect is clear but the biochemical pathogenesis of CTX still needs to be better delineated. Really, no good preclinical models exist for CTX. The mouse models created for CTX are not useful. They don't reca recapitulate the human um, clinical and biochemical phenotype. There are no in vitro models. An animal model, in vitro model, and human clinical data are really needed for CTX to better understand the disease pathogenesis and response to therapy. The clinical heterogeneity of CTX is complex with variable severity and even evolution of disease, even within the same families. This is a significant challenge in clinical trial planning. Functional outcomes have not been validated for CTX and may limit clinical trial readiness. Evidence around treatment with chenodeoxycholic acid and cholic acid, age at treatment and long-term outcomes remain difficult to measure, despite improvement of some biochemical markers after treatment. A strength for the community is a University of Siena-based registry, but the community would really benefit from an international registry collecting natural history and treatment data based on standardized outcomes. This will become particularly important as newborn screening may identify patients across a broader phenotypic spectrum. 
CTX benefits from a robust advocacy community that have already engaged successfully with regulatory bodies. So although the heat map overview for CTX looks fairly good, it is illuminating to provide more, a more granular breakdown of the heat map, particularly for the current state of disease modifying therapeutic pathway for CTX. For therapeutic development, progress has been made for CTX. There are ongoing clinical trials and approved therapies. For preclinical scientific development, things look fairly good for the overview, but it is clear at the granular level, as we have already noted, that preclinical models for CTX are sorely lacking. Similar for outcomes clinical planning, more progress is needed in developing defined natural history studies. And for advocacy, more progress is needed to set up patient registries. CTX, though, is far ahead in terms of active and engaged patient community organisation. And so I would really like to take a moment to recognise the patient advocacy community that has really helped to enable many of the successes for CTX that will be discussed today. In Europe, patient advocates have been the driving force behind efforts to lower the price of therapy. Uh, in the US, back in 2007, the ULF brought on their first board member who has a family member with CTX. And in the same year, they provided me with a small grant to support my initial studies on CTX biomarkers. Today, I'll be highlighting development of new biomarker assays for CTX as one of the research successes for CTX. The last few years have been a really exciting time for the CTX community. The ULF worked with CTX families to plan and host the Unlock CTX PFDD meeting with the FDA and have helped them form an independent non-profit organisation named the CTX Alliance. The PFDD meeting for CTX was one of the first opportunities for CTX patients and family members to share their lived experience with the broader medical and reg regulatory community. It truly was a milestone for the CTX community. In terms of the clinical challenges and successes, Diagnostic approaches are well established for CTX, but there are still typically diagnostic delays. There really is still an awareness problem for this treatable disorder. Newborn screening is feasible, but not yet implemented. Strengths for CTX are well-defined standards of care. Um, this recent uh, modified Delphi study published in 2021 and the existence of a care pathway developed in the Netherlands for the diagnosis and management of CTX with a standardized follow-up pro protocol. International consensus on standardised follow-up protocol will be important for this patient community. Care management is best provided via a global approach in CTX, optimally by multidisciplinary care teams that are mostly limited to expert centres. Approved treatments are in place, but access to kinodeoxycholic acid in the US may be limited due to lack of FDA approval. The cost of kinodeoxycholic acid and cholic acid may be prohibitive in the US, Europe and elsewhere, and Dr. Steiner will touch on this in his talk. Um, treatment monitoring is also not fully standardised, um, so uh, the drug response monitoring with biomarkers is not routinely performed, um, and uh, the liver enzyme testing for treatment with kinodeoxycholic acid um, is not so routinely performed. Um, so with that, I will talk about a key uh, disease-specific success for CTX, um, which is biomarkers for CTX. So these are my disclosures. And so I show here the, um, a simplified major classical neutral bile acid synthesis pathway and so this shows the conversion of cholesterol to the primary bile acids, cholic acid and kinodeoxycholic acid. And so as I mentioned, um, the uh, a deficiency in the sterol 27 hydroxylase is the cause of CTX. Um, so it prevents formation of kinodeoxycholic acid um, in particular. And so kinodeoxycholic acid normally negatively regulates uh, the rate of bile acid synthesis so um, the, the step that it regulates is the 7-alpha hydroxylation of cholesterol to form 7-alpha hydroxycholesterol, which is converted to 7-alpha hydroxy 4 cholestin 3 ion or 7-alpha C4. Um, and so the treatment for CTX is replenishment of the kinodeoxycholic acid um, to uh, shut down, damp down this pathway. 
So in CTX, um, this pathway um, is not regulated and all of these uh, substances shown here in dark blue accumulate. So 7-alpha C4 is metabolized to cholestanol um, that many people are familiar with as a biomarker for CTX. It can be further hydroxylated to 7-alpha, 12-alpha dihydroxy 4 cholestin 3 one which is further hydroxylated to 5-beta cholestane 3-alpha, 7-alpha, 12-alpha triol, which is normally converted to cholic acid. Um, but in CTX, um, it uh, is um, converted in another pathway to bile alcohols. And so um, these consist of bile tetrols, and they're further hydroxylated to bile pentols, and then bile hexols. And it is possible for uh, CTX-affected individuals to make a small amount of cholic acid in this bile alcohol pathway. So in terms of biomarkers for CTX, in addition to blood cholestanol, assays have become available for other blood and urine CTX biomarkers over the last five to ten years that provide improved screening and diagnosis for CTX, that may further refine the biochemical follow-up of patients on therapy, and that may help us better understand the patho pathological biochemical processes of CTX. So first, I will um, uh, talk about in, uh, biomarkers that have improved screening and diagnosis for CTX. Uh, biomarkers that have improved uh, screening and diagnosis for CTX. <laughs> So it's been known since the 70s, so for the last 50 years, that elevated blood 5-alpha cholesterol uh, is elevated in CTX. And this was proposed for the diagnosis of CTX. So for the last 50 years, um, you know, uh, folks have been using elevated cholesterol as a biomarker for biochemical confirmation of CTX, along with bile alcohols in the urine, excreted in the urine. In the 80s, it was pointed out by Koopman et al. that 5-alpha uh, cholesterol is a low specificity biomarker for CTX that can be elevated also in liver disease. So accumulation of 7-alpha C4 in CTX was first reported by Bjork, Hem and colleagues in 1987. So my lab in 2010 uh, developed uh, an um, uh, isotope dilution LC tandem mass spec quantitative assay for blood 7-alpha C4 and proposed this molecule as a useful clinical diagnostic marker for CTX and for more rapid monitoring of response to treatment within one month. So cholesterol can take anywhere from 3 to 6 to 12 months to decrease on treatment. So Bjorkhem again showed that um, CTX hepatic liver tissue fractions contain elevated 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4 um, in uh, 1981, um, and my lab was able to set up, uh, again, a quantitative isotope dilution LC tandem mass spec assay for 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4, um, and we were able to demonstrate in 2014 that the use of blood 7-alpha C4 and 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4 um, could be used as improved diagnostic biomarkers compared to cholestanol. And so, very interestingly, in the last year, um, some cases of CTX have been described with normal circulating cholestanol. So these were identified as CTX, and they may represent a milder biochemical form of CTX. So the first case was a case of siblings. Patient one was a wheelchair-bound 57-year-old woman with tendon deposits who had neurological symptoms beginning in her 30s of progressive spasticity. Patient two was a female sibling of patient one evaluated at 60 years of age. She reported bilateral swelling and stiffness of her Achilles tendons. So molecular analysis of CYP27A1 gene in both siblings revealed two previously reported pathogenic variants for CTX. And so interestingly, some of these new diagnostic biomarkers, in particular blood 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4, was elevated in these siblings. So although they had normal cholestanol, some of these other biomarkers were, for CTX were elevated. So another case was very recently reported of a 74-year-old man with normal circulating cholestanol, major tendons and thomas, and no neurological symptoms. In addition, a milder clinical CTX phenotype has been described without neurological involvement. So this was a case series. No correlation was found between this milder clinical phenotype, the cholesterol levels in these patients, and the CYP27A1 genotype. But it is becoming um, uh, evident that the spectrum of disease for CTX is broader than was previously realized. 
In terms of urinary diagnostic markers, um, again, you know, back in the 80s and the early 90s, it was demonstrated that the predominant bile pentol in urine was 23 pentol. So that's 5 beta cholestane, 3 alpha, 7 alpha, 12 alpha, 23, 25 pentol. Um, and so recently in the last five years, my lab was able to attain reference standards and internal standards and again has set up a quantitative um, isotope dilution LC tandem mass spec assay. And we have validated, um, and it's actually 23S is the um, confirmed uh, predominant bile pentol in urine. We validated this as a clinical diagnostic marker and made this available in the clinic. Um, just as a note, this test measures total uh, 23S pentol. So this is actually uh, mostly present as, as its glucuronide conjugate, which is cleaved in this assay um, to measure the, the free 23S pentol. So now I'd like to talk about the use of CTX biomarkers to screen newborn dry blood spots for CTX. So we talked about 5-beta cholestane, 3-alpha, 7-alpha, 12-alpha, 25-tetrol. So this is a bile tetrol, and it has been reported to be the predominant bile tetrol isomer present in CTX blood. And so this was reported again back in the, the 80s um, and in uh, the early 90s. Uh, again, this is predominantly present as its glucuronide conjugate. So 5-beta, um, uh, the three conjugated form of this 25-tetrol um, glucuronide was confirmed to be the main bile tetrol glucuronide species present in CTX bile. And again, we were able to obtain reference standards and stable isotope labeled internal standards, set up a quantitative um, LC tandem mass spec method and demonstrate that the main species present in CTX dried blood spots was the same species, the 25 tetra or 3 um, uh, beta D glucuronide. And so we were able to determine the initial concentration ranges in untreated CTX newborn dried blood spots using isotope dilution um, LC tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, and so in a similar time period, uh, Fred Vaz and colleagues uh, at the Academic Medical Center in Amsterdam were able to use a metabolite ratio of this bile tetrol glucuronide species to toro kinodeoxycholic acid, the toro co conjugate of kinodeoxycholic acid. And they were able to successfully use this as a biomarker to screen newborn dry blood spots for CTX. So um, Mike Gelb then went on to um, perform a pilot uh, research study screening 32,000 newborn dried blood spots for CTX, and he used both the metabolite ratio as well as um, measuring the concentration of this 25 tetrol glucuronide biomarker. Um, and both of these uh, work very well as biomarkers to screen newborn dried blood spots. Uh, Mike identified one CTX positive sample um, and CYP27A1 gene sequencing identified two uh, reported pathogenic variants uh, for this sample. Um, and so this is a, a success story. So this assay is now being used in uh, Dr. Melissa Wasserstein's um, Screen Plus uh, pilot newborn screening study in New York State. And Fred Vaz uh, recently performed a larger pilot to validate this testing um, in the Netherlands, and uh, he anticipates that the uh, Netherlands Newborn Screening Lab will move forward with newborn screen, implementing newborn screening for CTX. So this is very exciting. So in addition to diagnostic biomarkers, uh, these biomarkers can be useful to further refine the biochemical follow-up of patients on therapy. And so a biomarker measured repeatedly over time for evidence of a um, effect of a drug is called a monitoring biomarker and be, can be used to assess the response of a disease or condition to treatment. So kinodeoxycholic acid therapy at 750 milligrams per day decreases or normalizes blood cholesterol and blood 7-alpha C4. Um, dose adjustments can be made on body weight and blood cholesterol concentration. So although kinodeoxycholic acid therapy appears to be helpful from a biochemical perspective de at decreasing the rate of bile acid synthesis, we really need to learn more about the effects of therapy from a clinical and functional point of view, including better understanding how kinodeoxycholic acid impacts the pathological biochemical process of CTX. Um, and so... 
it's very interesting. Um, so uh, chemodeoxycholic acid therapy decreases but may not normalize some of the other biomarkers that we've talked about today. So, for example, blood 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4, the precursor to bile tetrol, bile tetrol and further hydroxylated bile alcohols that are excreted at high concentrations in the urine. So bile tetrol, and this is the same newborn screening dried blood spot biomarker, um, was demonstrated back in the 80s by Salen and colleagues to be markedly suppressed in plasma from six CTX patients at a high daily C uh, chemodeoxycholic acid dose of 1,000 milligrams. Um, and also uh, three other studies looking at a decrease in 23 pentol in the urine showed very rapid decrease in, in this bile pentol in the urine on treatment with chemodeoxycholic acid. So now we have good, high-quality, quantitative um, isotope dilution, LC tandem mass spec assays, and we really want to validate these CTX biomarkers as surrogate endpoint biomarkers. So this is a response biomarker that's an endpoint used in clinical trials as a substitute for a direct measure of how a patient feels, functions, or survives, um, as we believe this would make future clinical trials easier in the U.S., so in my final few slides here, I'm going to talk about biomarkers that may help better understand the pathological biochemical process of CTX. So again, a biomarker um, measured repeatedly over time for assessing the status of disease is called a monitoring biomarker um, that can be used to assess disease progression, including the occurrence of new disease effects, work in it, worsening of previously existing abnormalities or change in disease severity or specific abnormalities. So as I mentioned, there are other substances that accumulate in addition to cholesterol, and we think these may play a role in the clinical severity of disease. So additional studies really need to be performed to determine the effect of these other biomarkers on the brain and the central nervous system. Um, it was proposed back in the 80s that elevated blood bile alcohols may be detrimental to the blood-brain barrier, but really not much work has been done since then. Um, as I mentioned, chemodeoxycholic acid therapy may not normalize other biomarkers such as blood 7-alpha, 12-alpha C4 or bile tetrol or further hydroxylated bile alcohols. Data on additional biomarkers that are not normalized on therapy may help explain how clinical evolution with normal cholestanol is present. This is slow, but the Italian experience is that chemodeoxycholic acid therapy cannot stop disease progression completely. So we have many questions that remain on the links between biochemical data and relation to patient genotype or disease-related characteristics, for example, disease severity and disease progression. And with that, I will hand over to Dr. Steiner. <clears throat> you need a taller microphone here. Um, so I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today about CTX, and uh, Andrea really laid out um, the background very nicely, so I'll try to avoid uh, the background and get in, into the meat of the subject here, which is really a key disease-specific challenge, namely the ability of the availability of treatment for CTX. And I'm a clinical and, and biochemical geneticist at the University of Wisconsin. And here are my disclosures. So as Andrea alluded to, CDCA is widely accepted as a safe and effective treatment for CTX, even though it is not formally marketed or approved for that use by the Food and Drug Administration. Um, availability of the medication, pricing, and even regulatory approval varies tremendously across countries. The high price of the drug presents challenges to affected individuals, healthcare providers, and countries. The European Medicines Authority has approved CDCA for use in CTX, and I have some more uh, details on that on a subsequent slide. But in the US, FDA marketing approval for CDA, CDCA is for gallstones, a purpose for which it is essentially not used at all, and not CTX. When CDCA is used for CTX in this country, it is used off-label. And availability of CDCA outside of the U.S. and Europe, um, we have found to be difficult to track. So a few details on the use of this medication in Europe. The European Commission granted marketing authorization valid throughout the European Union for CDCA, Sigma Tau, for CTX, uh, in 2017. And subsequently, the product name was changed to CDCA Lediant, um, because of the change in the name of the company uh, also later that year. 
The summary is available on the website, and it's really an interesting read. I'll just summarize briefly here. The EMA, unlike the FDA, recognized that CDC has been used to treat CD CTX for approximately 40 years. You saw Andrea's reference from the New England Journal of Medicine from Jerry, Jerry Salen and Bergener from 1984, although it was not licensed for this use. Due to the rarity of the disease, there are still limited data available on the use of the medicine. Nevertheless, studies have shown the medicine benefits patients and has no significant side effects. The committee decided that the drug's benefits are greater than its risk and recommended that it be approved for use in the EU. So it was authorized under uh, what's called exceptional circumstances, meaning it has not been possible to obtain complete information about CDCA due to the rarity of the disease. Every year, the EMA will review new information that becomes available, and this summary will be updated. Finally, there is a um, need for the company that markets the medicine to set up a registry to mon monitor the benefits and safety. And I would argue it's really not optimal for registries to be completely industry-sponsored. Independent registries are really preferred. So what about the use in the U.S.? I told you that it's off-label use. So the FDA has approved Kenodiol, or CDCA, for patients with radiolucent stones and well-opacifying gallbladders. Again, gallbladders. Again, a use that's not really relevant today. Now, once the FDA approves a drug, healthcare providers generally may prescribe the drug for an unapproved use when they judge that it's medically appropriate for that patient. This unapproved use of an approved drug is called off-label use. And that can mean that the drug is used for a disease or medical condition that is not approved to treat, or it's given in a different way, such as a drug that's approved as a capsule, but it's given instead as an oral solution, or third, that it's given in a different dose than it was approved for. There are challenges with off-label use. So the FDA, um, the 1938 uh, Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act gave FDA the power to regulate promotional materials on medications. And we're not talking here just about advertising. Two of the provisions in that act prohibit most promotion of off-label uses of medications by manufacturers, including that the FDA requires approval before distribution into interstate commerce of all medication labeling. And you can see what that includes here, but I would stress patient education materials. So the um, pharmaceutical company is not allowed to distribute patient ed education materials on off-label use of a medication. The agency also prohibits misbranding of medications, and misbranding includes labeling a medication with misleading information, including off-label uses, so the label can't talk about off-label use. Although pharmaceutical manufacturers are not allowed to promote off-label uses of medications, they are allowed to respond to unsolicited questions from healthcare professionals about off-label use and to distribute publications regarding off-label use. This inability to provide patient education materials is a problem, I would argue, for a poorly recognized condition like CTX for which there is not enough awareness. Now, there are um, clinical trials uh, uh, being carried out to attempt to obtain marketing approval for CDCA, for CTX, in the U.S. And this is just a screenshot from clinicaltrials.gov showing the RESTORE study. The RESTORE study is a study to evaluate patients with CTX, 12 participants, randomized trial. It's a two-cohort study, uh, one cohort for adult patients with a double-blind placebo withdrawal. Now think about that for a minute. You're asking patients with the disease to stop taking a therapy uh, that is, has been used for 40 years and is safe and effective just to show that it works. So more on the research aimed at obtaining marketing approval. Um, defining standardized outcome measures is not straightforward for this condition. Uh, registries really can be very helpful in these rare diseases. The gold standard for marketing approval by the FDA is typically more than one large randomized placebo-controlled trial. That's challenging for a condition like CTX. Before filing an FDA marketing application, a developer must have adequate data from two large controlled clinical trials. Now, I, I told you a little bit about one of the clinical trials that's being carried out, 
And I would ask you to consider the ethics of that trial. So what are the ethics of placebo? And what about pediatric trials? Is it ethical to withdraw the therapy at all in children? And I don't believe that's being done in any of these clinical trials, but it's certainly something uh, that has been discussed. Andrea gave you a lot of great information on CTX biomarkers, um, but we haven't validated any of the biomarkers as endpoints in clinical trials, as a substitute for a direct measure of how a patient feels, functions, or survives. And validating those biomarkers as endpoints for clinical trials would make future clinical trials much easier uh, here and elsewhere. So um, validated mark biomarkers, uh, clinical surrogate markers, such as those mentioned by Andrea you can see here, um, if we were able to validate one or more of those biomarkers, then surrogate endpoints could be used instead of clinical outcomes in some clinical trials. And some surrogate endpoints are a subclass of the biomarkers that Andrea laid out so nicely. Now, the medication, even though it's not marketed for CTX in, in the US, is very expensive. And the price varies throughout the world. So CDCA is widely available in the US, but there may be problems with insurance reimbursement. Imagine the insurance companies uh, seeing the bills for hundreds of thousands of dollars per patient per year. Uh, for an indication that's not even uh, listed in the label for the drug. So I alluded to the price. It's several hundreds of thousands of dollars annually per patients. And patients can pay significant insurance deductibles and out-of-pocket costs to be able to use the medication. Prior authorization is often required and can be a cumbersome process. Now, when the EMA approved CDCA, there was a dramatic increase in the price in the drug in Europe. A CTX patient movement beginning in the Netherlands has worked towards lowering the price of these drugs that have been used for decades and in the past inexpensively obtained. A lower price for the drug was negotiated by the Siena Italy local health agency so that hospitals could obtain and continue to provide CDCA to patients. Uh, more than 100 Italian patients and we hear some Chinese patients as well. An Amsterdam Medical Center pharmacy prepares CDC at lower cost to patients. This is allowed in the Netherlands. It's not allowed in this country generally, as there is no other product available at a reasonable cost. Uh, the Lydian drug, which is available there, is not being reimbursed due to the high price. And the, the pharmaceutical manufacturer was fined in the Netherlands for practices around CDCA pricing. So to finish up here, what can be done to advocate for regulatory approval in the US? In this country, there's active and visible CTX advocacy community that's empowered to partner with other stakeholders in drug development. This is the CTX Alliance, as well as other patient organizations that advocate for CTX, including the ULF and Hunter's Hope. Advocacy partners in this country have taken steps to engage with regulatory bodies. Um, uh, I, I don't need to tell you more about the PFDD meeting that Andrea mentioned uh, that occurred in 2021, which I think was a great success. And this meeting gave patients a voice to speak directly to the regulatory agency about their daily lives living with CTX in the hopes that their stories will impact current drug therapies and their use and drug development in the future. And there are uh, other country-specific advocacy groups as well, that some of which are very active and that unfortunately I don't have time to go into detail about today. So I'll end up with some future questions. What about the use of cholic acid to treat CTX? This is another bile acid that is deficient in the condition, has been used to treat some patients, and is uh, really um, approved for this use. When to begin treatment in infants that are identified by newborn screening? Do we start right away or wait till they have symptoms? Is there hope for a reduced price of the drugs in the future? Is it possible to develop an independent international disease registry, which I think could be very useful? And finally, is it possible to validate biomarkers as surrogate endpoint biomarkers in CTX? So with that, I'll stop and we'll be happy to answer any questions. And I forgot to mention, uh, Jean Pickford, our, a member of the CTX work group, is here today, and I'd like her to uh, uh, come down and uh, help answer questions. <clears throat> yeah. All right. 
if no one else has a question, I actually have a question. And um, the uh, you know, I think the the Dutch system is is an example in many ways, and I know that there are legal uh, barriers to doing that elsewhere. But what prevents patients from? I'm assuming it'd be less expensive for people just to fly to the Netherlands, establish care, get prescribed, take home drug, right? Is that something that's possible, right? Um, yeah, I, I, I probably heard part of it, but uh, I heard something. Uh, well, yes, in the Netherlands we have a law that we can uh, prescribe uh, a sort of uh, local pharmacy-made drugs uh, and uh, give it to any patient worldwide that uh, we declare our patient. And so that's our plan for Venison yeah. White Matter to do that. And uh, I, I think that from uh, our hospital in Amsterdam, the whole of the Netherlands, all CTX patients from the Netherlands get their drug there at a very low price, like something like, uh, I think something like 12,000 euro per patient per year. So, I mean, my point was, at least for some families for whom, who, I mean, I think everybody's in a different place vis-a-vis -vis what they want to fight with with their insurance company. That's obviously $12,000 a year at a flight to Amsterdam is not going to be a solution for everybody, obviously. But it might be a solution for some people. I don't know. I, well, I'm not sure if it's working. Um, well, imagine uh, trying to get insurance, though, to pay for that. So yeah, no, 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 I know. But some insurance. people, yes, but some people might not have insurance reimbursement. Yeah, but as compared to, uh, to uh, what it costs if you uh, buy it from, uh, from uh, the company that's uh, producing it, I think that's a zero extra. Uh, uh, but are, are people having success getting insurance reimbursement for it? Yes. They are. Okay. Yes. Okay. Generally. Generally. About the use of cholic acid rather than CD, CA, is it ever appropriate to do that? Or maybe a new point if people can get it through insurance. So cholic acid is, I think, very appropriate for infants identified with CTX, especially those with liver disease. There it would be maybe even the preferred drug. It's also very relevant for pa young patients who might um, develop some um, elevated transaminases or other evidence of liver dysfunction. Finally, I don't think anyone could argue with a provider for prescribing it for other patients with CTX because it's, it's marketed for that indication, whereas CDCA is not. So you'd be within your rights as a provider to prescribe it. Again, I think it's even more expensive than CDCA, though. So. <laughs> Just stick with what works. <laughs> I'm going to ask one more uh, uh, question for Andrea. So is your is your assay clinically available? Because I'm always sending off cholesterol testing when I'm suspecting CTX, which is not that often, um, maybe less often than I should. But are your assays, which seem more sensitive, clinically available at this point? Or are, you, are there plans? So the lab at RHSE is uh, BS certified. Okay. So the lab at RHSU okay. is CLIA certified and CAP accredited. Um, and if you search the sterile analysis lab at RHSU, okay. um, we have the test requisition forms on our website. Um, and we actually offer a, a number of free to patient uh, testing programs for diagnosis of CTX. So, uh, you know, please feel free to email me. Uh, and if you have eligible patients that you think may have CTX, um, we can perform free uh, biochemical uh, diagnostic confirmation testing. Oftentimes, it's more like I think people should be screening more often than, than they are, not just in classical cases based on the data you performed. So I think you might get a deludge of, deludge of emails, or is, there, is that something that, that can just be done? You, do you, how, I guess, what do you recommend the threshold to be to approach you for that free testing? Um, so I think it's uh, two, um, you know, I can send the information, um, but they have a list of symptoms of CTX. And okay. So if the patient has two or more or abnormal genetic testing, then they're candidates okay. for, the, for the free biochemical testing. And, yep. and we actually offer the panel of all the biomarkers, so not just cholestanol, but all of the other okay. biomarkers too. Great presentation, um, Andrea, Robert. Uh, so uh, my, my question is about patient reported outcome and uh, 
what the patient perspective now with also Julia Pickford coming on, what are the what are, what is the meaningful uh, outcome that patients are looking for beyond access to chemodeoxycholic acid? Because I feel like this community has been so centered on this one, um, you know, access to drug that some of the other, uh, you know, items around coordination problems, psychiatric problems, motor handicap, all of those things have, have sort of um, sometimes not seen the light of day. Uh, so I think I'll let Bob answer this question, uh, you know, but I just want to say that the mission of the CTX Alliance is uh, to search for a cure for CTX. So they don't consider uh, chemodeoxycholic acid a final cure. Um, so I think that says a lot for them from the perspective of the patients, but I'll let Bob answer that. I can start, and, and Jean, you may want to add something, because this is a question that the CTX Alliance uh, board and leadership has taken, begun to take up with our patients and was discussed in the PFDD. So, you know, patients want to be able to walk. They want to be able to have success in school. They want to be able to hold down a job. Um, it's all the typical sort of activities of daily living and success, which CTX can affect virtually every part of that. Um, they just want to have, you know, a quote-unquote normal life, and many of them cannot because they were diagnosed late. The drug can sort of stabilize them, but it's not going to reverse a lot of the problems that already exist. And these patients, many of them have been accumulating these toxic compounds uh, since birth, and, and, and many of them are developing their signs and symptoms as children. All right, well, we'll thank the CTX work group for their contribution. And now I'd like to invite the uh, ADLD group. Hey, lovely dog. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to thank Adeline and the organizers of GRIA for inviting us. Uh, as she says, sometimes the adult onset leukodystrophies are kind of overlooked, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Uh, my name is Kwasar Padiat. Uh, I work at the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, hopefully, I'll be able to give you an introduction and an overview of the heat map uh, and some of the key successes and challenges of ADLD. Uh, I'll be followed by my colleagues, uh, Dr. Riley Reinenko from Uppsala University uh, and Julia Koffler, from, also from the University of Pittsburgh, who will be talking to you about the clinical and radiological presentations and the neuropathology of ADLD. Um, this is our uh, work group membership. As you can see, it has quite an international flavor, and we're really excited that we had two members from the very recently formed patient advocacy group, the ADLD Center, who also joined us. And one of the ambition Singh is actually in the audience here. So it's really great we have that uh, advocacy group going on. OK, so let's talk a little bit about ADLD. Um, as uh, Adeline was mentioning, uh, adult pure, so ADLD is a purely adult onset leukodystrophy. Uh, they are much rarer than the childhood onset leukodystrophies, uh, and ADLD specifically has an adult as an ad, uh, an onset of about the fifth to sixth decade of life. Um, it was first described by Eldridge in 1984 and was diagnosed as a form of primary progressive MS. Uh, unfortunately, it's a fatal disease. It's progressive. Uh, it has a median survival of about 18 years from the onset of, of symptoms. Um, and it's an ultra, ultra rare disease. So we know for sure of about at least 30 families. And these are from all different parts of the world. Uh, although the number of families might be relatively less, the size of the families are usually quite large. Uh, and that's because this disease presents much later in age. Uh, by that time, individuals have already had children. So if you have the mutation, you have a 50% chance of transmitting it to your child. So you have usually large families which have the disease phenotype. Um, what are the symptoms? 
Um, they usually begin with autonomic dysfunction, uh, which present as either bladder, bowel, uh, or erectile dysfunction in men, uh, orthostatic hypotension, heat intolerance, uh, followed by pyramidal symptoms, which include spasticity and weakness, cerebellar symptoms, which include ataxia and intentional tremor. Uh, cognitive deficits have been reported, but these are usually much later, much later in the disease. Uh, both Riley and Julia are going to be talking about the radiological and neuropathological findings, so I'll just give a very brief one-line kind of description. Uh, in the case of uh, ADLD, the MRI is characterized by symmetric T2-weighted hyperintensities in the cerebral white matter uh, and an early involvement of the upper and middle cerebellar peduncles. Uh, the neuropathological findings are characterized by a vacuolar myelin loss with the preservation of oligodendrocytes and abnormal astrocytes. Um, so the majority of ADLD cases are caused by duplications of this gene called lamin B1. A much smaller subset are caused by upstream deletions, and we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a few slides further down. Um, patients with the upstream deletions, many of them lack this earlier dysautonomia, so there's some, some degree of genotype kind of phenotype correlation. Uh, so what are the research challenges and strengths? So I think uh, a major success uh, is, you know, most is that we think we're pretty sure that the disease is caused by overexpression of this particular gene. Uh, we have a mouse model that recapitulates many, but not all of the features. It's not a perfect mouse model. Um, um, and, uh, but unfortunately, some of the mechanisms of demyelination are still unclear. Uh, we do not have good functional outcome measures, and uh, disease burden has not been formally studied. But I think one advantage with ADLD is that patients seem to have a pre pretty stereotypical pattern of disease progression, so that might help uh, kind of the course of action a little easier. Um, there is no therapeutic target engagement, and we do not have response biomarkers, although I think Riley will show that the MRI could be used as a biomarker. Uh, and we do not have clinical trials at this time. Uh, patient advocacy, I think, is a real strength, especially in the last few years, where we've had a patient community come together, and they've actually started this advocacy group, the ADLD Center, and they've started a patient registry. So I think that's going to be really, really important for us uh, as we move forward. Um, some of the clinical challenges and successes. Um, so there's a really robust test for ADLD. It's a, it's a really simple real-time PCR test or an MLPA assay, which can identify the duplication and the deletion. Um, and it's kind of paradoxical, but some of the more advanced and the fancier next-generation sequencing and the exome panels can actually miss this duplication or deletion. And I've had some cases from GeneDx where they could not identify the duplication. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, and, you know, as we've heard, uh, genetic testing can be a barrier for international pa uh, families. Uh, there is no path, nuclear pathway for newborn screening, and we have not yet identified any disease-modifying therapies. Uh, and I think diagnostic awareness will be really important, hopefully at some point of time, when we identify a therapy for the disease. I think the major issue is that because ADLD is such an ultra-rare disease, you have individual patients seen, see, be seen by doctors all over the world. So there is no real standardized care. And I think as we were discussing in the patient group, we thought that having a standardized set of care was really critical for the ADLD community. So I'm hoping that this is something that can grow out of our work group meeting. Um, so let's talk, so this is the heat map, and I was so envious when I saw the previous group's heat map, which is all blue and green. I don't think I've ever seen blue. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, we're not there. Uh, we have a lot of reds and oranges, but I think we do have strengths in the patient advocacy and some of the preclinical disease models and understanding the disease mechanisms for this disease. Um, okay, so let's talk a little bit more about the disease mechanism, which I think is, is uh, or the neuropathology, which I think is kind of one of the successes for ADLD. Okay. So like I said, um, ADLD is not kind of your typical mutation. It's not like a mutation in the gene or a change in amino acid. It's actually caused by what is known as a genomic duplication. So this entire genomic region, which contains the lamin B1 gene, is duplicated and inserted next to the original copy. So it's a tandem, what we call a head-to-tail duplication. So um, patients will have three copies of the gene, and normal individuals will have two copies of the gene. Uh, and we think as a result of this, there's an overexpression of the protein and the RNA, um, and we've tested this in many patient tissues. 
Um, but of course, things are never as simple as it is. So it, it, I, we think that it's a much more complex mechanism which is targeting overexpression. And unfortunately, I don't have time to go into that uh, at this meeting. Um, so every family has a unique duplication. So duplication sizes vary in different families. But if you notice, all of them have duplications which encompass the lamin B1 gene. Um, and the vast majority, and pretty much all of them except for one case, are actually this tandem head-to-tail uh, orientation. Um, <clears throat> once we, we first identified the duplication, and subsequently Alfredo Brusco's group uh, identified a family with a deletion upstream of the lamin B1 gene, and that's shown here, and we've identified three or four more families after that. Uh, in both cases, we think that both the duplication and the upstream deletion result in an overexpression of more amount of this lamin B1 protein, and that's what we think is causing the disease. So what is lamin B1? I've been using that term for a long time. What exactly is lamin B1? So lamin B1 is, is a component of the structure known as the nuclear lamina. If you look at the schematic of the nucleus here, you see this thin pink ribbon-like structure. That is the nuclear lamina. And it's shown in the storm image here. We actually show that lamin B1 is in the outermost layer of the nuclear lamina. So lamin B1 is an intermediate filament protein. Um, and what it does is two dimers wrap around each other and produce these filaments. And these filaments produce a meshwork, which is just underneath the nuclear envelope. And it's thought that this meshwork provides structural integrity to the nucleus. So if you remove that, the nucleus gets all floppy and deformed. But apart from that, it also has very, very important roles in chromatin organization and gene expression, DNA repair and replication. And lamin B1 specifically has been shown to have very, very important roles in cell proliferation, senescence, and aging. So for us, when we first identify the gene, it, it, it was a really fascinating question because you now have a protein that's pretty much expressed in all cells, right? Why, you know, why on God's earth would it specifically cause a demyelination phenotype? There was absolutely no direct connection between this subcellular component and myelin, right? So, um, you know, wh what cell type is affected? Is it oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, neurons? Oligodendrocytes are an obvious kind of culprit because maybe they're the ones that produce myelin, right? But it could also be astrocytes because they signal to oligodendrocytes and maybe that's what's defective. Or maybe all three are involved, so we really don't know. Um, so some of the questions, and of course, why is the phenotype age-dependent? Age why is it that individuals seem to be perfectly normal till they're about 30 or 40, and after that they start exhibiting demyelination? So these are all really fascinating questions, uh, and we've been trying to answer some of them uh, using some of our uh, preclinical mouse models. Uh, so this is a model that we made a few years ago where we introduced the human lamin B1 gene under the control of a PLP promoter. So PLP1 is a gene that's highly expressed in oligodendrocytes. So this promoter targets the expression of lamin B1 specifically to oligodendrocytes. Um, and because it has a flag tag, you can actually distinguish the exogenous and the endogenous lamin B1. So you can see there's probably about twice the amount of lamin B1 as compared to the wild type. Right. Um, so when we made these mice, uh, these mice looked perfectly fine when they were born. Uh, you could not distinguish them from wild type mice. But as they progress, you could see a progressive kind of worsening of the muscle phenotype, and you had significant weakness. And the mice looked really horrible, as you can see, by the age of about a year. Um, and they had significantly reduced uh, survival. Um, these mice showed also showed a very characteristic, the, the, the characteristic vacuolar demyelination. This is in the spinal cord. Uh, this is a myelin stain. Uh, and on EM, you can see a lot of these vacuoles. So uh, to some extent, uh, to a large extent, I think we, we're quite happy with this mouse model because it recapitulates many of the features. Uh, off note, this mouse model does not exhibit any autonomic dysfunction. So I think that's something that's quite interesting, and we don't know uh, exactly why that is. Um, we had done some biochemical as, uh, analysis, or we had done some RNA-seq analysis on these mice, and one of the pathways that popped up uh, was this pathway of cholesterol biosynthesis. Um, and again, I won't go into all the details it's published, and we've done a lot more work after that, but um, one of the pathways we think could be playing a role 
is that you have an increased level of lamin B1, you have decreased expression of these myelin, uh, um, these myelin genes, resulting in a decreased uh, expression of myelin-rich lipids, which lead to a demyelination phenotype and an inflammation phenotype. These seem to kind of play off each other, ultimately leading to the ADLD phenotype. Um, we have some clues about cell type specificity. So we made a similar mouse, uh, kind of a similar mouse, where we overexpressed lamin B1 in astrocytes, but they did not appear to have a demyelination phenotype. Interestingly, those mice do show nuclear abnormalities, but they do not have kind of a uh, demyelination phenotype. So, you know, at least for the mouse model, it suggests that maybe oligodendrocytes are the driver, but, you know, it could also be that there are multiple uh, different roles that, that are played by different cell types. Um, so let's talk about treatment. So I think the one advantage with ADLD is that it's really uh, ideally suited for early therapeutic uh, intervention. And the reason for that is if you have ADLD, it's very, very likely, I, I, at least all the years I've worked with this disease, I've never come across a de novo case. There's always been some family history. So if you have a, uh, if you have ADLD, there's a very large, strong chance that you have one of the, your parents have the disease, have had the disease. And because there's robust genetic testing, you can get tested very early. So you have a huge therapeutic window of nearly 30 or 40 years within which you can start therapy. So I think that's really, really important. Um, and one thing that we are all kind of, I think, agreed upon is that it seems like this overexpression of lamin B1 seems to really be what's causing the disease. So most of our kind of approaches to, for therapy have been in trying to reduce the levels of this particular protein. Um, uh, we, we can do this very easily in vitro. So if you overexpress lamin B1 in vitro, you can get all these really weird-looking nuclei, and if you knock it down, you can rescue that. But what we really wanted to ask is, is reduction of lamin B1 in vivo a viable therapeutic strategy? Right? Because that's a really, really important question. Because if it is not, then you, know, you really don't want to waste your time developing all these different kinds of tools to reduce the level of this protein. Right, so this is a really critical question for us to answer. So what we did was we used uh, the similar mice, but what we then did was made another mouse model where we introduced LOXP sites on either side of the lamin B1 construct. Uh, and the advantage with LOXP sites, uh, so first of all, these mice are very similar to our original transgenic mice. Um, they also express the overexpress to the similar level. They target the overexpression specifically to oligodendrocytes. And these mice also show an age-dependent motor dysfunction and have significantly reduced survival. Um, the advantage with these mice is that you can now cross them to inducible cre mice. And if you inject these bitransgenic mice with tamoxifen, you can actually excise out the overexpression cassette. Right? And we can do that quite well. Um, you can see that when we inject tamoxifen in these mice, this overexpression cassette, which is about 2 kb, is completely cut out. Um, and we can also reduce the overexpression of lamin B1, both at the RNA and protein level, quite significantly. Um, so we thought that these would be, you know, this is a relative, obviously this is not translatable to humans. Unfortunately, humans don't have LOXP sites on either side of the lamin V1 gene. Uh, but you can use this to understand whether removing or reducing lamin B1 levels uh, will be useful. Uh, so we had two treatment paradigms. One was the pretreatment paradigm where we inject tamoxifen before the onset of symptoms, and one is the reversibility paradigm where we inject tamoxifen after the onset of symptoms. Again, these mice have been very, very recently made, so we've just started working on the pretreatment paradigm, but there the uh, kind of results look interesting. And the plan is to use behavioral survival and histopathological assays to see how it affects disease progression. Uh, so this, this experiment helps us, obviously helps answer the important question of whether reducing lamin B1 in vivo can ameliorate the disease, but it also helps us identify a therapeutic window, right? Is it that you have to reduce it before the onset of symptoms, or can you also reduce it after the onset of symptoms? And that's very, very important uh, for patients, right? And also answers a mechanistic question. Do you require this elevated level of lamin B1 to continuously be present for the disease, or if you remove it, can you prevent kind of the disease progression? Um, so we use two paradigms. So this is a rotorot paradigm. And here you can see all these animals are injected with tamoxifen. 
So these are the animals which are the TG flocks, PLP, Cree, ER, where you are excising out the overexpression when you inject with tamoxifen. And these are the animals which are just TG flocks, uh, which do not have a removal of the overexpression. And you can see, so we inject tamoxifen in this case at about three months here. You can see that they start out nearly the same, but uh, it's pretty obvious that the animals which are injected with tamoxifen and have the uh, overexpression removed uh, have a much, much better kind of outcome. So it looks like, uh, 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 you know, at least behaviorally, they look much better. We also perform what we know, what we call a functional observation battery, which is just different phenotypic parameters, uh, you know, like movement and the, the condition of their fur. And you can see that the TG flocks animals become much, much worse over time, whereas there's only a very, very slight deterioration in the animals where we reduce the overexpression. So at least from this work, it seems like, uh, you know, that the pretreatment paradigm seems to be really effective. We're going to try the reversibility paradigm also. So this is kind of at least uh, a, a bit hopeful. So these are just the videos of the mice. So this is, I think these are mice at about nine or 10 months old. So this is a wild type mouse. Um, this is a TG flox mouse. You can see that it barely moves. It's highly ataxic when it moves. Uh, and this is a mouse where we have excised out the uh, overexpression case at about three months. And for all practical purposes, it's kind of indistinguishable from the, uh, from the from the wild type mice. Um, okay, um, so just to kind of recap and kind of summarize the work, um, from the work group, we thought that, uh, and what's really critical is the implementation of some kind of uniform criteria from the diagnosis and disease progression, and that really helps us kind of normalize and standardize work across different clinical centers. Because like I said, we have individual patients all over the world. It's impossible to get everybody in one center. So I think this is really critical. Uh, because this is an adult onset disease and has such a long course of disease, you, it's very tough to do a clinical trial. So it's really critical to identify biomarkers that can serve as surrogates for disease progression and response to therapy. Um, I think we are, we have some promising leads in looking at therapeutic targets, especially for Lamin B1. Um, and uh, we are working with uh, Ionis Pharmaceuticals to develop antisense oligonucleotides uh, to, to downregulate Lamin B1 expression. Uh, we, are also, we have also conducted a large small molecule screen uh, for small molecule compounds that can reduce Lamin B1. We have some really promising targets that we want to now try in vivo. Um, uh, again, Alfredo Brusco's group had done a similar piece of work uh, using FDA compounds, and then they identified alvespimycin, which I think is an HSP-90 inhibitor, but I think they have issues with kind of toxicity there. Uh, we are also looking for RNA AV mediated RNAi therapy uh, and CRISPR genome editing to see if we can downregulate the overexpression. Um, so I will stop there. Um, I just want to acknowledge my lab members. Obviously, this is all before COVID. Uh, Bruce and Guillermo did a lot of the work. Uh, all our collaborators, both at Pitt and Italy and clinicians around the world, are funding sources. A real shout out to the ADLD Center because they've been so supportive uh, in, the last few year, in the last few years. And most importantly, to the ADLD patients and family members, it's a huge, huge thank you. I've known these patients for many, many, many years now, and I think the fact that they have a fatal disease really gives us a lot of urgency to our work. So I'll thank you there, and then hopefully Riley can come and start talking. Thank you. So, hello everybody. I will continue by talking about the radiological and clinical features of ADLD. And uh, I prefer to use that name L LMNB1 related ADLD because there are many other leukodystrophies which also have autosomal dominant heredity. These are the typical MRI images of an ADLD patients with uh, relatively mild symptoms. And is it better now? Okay. Quite large hyperintensities 
in the cerebrum. And hyper intense pyramidal tract, you can see here, here, and here. So it is the whole tract which is sick. And the typical finding is involvement of cerebellar peduncles. There are some few diseases with the same same radiological finding, but they are clinical, clinically totally uh, different. So it is not a differential diagnostic problem. And the most characteristic finding we can see here, around the lateral ventricles, there is a rim in which the white substance is less affected than, thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> less affected as in other parts. And we can see that in T2-weighted images. Always when we talk about MR findings, we must remember that they always are sequence dependent. And two one-weighted images usually are produced with the FLIR or SPINECO or SE sequences. And here we have T2-weighted spinecco image and this typical rim around the ventricles. And that finding we can see in every ADLD patient with that sequence. But if we use flare, we can have the same finding as in the earlier image. But look at this example here. The highest signal intensity is here around the ventricles. So the findings in FLIR Im imaging are varying, and therefore I recommend to use both SPIDECO and FLIR sequences in patients which have ADLD or ADLD has been suspected. We make a study in uh, Swedish patients, they were from two families, and we recruited uh, real patients with symptoms, but also asymptomatic family members. And after genetic tests, we excluded those who did not have LMNB1 duplication. Thereafter, we had 23 subjects, and they all had pathological changes in MR images. And there was four patients, sorry, subjects which were asymptomatic. And this asymptomatic period was almost 10 years even in those, this case. And here it is about 15 years. And then three of them developed a clinical disease, and the fourth one died in the car accident. In those asymptomatic patients, we can see how this disease developed. The first changes were always seen just under motor cortex in the upper part of the pyramidal tracts. Then they spread downwards along the tracts through the internal capsula, cerebral peduncles, the pons, and medulla oblongata. After that, the cerebellar peduncles become hyper intense, as you can see here. And at the same time, cerebral white matter chains is growth. And uh, first involved are frontal and parietal lobes. Then the involvement spreads into occipital lobes, and the temporal lobes are the last affected. We created a, a grading system, grades one to five, to use these uh, findings for comparisons with the uh, with the uh, sim uh, symptoms. We, here we can see examples of two patients, 
The first one had grades one to three, and the other one from grade three to five. And here we can see those grade three changes both in the flare sequence and in the spinnacle sequence. In the left graph, you can see how, how the symptoms develop. This yellow area is the period during which the patient got clinical onset. Then we use the Kurzke's Expanding Disability Status Score EDSS. And what can we see? That disability, of course, starts a little later, and then it, the, the state become worse in the same way than in MRI images. We also examined the spinal cords in 14 subjects. In nine of them, we had a follow-up from two to 10 years. And in the image on the left, you can see a transverse slice at C2 level from a healthy control. And these two images are from, from the patients. If you look at the spinal cord, it is much thinner in patients. And in follow-up studies, we can see that atrophy was progressive. All subjects, even asymptomatic ones, had high signal intensity changes in white, white matter in the spinal cord. Here in the healthy control, the signal intensity is almost homogeneous. But in the patients, we can see white matter as a hyperintensive structure. So, and in one asymptomatic patient, we saw changes locally in, in cervical area, but in all other cases, whole the spinal cord was involved. What successes have we had? It is success that we can get a specific diagnosis using MR uh, findings of the brain, with the, uh, uh, combined with the clinical symptoms and uh, history of autonomic uh, symptoms. And diagnosis can be obtained even in asymptomatic subjects about 10 years before clinical onset. Early spinal cord involvement has also been shown with MRI, and it may explain autonomic symptoms, which usually are the first symptoms, and also a part of motor symptoms like uh, spasticity of the legs. MRI can be used as a biomarker if any therapy will be available, and even, even under therapy development, uh, it can be used even in animals. And challenges. Great majority of the patients have the clinical and radiological findings such as I have shown. But there are some vari variations. There are some patients who doesn't develop uh, automatic symptoms or develop them quite late. There are patients which have no changes in the spinal cord and uh, very mild or no changes in the brainstem or cerebellum. And those variations can be related to the type of the genetic defect. Some of them had duplication, some may have deletion, but we have very few cases, so this is brands in which we need more research. Thank you.
Okay, um, I will wrap up this session by presenting some of the neuropathologic features. I'm a neuropathologist at the University of Pittsburgh, and I had the opportunity to study two autopsy brains of two uh, female siblings that both passed away in their early 60s. And it shows some of the characteristic findings that can also be seen on MRI images, and that is this pretty widespread demyelination in the uh, centrum semiovale with the very disease-specific sparing of the deep periventricular white matter. Uh, both frontal, parietal, and occipital lobes are usually more severely affected than the temporal lobes. On higher uh, power, you can see that these areas of demyelination are somewhat patched in nature, uh, what's sometimes described as this more tigroid pattern. And what you can't see from the images, but what you can see when you actually handle those brains, that these areas of demyelination are very soft, so they don't have these features of sclerosis that you typically see in areas of scarring and demyelination. And uh, as seen on the MRI images, uh, other areas affected are the cerebellar white matter and to a varying degrees, the corticospinal tract, which were actually rather mildly affected in our patients. This relates to the classical findings on uh, microscopy, uh, luxulfast uh, myelin stain, that again shows these uh, areas of severe but patchy demyelination in the upper uh, white matter with relatively sparing of the deep uh, paraventricular white matter region. And again, on higher power, you can see um, uh, this real, really rare fraction of uh, the white matter with uh, occurrences of these uh, vacuoles. Um, it's true, uh, a, a true demyelinating uh, disease in the sense that we do, we, while we do have axonal loss, uh, there's definitely more myelin loss than axon loss. As you can see, there are some naked axons that lo have lost the myelin sheet, but eventually axons appear to die as well. What we don't see is the loss of oligodendrocytes, so it's not a disease of dying of oligodendrocytes. Um, we haven't performed formal quantifications, but uh, at least a uh, visual impression is that there are similar densities in affected and non-affected white matter areas. We do get some uh, microglial activation. You can see here some activated macrophages, but it's not as dense and inflammatory infiltrate as in many other leukodystrophies. But what's most remarkable is that there is an absence of reactive gliosis in these affected white matter region. Again, here on the low power image of a frontal lobe section, you can see a normal complement of astrocytes in the overlying cortex. There's still some astrocytes left in the deep white matter, but the area of uh, demyelination you really have a loss of astrocytes and no reactive uh, gliosis, and that explains the soft uh, consistency that we see on gross examination. And not only do we lose the astrocytes, the ones that are left behind here on the lower panels are highly abnormal in their morphology. They are fragmented, they have abnormal um, morphologies, and you don't see the diffuse gliosis as, for example, here in the upper right corner in a Krabbe disease brain. And even in the areas where on low power you still saw some astrocyte uh, staining, even in those areas the astrocytes have clearly abnormal morphological features. So uh, in order to like uh, dive a little deeper into what's going on in ADLD, we started doing some uh, lamy b one immunohistochemistry. And as uh, Kwasa has mentioned in his introduction, lamy b one definitely uh, decreases as we get older and is actually often used as a senescent cell marker. So you can see here on the top, and these are really just some convenient samples, we have really strong expression in the gray mat of the uh, Krabbe disease brains, but in 80 plus year old Alzheimer's disease brains, um, these are for multiple different cases, we clearly see a loss in nuclear staining intensity. And this is uh, different in our ADLD cases, at least in the cortex, we really see strong maintained uh, LAMI B1 expression, at least until their 60s. Um, we haven't really done a formal study comparing like age appropriate control, so this is something we need to do. But it definitely seems to be some preservation, high expression of uh, LAMI B1. And uh, the LAMI B1 expression, interestingly, is very cell type dependent. So if you use uh, some uh, co-labeling with different cell lineage markers, we can see that they're really the strongest uh, labeling cells are the microglia and macrophages, but you can see in the background here in the affected white matter all the numerous uh, um, 
persistent uh, oligodendrocytes that still have a pretty decent Lamin B1 expression. But when we look specifically at astrocytes, we really are unable to detect any significant nuclear Lamin B1 staining. Um, there seems, um, again, some really um, atypical forms, and none of them really has any uh, residual Lamin B1 expression. So that really um, leaves the question is, uh, is this really the end stage of the disease where Lamin B1 has done regulated? Um, we really don't know, and it's hard to draw causal inclusions from a pathology image, but it definitely raises a lot of questions what's going on with Lamin B1 and what the affected cell type is. And just for a contrast, other diseases do have also decreased astrocyte expression, but it's still persistent. So here in a Crabbe disease brain, all those reactive astrocytes have still persistent Lamin B1 expression, and the same here in our Alzheimer's disease brains. So um, there have been some um, questions raised about the roles of astrocytes in ADLD pathogenesis. So in our human brains, and this has been reported before, there's clearly astrocyte loss. They have, we lack the typical fibrillary gliosis, and we have abnormal astrocyte morphologies, which clearly raises the question if we are in the pathogenesis astrocytes involved. We also see a decrease in Lamy B1 expression. Is this just an indication that they are going, undergoing some premature senescence, or is this something that's really driving the disease? Is something we don't know yet. Uh, next step is to do some senescent markers on these astrocytes to see what phenotype uh, they have. In the mouse, as Corsa has mentioned, uh, if you overexpress Lamy B1 in astrocyte specific models, it does not produce a disease phenotype. So it doesn't seem to be that astrocytes alone would be able to drive the disease process. So possibly it's an interaction between the different glial cell types. Uh, other studies have overexpressed Lamy B1 in astrocytic tumor cell lines, a glio glioblastoma cell, and clearly see some abnormalities there. But the question is if this can be really translated into the more milder expression that we see in our ADLD cases. So to summarize, what we see in ADLD uh, as a neuropathologist is this vacuolar myelin loss in characteristic distribution of the brain affecting the centrum Samuel Wallace, cerebellar white matter, intervaring degree the corticospinal tracts with relative sparing of the periventricular white matter, which is one of the more characteristic features of the disease. Uh, which I haven't shown yet is we really see largely preservation of neuronal cell population. We see preservation of astro uh, oligodendrocytes, but we have this really abnormal uh, astrocyte phenotype. So uh, challenges that we have from a pathologist's perspective of what we can learn from uh, studying human autopsy brains is that there's clearly a role for astrocytes in the disease pathogenesis, but we really don't know where in the causal step uh, these astrocyte pathologies fall into. So are they really driving the disease, or are they sort of like a bystander of the abnormal oligodendrocyte phenotype and some abnormal interactions between astrocytes and oligodendrocytes? Uh, so right now, we are, um, Quasar is uh, planning to do some single-cell RNA sequencing studies using our human autopsy material. We're hoping that it may help us elucidate some of these glial phenotypes. But we also don't know, um, both of our brains uh, came from patients with the standard uh, Lamin B1 duplication. As far as I know, nobody has done any autopsies on a uh, deletion case, so we don't know if we have similar uh, pathology features and as in the standard uh, mutation. And this, uh, um, I'm probably biased as a neuropathology. I think we can learn a lot of human postmodern uh, brain tissue samples for all of our leukodystrophies. But for many of the diseases, there's really a shortage of human autopsy brain samples uh, to study. So if anybody is interested in reaching out, I'm always welcome to increase uh, brain donation or help with brain donation programs. So with that, I would like to wrap up and... If we could have the speakers come, we'll maybe take a couple questions. Um, Hi, great presentation. I have a question regarding the neuropathology and a comment, because I'm a neuropathologist too. And uh, the question is, what do you think is the cause of the patchy myelin involvement? There has been some discussion in the literature that it's uh, related to perivascular uh, preservation. Like in PMD? Um, 
I haven't really seen that consistently in ADLD brains. There's, of course, you always have to take into consideration what I see under the microscope is a two-dimensional picture. I never know where in the 3D plane the next vessel is. So, but it's not a really a very obvious perivascular preservation pattern. Uh, so I really don't have a good answer to your question yet what the pechinature is. That's why I was asking. And then I have a comment. I had the opportunity to examine the brains of the Italian cohort of ADLD patients, including patients with deletions. So I have found exactly what you found in your patients and in also the same pathology in the patients with deletions. With two things, one, that the astrocytes are immature and I suspect that they're unable to make reactive gliosis because they are immature. And this has been confirmed by people in Italy also on iPSCs derived astrocytes. And two, that the patients with deletions often have a, a relative sparing of the infratentorial structures, and there the astrocytes are much more normal. All right. Hi. Um, a question for Quasar. It was a great presentation. I just want to point out, uh, did you see any similar pathology in the mouse in the supratentorial region in the CNS brain? So I have to qualify that the mouse is a pretty artificial system. Mm -hmm. So we use this PLP promoter. Um, and then when we looked at the way the PLP promoter expresses, it seems to express to the highest extent in the spinal cord. Uh, you know, so I didn't show that because I didn't have time. We really saw the maximal demyelination in the spinal cord, and that's why I showed spinal cord for my uh, most of my slides. So, you know, it does not recapitulate perfectly the anatomical distribution of the demyelination. Uh, you know, so I don't think it would make sense to look at those structures. So we looked, the spinal cord really had the major, uh, major amount of demyelination, and then we could see a little bit in the cerebellum, uh, but there was not that much, uh, you know, affecting the cerebral white matter. And I feel that's not really um, a consequence of the pathology per se, but more an artifact of the way the overexpression is distributed. There's much more overexpression in the spinal cord compared to some of the other, other features, other areas. And just a follow-up question, the laminin is very, um, uh, makes a complex with B1, uh, laminin B1, uh, C and A. Um, did you, since you did a transgenic mouse, uh, do you think they're going to make a complex, the human, with the mouse the same way? Um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so I think um, both the human and the mouse laminin, I think, are about 98% identical. And we did confirm, so because the mouse has a, the, the human lamin has a flag tag, we were able to show that they're perfectly co-localized. Um, and, you know, people use human and mouse lamin interchangeably. So I think they would uh, interact in a very, very similar fashion. Thank you. Can I? Oh, go ahead. Sure. As a pathologist, have you... Um, seen uh, excellent neurological signs of involvement, particularly in the brain cord. Um, both of our cases were restricted to the brain and spinal cord, the autopsy, so we haven't had the opportunity to do any other organ examinations. Um, if I can ask a question, it sounds like your um, group has made such, and your disease group has made such significant progress in understanding the pathophysiology and, um, and thinking about potential therapeutic strategies through down regulation. From the perspective of clinical trial readiness, um, have you thought about sort of potential outcome measures that, you know, beyond MRI biomarkers, that would be um, things that you would sort of start getting ready in parallel um, so that once your, your trial options are ready, you have a, a, a ready trial design? So I think you know, that's absolutely true, and we have not thought about that. And I think having this work group come together I think that's one of the major gaps that we discussed, and I think that's something that we should definitely be addressing. And I think in terms of biomarkers, I think MRI is definitely one of them, but we're also looking at other biochemical markers yeah. uh, as surrogates. So that's something that we are looking at. Okay. Thank you. Um, so based on the senescence thing, that's what I was like, I've heard of this gene before. Um, so, so can you guys comment on the senescence? And also, I know it's an ultra rare disease, but is there anything known about pre, uh, cancer predisposition in this population? So, 
this in essence. It's really fascinating. So um, in the last few years, the down-regulation of lamin B1 expression is one of the most robust markers for senescent cells. Right? So we know that if, you, if cells undergo senescence, they do have a down-regulation of lamin B1. Whether that drives senescence or not is a very different question, and I think there is no clear answer to that. And again, I did not have some, I didn't have time to show a lot of the other data, um, but we do have some really interesting data. So I'd shown that down, lipid down regulation is one of the pathways. And if you actually look at senescent cells, one of the pathways that's a critical part of senescence changes is a down regulation of lipid biosynthesis. So it, we think what's happening is that the upregulation of lamin B1 is somehow triggering senescence associated pathways, even in cells like oligodendrocytes, which are terminally differentiated, right? And they're, they're not really going to proliferate anymore. Uh, so that's the first part. And um, there have been reports of, uh, Lamin, so again, uh, of lamin B1 changes in cancers. I don't think any of, I think I don't, we've not come across any patient that, any history that suggests that these patients have any difference in their predisposition to cancers. Uh, but I think some pancreatic cancers supposedly have shown increase in lamin B1 levels. Um, but I do want to caution that lamin levels are so very sensitive to cell type that if you take a bulk of cells, you really don't know what kind of cell types there are, and different cell types have very, very different levels. And it's also uniquely sensitive to things like the uh, the density of growth and the rate of proliferation. So I would be very cautious about making a direct correlation between lambda levels and other diseases. All right. And on that note, we're going to take a brief break. I'm going to ask everybody to be back here at um, 2.55. Um, please, so we can try to stay close to our intended time and, uh, and to hear our last two talks about um, ALSP um, and uh, uh, Refson's disease. Thank you very much.
we're going to talk fast and talk about it. Okay. So do you want me to just uh, show the picture yeah, of the I'll laptop? I'll and say what it oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, we're going to get restarted. Nico, Nico, can you go and let people know we're starting, please? Thank you. All right, it is my pleasure now to introduce our last session. Um, and we're going to go out with a bang because I'm super excited about the accomplishments of both of these groups and the meaningful progress towards um, planned therapies. And, um, and to meaningful clinical trial readiness. So I'd like to first introduce the um, ALSP work group um, and Jennifer Orthman Murphy. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm Jen Orthman. I'm here at Penn. I'm an adult neurologist and I found this disorder in my clinic and so we have to do, there's a lot to do for it and I'm Thank, thankful that GLIA CTN has included it today so that we can see where we are in the context of all of this other amazing work that has been presented. And so today I'm just going to introduce you to ALSP. Um, we're going to hear about uh, the treatment that has been tried so far as well as establishing preclinical models and then um, hopefully have some time for questions. And as you can see, we had a very enthusiastic response to getting our work group together. We have basic scientists, clinicians, experts in translational work, and experts in microglia and CSF1R. And it's really uh, motivating to go forward to realize how many people are interested in this disorder. And so ALSP is adult onset leukoencephalopathy with axonal spheroids and pigmented glia. It's, and we're going to define it here as an autosomal dominant disorder due to mutations in CSF1R. We, th that designation started about 11 years ago now, um, where prior to this, this was a diagnosis at autopsy or on pathology, shown here with the classic signs of myelin loss, axonal spheroids, kind of uh, some macrophages, but also loss of microglia, uh, bizarre looking astrocytes, maybe not as bizarre as the ones we just saw, but bizarre all the same. And it sort of brought together these three different pathological descriptions, PoLD, HDLS, and ALSP shown here, and became the first microgliopathy that was inherited. And so uh, we know that uh, most of the patients, uh, certainly when they have uh, presenting signs and symptoms, have a leukoencephalopathy with one uh, uh, example shown here, probably end stage at this point. And what can also be found on MRI, but not in all patients as far as we know, are areas of chronic diffusion restriction, and on head CT you could see areas of calcification. Individuals present in the fourth or fifth decade of life, typically, although we don't really know the full range of onset of presentation. And the it is clinically heterogeneous. It can present with a motor phenotype, extrapyramidal symptoms, seizures, and neurobehavioral phenotypes. So in the adult world, that means you can end up in the MS clinic, the dementia clinic, or the Parkinson's clinic. And so it can even be variable within the family, and we think with possibly incomplete penetrance. Just as we were discussing in our work group, we don't actually know the full range of how this will present. It can be rapidly progressive. And the uh, previous description of this was that, that people typically died four to six years after diagnosis, and that may be the end stage version. We don't know if that's true for everyone. So I think this is at least a two compartment disorder. Um, I'm showing here the blood versus the brain. And that's because in the blood, you have innate immune cells as well as adaptive immune cells. And in the brain, you have microglia, which are the innate immune cells of the brain. They arise in the blood and the brain from different sources. Microglia come from the yolk sac during the embryonic period, and they self-renew over life. And the innate cells in the blood that circulate come from the bone marrow and are renewed from the bone marrow. But these are the monocyte lineage are the ones that express CSF1R. And CSF1R canonically, uh, uh, activation of CSF1R ac uh, canonically activates uh, 
pathways for proliferation and survival of these cells. But in the brain, as you have heard in many other presentations, we're also dealing with a few other cell types. We've got the pre oligoprecursors, oligodendrocytes, myelinating axons, astrocytes. And what happens in the brains of people with ALSP? So we don't know the order of things. We know in the most affected areas that there's loss of microglia, that there's loss of oligodendrocytes and myelin, that you develop axonal spheroids, that astrocytes become reactive. And it's not really clear that the blood-brain barrier breaks down, but there might be an invasion of immune cells, particularly in those areas of diffusion restriction in the brain, although that has yet to be defined. And unlike in diseases that I'm more familiar with, like MS, it's not an invasion of B and T cells, but perhaps it's macrophages that are causing all sorts of problems. So here we're going to talk about uh, the challenges and successes we have so far for ALSP. And one of the major successes is the Sisters Hope Foundation, founded by Heidi Edwards, who's here. She can wave. But uh, So this is a new foundation to support this community worldwide. And Heidi has done an incredible job of making contact with industry partners, as well as uh, patients and families throughout the world, and is working to establish a patient-driven registry. We know from uh, many of the experts that have been involved, that are involved in our work group, uh, as well as uh, groups throughout the world, that the mutations dis tend, tend to be in the tyrosine kinase domain, which should disrupt signaling. But how this links with microglia survival, proliferation, dysfunction, and the rest of the damage that happens in the brain is entirely unknown. However, we do have several preclinical models that Josh Minkowski is going to tell us about to see if they can help us answer some of the questions about it. And another thing that we discussed that is not clear is whether autosomal dominant CSF1R mutations, uh, having that predicts the disease course on its own or, or whether it's a susceptibility locus. And you need some other hit like an environmental trigger or a genetic modifier, so those are some of the examples, uh, to make this adult onset. So to answer some of these questions, we need a natural history study. And there is one ongoing that's supported by VIGIL that will be limited, but is an incredible start for our community to have this going already. And I'm very grateful to Glia CTN for funding my pilot to also uh, develop a natural history study that should be ongoing and collaborative. Um, as well as develop uh, peripheral biomarkers, or uh, really characterize uh, the peripheral blood mononuclear cells in this disorder. And one of the other things we discussed, because their CSF1R and microglia are kind of a hot topic right now, that with many emerging therapies as potential for this disorder, that we really need an industry advisory council to help navigate multiple potential treatments for this rare disorder. So some uh, other successes is that we're going to have an ICD-10 code for ALSP, so that's cool. Thank you, Josh. Um, the, again, as we discussed, the population targeted in this session is adults with autosomal dominant CSF1R pathogenic mutations, defined by genetic testing as pathogenic. But it's actually a confusing nomenclature for this disorder, because as you'll see, because I kept the original slide sent to me, we're all calling it something different. Um, and as, if we call it CSF1R-related leukoencephalopathy, are we including BANDOS in that designation? These are sort of uh, unresolved uh, things, but also very rare. In the adult world, as I mentioned, you might show up in any number of specialty clinics. And I can tell you that genetic testing is not universally available. Um, and I, I think what would be most likely to be available is panel testing. And even looking on the clinically available uh, genetic panels that could be sent, CSF1R is not on all of the leukodystrophy, dementia, and Parkinsonism panels that could be sent from different companies. So it's something that through advocacy, hopefully, we can do. But perhaps whole exome and whole genome are, are the better way to go. And then a major unmet need for the community is that we have no disease-specific management and treatment guidelines for symptomatic care. But people at many centers throughout the world have experience treating this disorder, so we need to get together and at least provide a framework to go from. And so uh, we don't have any approved disease-modifying therapies, but because bone marrow transplantation has been tried, Dr. Lund will be telling us some about his experience and what we think it might be helpful for. 
And so as you can see on our heat map, we have a lot of red and orange. So really, you know, this is my own personal experience, the first time of making a heat map. So a learning experience and kind of seeing in context um, the, for the other disorders and uh, how much time and effort and the community effort and collaboration that you put in. I hope the next time that we present, we'll have changed some of these colors. Okay, so I'll, with that, I'll go to Dr. Lund. All right, thank you. So uh, given the rarity of this disease and the use of transplantation as an intervention, I'm just going to uh, talk about the clinical scenarios, two slides for each patient, and then let you draw your own conclusions. So transplant, so this is uh, one of our earlier transplants, a 44-year-old female presenting with memory problems, disinhibition, early onset dementia. Uh, exam shows some intermittent tongue and lip movements resembling tics. Her mutation is given. The MRI showed confluent frontal predominant white matter T2 hyperdensities. And she had a history of DVTs and was het for factor V Leiden and uh, other clotting uh, genes. Her transplant was a 12 out of 12 unrelated marrow uh, donor. Her transplant-related morbidity mortality uh, was mild GIGVH, some cystitis. She went to a transitional care unit for aggressive rehab and nutrition. Uh, she's a patient where, upon receiving GCSF, which is going to like colony stimulating factor, she would get very agitated. And at that time, we were wondering if that had something to do with her disease, which is a problem in CSF1R. Um, typically, GCSF binds to CSF3R. It's a different receptor, but where I was wondering if there was some overlap. Uh, but uh, she's the only person we noted this for. 27 months, uh, she had, uh, after transplant, worsening cognitive deficits uh, without motor sensory problems. Her score was 1138 on the STMS. Um, radiologic assessment showed stabilization of her MRI score, uh, but uh, white matter subscores with incremental worsening of atrophy subscores. And this is true of most all the patients. Uh, there were some improvements in behavior. She made good recovery, PTOT, and she was said to have a good quality of life on follow-up. And I tried to pull some of the MRIs with the salient uh, photos in some of these patients. So you can see the pre-transplant ones on top, uh, and then three years post-transplant on the bottom, indicating some interval uh, progression uh, and volume loss, but not at every level. Transplant 2, 46-year-old female, rapidly progressive gait deterioration over four months. She lost her job. Mutation is noted. Sure exam showed hyperflexia, Parkinsonian, uh, Parkinsonism, uh, gait impairment. Neuropsych eval shows impairment uh, of visually immediate processing, executive functioning, cognitive speed, nonverbal alerting, psychomotor speed. Her transplant was a matched sibling donor. Uh, her neuropsych eval at four months post-transplant showed declines in some aspects of attention, function, processing speed, with some improvements in verbally mediated tasks, including naming and fluency. At nine months, this is more or less, on her neurologic exam was unchanged from pre-transplant, and she successfully resumed her role managing the family's finances. At two years post-transplant, uh, she was noted to be walking one to two miles a day, dressing herself, and making breakfast. And I found her MRIs as well from the pre-transplant and the two-year post-transplant MRIs. Uh, overall, she seemed to be one of the better responding of our patients uh, with uh, minimal progression uh, noted here. Third transplant's 44-year-old female, progressive personality changes. She uh, lost her job. Um, and uh, this is also associated with, associated with memory decline. Uh, she uh, uh, preservated on things, spelling difficulties, falls. Uh, she had an MRI at one point. Her mutation is noted. Uh, also noted to be losing objects, having difficulty clothing herself. Uh, she scored 27 out of 38 on the STMS. She's a matched SIB donor. Uh, our transplant uh, morbidity, mortality was GVHD, the gut, acute kidney uh, problems, strep mitis of the Blood. She then had a, uh, an arrest, pulseless uh, electrical activity. She's resuscitated and extubated, but quickly deteriorated from a neurologic standpoint. 
81 days post-transplant, her MRI score was 25. She did not have any evidence of stroke or severe hypoxic injury, but given her substantial neurologic deterioration, uh, deterioration her family decided to transition to comfort care, and she died uh, post-transplant day 88. So clearly unsuccessful here. Uh, fourth transplant was a 41-year-old female, uh, one to two years of lower leg weakness, some memory problems, losing track of conversations. During my interview, his wife was filling in most of the uh, questions and gaps in his memory. He also had one to two years of depression, anxiety. He was easily losing his temper. Uh, you can see there are a lot of common themes here in the, in the presentations of these patients. He had uh, T2 signal changes on MRI and a frontal temporal lobe. His CSF1R uh, mutation as noted here. And his transplant was an 8 of 8 unrelated donor, 100% engrafted. His complications included pseudomonas pneumonia, uh, burkholderia, uh, sinusitis, some weight loss actually requiring a, a G-tube, um, which is not terribly common in adults. He also possibly had uh, idiopathic pneumonia syndrome, which he's gotten through. Um, but unfortunately, he's had a pretty severe progressive dementia. He's very weak, but gaining more mobility, um, but does live in a, in a care facility and receives almost full-time cares. Uh, I was able to get his MRIs uh, pre-transplant above 10 months post as below. And again, uh, you can see evidence uh, of some progression uh, and, a, and, a, and a lot of volume loss in his MRI as well. Though I've what I've learned from some of these patients is that their MRIs don't necessarily predict uh, where they're losing and gaining ground in terms of function. So they're kind of all over the place. And so that's, I think, the last uh, slide on, the, on this patient cohort. And so the conclusions are transplant does something to this disease, but I have no idea what it's doing to this disease. Um, the risk of transplant in this population is different than the risk of boys with, AL, in, with ALD, and that's because these are adult patients with a lot more life exposure. We can go into what those risk factors look like. Um, and also mobility. Having a poor mobility is a, clearly a risk factor after transplant when you're an adult uh, for a variety of reasons. If you're in a wheelchair going into transplant, your outcome is not as good as if you have full mobility. Um, progression after transplant can be terrible uh, and often requires full-time and often permanent care. And when you're a little kid, it's not so bad because you have your parents around, but when you're an adult, you need to have somebody around to take care of you. And sometimes it's a wife or sometimes it's a parent still, uh, but you're taking care of this patient then probably for the rest of his or her life. So it's a big decision, and if it, if it doesn't go well, uh, it, it can be awful. Transplant performed too late is problematic. Uh, and so now I'm of the opinion that we need to be doing these transplants earlier because we're going to see better outcomes on all aspects of the disease. And now we'll hear from Josh. Thanks, Troy. Thanks uh, for the chance to talk. Um, I have two uh, caveats to announce. The first is that um, the ICD-10 code is not yet uh, approved, so we don't know for sure that's going to happen, but there is still an open comment period for, uh, we've asked for about 10 codes, ICD-10 codes to be um, approved, and so if you'd like to, uh, family organizations, please uh, get your vote into the CDC and you can contact me for instructions on how to do that. So that's caveat number one. Caveat number two is um, if I uh, say anything incorrectly or overlook anyone's work, it's through either incompetence or, and or ignorance, so I apologize in, in advance. So uh, I'm going to talk today about uh, MARS for uh, CRL, or CSF1-related leukoencephalopathy. I'm uh, Josh Vonkowski. So uh, just some disclosures, nothing related to uh, what I'm talking about today. And so uh, what we're talking about is um, you know, the, a bunch of different names, um, as Jennifer mentioned, and really we're focusing on uh, uh, modeling the leukoencephalopathy related to CSF1R-related uh, autosomal dominant mutations. So uh, if you haven't read this book to your children, I highly recommend it. It's about a fish stealing a hat, and so that's the um, concept of like a hat. What is a hat? So uh, this, uh, if, if you uh, don't read French or can't speak it, which I can't, uh, this says this is not a hat, and so, but it is a hat, right? So it's a picture of a hat. So when we think about models, um, uh, different kinds of models have different elements of reality, 
And so um, as we think about using models, we need to think about um, does the model that we use uh, capture an element of the disease or the, of the reality that we want to, that's important for the, for the process. And so I think the next few slides, I'll be kind of talking about general concepts in how we uh, use models. So really there's several goals of a model. One is that it helps us gain insight into disease pathophysiology. So as you've heard, uh, with um, CRL or ALSP, we have um, understandings of some of, the path of some of the pathology, but really what's kind, of, what's kind of driving the pathophysiology is poorly understood and is limiting our ability to, um, to, to treat uh, individuals. Um, another uh, uh, help, helpful thing with a model is that you can look at um, new disease variants. So, so something we're running into uh, in some of the um, other fields is that when a new genetic variant is, is identified, is it a disease cause or is it benign? And so that's um, something that we'd like to be able to do with a model. And then finally, uh, you know, as you know, really kind of an ultimate goal is how do we take care of people? How do we take care of patients? And so can we use the model to help um, identify or screen for therapeutics? And that'd be also a very helpful thing in a model. So if you think about the pipeline to a drug, um, uh, there it's, it tends to be very long and uh, very expensive, and so it can easily go on for more than a decade. As we know uh, from past you know, examples, there's often uh, places where the pipeline you know, fails, and so you don't, uh, it breaks apart. And so really, how can you, um, you know, increase the throughput of a pipeline, and how can you improve the chances of success? And that's something that we really hope that an ideal model will do. So what do you need to be to have a successful model? So the first thing is you have to understand the disease well enough to know what you're looking at. So for example, if you have the wrong genetic mutation or you have the wrong gene, like that's not a good model. Um, so like a problem in the, uh, uh, so I don't want to, but the, a problem in the multiple sclerosis field is it's been difficult to have a good uh, animal model. And so these kind of made up models uh, have been difficult for modeling the disease well. Um, a second aspect is that the disease in humans has to be well enough understood that you know what you're looking for in your, uh, in your model. And so you have to know what's going on clinically. So for example, uh, you know, what are, are there motor phenotypes? Are there um, um, neurocognitive phenotypes? Uh, you have to understand the molecular phenotypes because you want your model, you need some sort of molecular readout. So for example, are you looking at what happens to um, signaling of the CSF, uh, CSF1R cascade? Uh, what, are, what are changes in protein or RNA levels, and you really need that from the patient so that you can say, oh yeah, my, my animal model or my uh, cellular model uh, captures these same elements. And then you also have to know what's, a, what's kind of like a primary effect versus a secondary effect. So for example, um, if you see someone who can't very, walk very well, um, you know, is it because uh, you might say, oh, the phenotype's because they, um, uh, have hurt their thumb, but maybe it's because they're missing a leg, right? So you have to know like what's really driving the ph the phenotype of disease, and what's what's kind of a, a bystander effect versus uh, truly d uh, driving disease pathophysiology. Um, in general, uh, for uh, one limitation that we've seen is that um, often like mice seem to be very resistant to our attempts to use them for modeling, and so. Uh, you know, so sometimes we're like putting in several mutations in one mouse to uh, get a disease phenotype, and that always raises questions about validity. Really, you're hoping that with one one gene, uh, one the same human disease variant, that you get the same kind of phenotype for measuring. And that's not always the case, but that'd be kind of an ideal situation. And then you want to make sure that your model recapitulate, recapitulates disease aspects. So are you able to see some sort of molecular signatures that are the same as in the di human disease? Um, are there neurologic or physical changes in your model? So for example, if the humans uh, develop spasticity, does your animal model have some sort of a signature for spasticity or seizures, for example? Um, are there changes in function or behavior that you can measure? Um, so for example, like a, with a mouse, like can you do something with a rotor rod that kind of uh, corresponds to human loss of ambulation? And are there changes either on uh, anatomy or on the CNS uh, pathophysiology that you also see in your animal model? So there's various different kinds of models, and so I've tried to create this kind of artificial uh, scoring system. And so, for example, um, in silico or big data approaches, you know, you, they're very, uh, they're relatively easy to do. The cost is low because you're kind of data mining or, or playing around in the computer. The throughput's super high. Uh, on the other hand, 
the questions are like, you know, can you take something that you discover in silico and translate it to humans? You probably need to do some other validation to make sure that's true. And the same thing for translatability. You're not going to take something you find um, in silico or just from prediction and go straight to a clinical trial. Similarly, in vitro, so cellular models, um, you know, they're relatively easy. The cost is lower. The throughput is higher. But the same problems with kind of going into humans, you're going to want some intermediate steps before you take into humans. Um, Cell-based models, um, so things like organoids, um, the ease and the cost and throughput is a little bit lower, but then we're hopefully the translatability, translatability is higher. Then finally, animal models, we'd like to believe that they, um, they, they are more difficult, there's higher cost, it's more difficult to make the model, but in the end, we hope that from an animal model, for particularly mouse or like if you're testing something in primates, that you can go right into a clinical trial. So then if we look at animal models, kind of same thing here. There's a wide range of different animal models, and they all have uh, pros and cons. So there are still, uh, so there are invertebrate models, like, for example, Drosophila. Lots of people are using Drosophila for screening. Again, you know, very easy, relatively easy to use, um, very low cost. Uh, generation time is short, so you can, like, uh, crank through experiments. But then, of course, uh, people are like, well, it's a fruit fly. Like, <laughs> are you going to use that for your clinical trial? Um, so that you're going to have to have a, some sort of mammalian step. Uh, zebrafish, um, relatively, um, they're not as easy as Drosophila. The cost is kind of medium. Generation time is not that fast unless you're doing something kind of in the earliest stages of, of development. Um, and uh, the validity and translatability is better than invertebrates, but uh, most regulator, regulatory agencies and stuff want some sort of a mammalian validation uh, before you go into a clinical trial. I'll talk, uh, maybe I'll just mention now that uh, some, some ways around that are that if you find something in zebrafish, you can then test it in a, like an organoid model or some sort of mammalian model to prove some sort of efficacy in a, in a, a human-based system. And the second thing is you can also, if you find something again in zebrafish, if you um, pr show loss, uh, absence of toxicity just in a wild-type mouse model, again, that's something that um, the FDA is looking uh, favorably on. Uh, the mouse model has been kind of the standard in the field for many, uh, probably decades now. Um, as we know, uh, ease is kind of medium, cost is higher, um, generation time is also slower, uh, throughput, you can't really use mice for screening, it's very difficult to do so, but then there's kind of a, it's been a, a gold standard for moving into clinical trials, but as we've all experienced, um, you know, uh, mice are like super, <laughs> seems to, it's like a super powerful animal, like they uh, are resistant to everything we throw at them, and uh, seem not to develop much disease. As we've also heard, sometimes people move into rat and like, get success from the rat model. So for example, the Alexander disease model seemed really, seemed that's pretty cool that the Alexander disease uh, rat model had the great phenotype. But of course, uh, we're not hearing about the times when the rats failed. So is it just kind of an ascertainment bias where we're not hearing about the examples of, rat, of the rat model failing? Uh, primates, you know, uh, you can't really do uh, screening or development in primates, but they're often a step before you go into a human trial. So uh, just to point out that if you look across species, that really you want to make sure that the gene that you're studying or the processes that you're studying are conserved genetically in the model system you're using. And so each, as we mentioned, each animal model system has different pros and cons. And so uh, I don't know if I have a laser pointer or something, but um, the middle group of genes of the 10,000 genes, those genes are shared across species. So obviously, you want to make sure that if you're um, doing something in mouse or zebrafish, that it's in that middle group that's also shared with a human for that disease, whereas there's some certain genes that are much more divergent. And so that'd be a bad choice to try and create a model and a divergent uh, gene that's too far apart kind of evolutionarily uh, to make sense. So there are, um, although um, there's big advantages to doing uh, large data or cellular-based uh, screening, um, there are also major advantages to uh, modeling in whole animals. So uh, drugs aren't, um, don't work in isolation, and so understanding a drug's effect not just, for example, on the brain or the white matter, but understanding how, you know, what, what does it do to liver, what does it do to limb growth, um, that's really a, powerful, a power of a whole animal system. Um, some of those um, things like zebrafish or invertebrates do have rapid development, and so you can do things in a relatively short uh, time period, you know, in the order of weeks, uh, to look for phenotypes. Um, these animal models have lots of genetic tools. You can do lots of um, clever things with manipulation to understand pathways. 
Um, there's really cool imaging tools for all these animals. And then um, you can do, for some of these models, you can do relatively high throughput, high throughput screening. Even if you don't get a, a, a drug that's going to provide a cure, it can give you insight into pathways that then could lead to a, a treatment. So if you think about, um, this is a study about five or ten years ago, looking at the new drug categories that have been dis discovered over the past uh, decades, uh, a majority of them have come from phenotype-based screening, uh, so really suggesting that this, this is a good way to look for new drugs. And this is just uh, just to kind of highlight the, that these automated screening platforms do exist. This is a zebrafish high throughput screening platform. So it's basically a uh, computer-based uh, computer tracking system. Uh, you put the zebrafish into a, a tray the size of basically an um, iPhone, and the computer can track um, different elements of motor movement, or they can also track other um, aspects of... Um, of like fluorescence or something like that. So you can do relatively high throughput screening for like a, a large drug screen uh, in things like zebrafish or drosophila. So uh, just the caveats for any model is that each model requires validation. So just because you've created the same mutation in your animal model of choice doesn't mean that it's valid. You need to do something to show that it has the same kind of signatures molecularly or that you have some sort of like genetic rescue with the human disease gene. Um, as we've proven again and again, some diseases don't work very well in certain models. For example, the ALD mice, again, seem quite, uh, you know, quite healthy. Uh, we tried to create an MLD model in zebrafish, and when, uh, those, my, those zebrafish are great, so no problems. Um, the, uh, if you're trying to just, uh, look at a, um, an age-related phenotype, that also impacts your model. So, for example, much of the advantage of zebrafish is that they have fast development early on, but as, then as they get bigger, then you have to hold, uh, keep them in bigger tanks. And so looking at something that's chronic neurodegeneration in a, a zebrafish, uh, you lose the power of working in that system. And then just, you know, science is hard, things don't work, uh, it takes time, so all the standard caveats. So if we look at CRL, there's lots of different features that we can choose for modeling. So, um, so really you should be thinking about having, uh, trying to create a uh, human uh, variant in the CSF1R gene. Um, there's lots of different elements of the uh, CS, uh, CNS uh, neuropathology that uh, you could look at, so ranging from effects on the white matter, um, loss of neurons and axons, the abnormal astrocytes, the uh, microglia phenotype, the astrogliosis. There's a leaky blood-brain phenotype that's been reported, so those are all like things that you could look for in your model. Um, with the neurologic features, if, you, uh, if your animal has a behavior you can screen for, you can look at those elements of like motor function. Uh, there are other systems uh, affected by CSFR1 related mutations, and so you know, you'd know like to see, our, is there also, also bone involvement? Is there involvement of the optic nerves? Um, these are all things in the model that you could look for. So uh, there's also molecular signatures, and um, uh, you know, do you, does your model have increased uh, GFAP expression? Uh, our favorite uh, marker, neurofilament light, is there uh, increased neurofilament light expression? Um, the, um, there's a pro-inflammatory state in, in the CRLs, and so do you see that in your model? Um, is there microglia loss? Are there exchanges in the RNA and protein um, patterns that kind of model the human disease? So really, uh, just to get right down to it, there's really only uh, kind of two models that I think kind of fit the criteria that we've talked about. So in the mouse, there's been a, a wide range of different um, CSF1R mutations made. So lots of, uh, so several like uh, knockout, um, CSF1R knockouts. Um, really, I think this paper in 2022 was the one that uh, did the best job of trying to recreate a, a CRL model. Um, it's a human gene variant. Um, disappointingly, they did get, uh, I mean, the good side, they got microglia uh, depletion, but basically everything else about that mouse was good. Uh, I mean, you know, the mice are fine, once again. Um, it, when they, uh, if in the, if that's in the heterozygous state, the homozygous mice had a phenotype and did die, but that doesn't really uh, recapitulate the human disease, which is autosomal dominant. So the, so the advantage of the mouse is that you have a, a, a variant that has a loss of microglia, but not much else that you can use uh, kind of um, for the disease. So, it, so it's the mice, again, are quite healthy. Um, this same year, um, the group uh, uh, Berdowski et al. also made a, a human disease gene mutation in zebrafish. They do see microglia depletion. They see uh, abnormal astrocytes and loss of myelin. They also report abnormal behavior, but um, that abnormal behavior is only seen in the homozygotes. So again, 
in terms of a screening tool, which is really like one of the major powers of zebrafish, it's not that great. So these are some of the images from the two papers, the mouse on the left and the zebrafish data on the right. So on the left is the um, microglial loss um, in the mouse model. So you can see there is significant loss of microglia, so that's great. So that um, suggests that the same pathways are, are, are uh, uh, affected in the mutant. But um, so hopefully there's the same kind of molecular signatures in the mouse model. The zebrafish also has loss of microglia. They looked both at the heterozygotes and homozygotes. And so that's shown in the panels labeled E and G, the loss of uh, microglia. Uh, on the right, they also do show loss of um, oligodendrocytes. In the final, the right-hand bottom panel shows the motor behavior. And the motor behavior in the heterozygotes is not affected, where it is affected in the homozygotes, but again, that's not really recapitulating the human disease phenotype. So um, just uh, there are, uh, you know, so you're, you're excited one day, they're like, oh, great, zebrafish. Um, there's still um, problems with using zebrafish because it's in a, you know, fish non-mammalian system, and so there's both, uh, there's NIH regulatory agency kind of thoughts about can you take something in zebrafish and take it into uh, clinical trials. Um, there still needs to be a mammalian or human-based cell um, step to kind of um, make sure that what you have has you know, efficacy in a mammalian system and that you can figure out dosing because zebrafish dosing is kind of made up. Um, so those are some of the caveats with zebrafish. So basically, uh, I mean, no surprise, as we've heard, modeling leukodystrophies is no walk in the park. Um, any model you choose has various pros and cons, and you're just trying to find the best model to fit the question that you're asking. Um, with CRL, we, there's very specific things that we should be looking for, but our current CRL models are not that great. Um, it looks like with the mouse that there is a microglial phenotype, and presumably the, some of the biochemical and molecular features are conserved. Um, the zebrafish model seems to have a stronger phenotype, but because it doesn't have a motor phenotype, makes it less useful for screening. Um, so I think it has the best phenocopy match, but um, I think there's opportunities to make better models, for sure. And that ends uh, what I was going to talk about. Jennifer, I think you had a couple things to say. I just wanted to say some of us met this morning to help participate in the first 5K for Sisters Hope Foundation. This is here on Penn's campus. And time for questions. Josh, I had a question for you. So any idea why the zebrafish seems to be a better phenocopy for the human disease as opposed to the mouse? Usually you would think it the other way around. Um, is it that, you know, maybe is the gene not duplicated in zebrafish or any ideas or thoughts on that? Um, so I think um, we've tried to make about um, six different zebrafish disease, six different zebrafish leukodystrophy disease models and our hit rate's been about uh, 40 to 50 percent. Sometimes they uh, work well and have a, a good phenotype and good phenocopy, and other, other times they don't. It doesn't seem to be related to some easy thing like um, the duplication of the zebrafish genome, or um, so uh, it seems stochastic or something that I, don't, that I don't understand. I don't think anyone has a great idea why that's the case. Um, we do have people on the Zoom watching, and someone had a question or a comment. Dr. Priddens in University of Edinburgh, um, she wanted to say that she was involved in the production of the CSFR1R uh, E361K mouse model with David Hume, and it doesn't develop um, ALSP but does have reduced microglia like the patients, and most of her research has involved CSFR or CSF1R rat models, and so she's hoping... Um, because rat macrophages, macrophages are more like human than mouse, she's going to create an ALSP um, model in the rats. Yeah, and I think it would certainly go along with um, problems we've had in modeling sort of innate immunity in other leukodystrophies to have mice not 
replicate the phenotype, right? Uh, uh, nice talk, Troy. Um, question, as, as you pointed out, uh, it, um, transplants are not well tolerated once the disease is too advanced, and we've gone through all these discussions in ALD. What's uh, the guidance now for inclusion and exclusion of patients? And do you have a sense of how to guide fam family members who are asymptomatic and show no MRI abnormalities? Yeah, that's a spot-on question. I think some of it has to come out of this work group on what we're going to do. Um, you know, it's always easy to look at the extremes. So anyone without MRI abnormalities or exam findings, neuropsychological evaluation, evaluation we don't transplant. Onset dementia, probably wouldn't transplant that patient anymore. Uh, anyone with an EDS score of six and a half or higher, the outcomes are going to be the mortality is going to be much higher because we've learned that from the adults with ALD and AMN. Um, and then everything else is somewhat in the middle. And so um, if you show a decline in neurocognition, um, I think that might be a time to start thinking about transplant, even with very mild MRI abnormalities. And as you know, none of, the, none of these patients enhance with gadolinium, at least I've never seen enhancement on their MRIs. Uh, and so uh, that's why I think Earlier is better, but again, we don't do it prophylactically, let's say, because the timing is still wide open. Do you transplant somebody when they're 25, when their mom died at age 45? It seems a little extreme, um, but I guess close vigilance with uh, yearly follow-up is what we're doing and neurocognitive testing every year to look for that first sign of, de of decline, which anecdotally, it seems like it's, it's word hunting. You know, that's when I'm talking with the patient. It seems like that's one of the very early signs, but I don't have data for that. I had a question, I had a question or comment slash question. <laughs> uh, so um, just uh, from walking up to the front uh, before the talks started, it sounds like there's now like multiple centers that have had some experience with um, transplant and just with uh, now there's kind of like a cohort of patients that we've all kind of seen. So... Uh, Jennifer, I don't know if you have any comments about kind of like the database and what your timeline is for that and what your plans are. Well, thank you for asking. Hoping uh, to get some of this information collected as soon as, soon as possible um, my, for the pilot grant as many people that um, are willing to, I will reach out and please reach out to us and join our work group so that we can um, collect the data um, as best as we can and make it easiest for families um, to also contribute to that data set is, is my goal. So ongoing. Dr. Van Achtel? In Amsterdam, we have also transplanted a series of uh, patients and we tend to uh, use the criteria that we also use for metachromatic leukodystrophy. So typically the first patient... Uh, they are big families, so like they have six children and three have uh, ALSB. The first is too late, and then we start uh, monitoring uh, the other siblings, the affected, uh, genetically uh, affected siblings. And um, uh, what's also helpful is monitoring bioneurofilament light, because uh, typically when you see the first lesions on MRI appear, also neurofilament light starts to arise. And uh, we fully agree that it's sort of, in our experience, if uh, the disease is already rather progressive, that uh, the transplant uh, makes it worse and patients die. Uh, so we, have, we are refraining from uh, patients that are really progressive, uh, transplanting patients with really uh, disease progression and try to be really early in the disease course with the first... Um, actually, we, we mostly go by MRI, first MRI abnormalities and a neurofilament light that tries, that's is going up. And still, uh, as I was talking, uh, 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 speaking in the, in the break uh, to each other, the, our outcomes are, are not great. We have a relatively high mortality, much higher than we see in uh, ALD patients and also higher than we see in MLD patients. I, 
Yeah, I'm not talking about that. I we are just uh, when there's an adult with um, ALSP, we test the other siblings and start uh, monitoring. So uh, we are not relying on anything with uh, within siblings. There's one more comment from the chat, which we're going to read aloud. Thank you. Um, so this comes again for Dr. Pridens. She said that she also wants to apply for funding to uh, sequence patients and non-affected family members, and she'll be in touch with the ALSP work group very soon. Yeah, and, and that goes, I think, for anybody who's uh, virtual for all these sessions, is that I think these work groups are still in formation and, and very often will welcome uh, members as we sort of coalesce around these common goals. So thank you very much to our speakers. It was really a lovely talk and, and a disease, I think, where there will be a lot of movement in the coming years. Um, and then I'd like to welcome, uh, last but absolutely not least, our REFSOMS group that is uh, um, ready to go and ready to carry the day uh, with a final talk. Um, and thank you very much. Let me just set you up here. I'll switch with you so I can plug these in. Thank you for getting us to the finish line. Oh. Well, first, I just want to, uh, on behalf of the whole group, we want to thank Adeline for the amazing job that she has done. Along with uh, her team, uh, I really want to thank Omar and Rachel, who have been uh, incredibly patient with me, especially waiting for, uh, uh, for all the p uh, papers and so on that I had to give them, all the documents. And, uh, and I'm grateful just for the opportunity to be here to, to represent uh, the uh, Repsom community and be here with friends and families who mean a great deal to me. So uh, for our work group agenda today, I, I'm Joe Hasey. I'm at the University of Southern California. I'll give a brief introduction and heat map overview. And my two partners in crime are uh, Christy DeMarco, the president and founder of the Global Dare Foundation, will be speaking with a patient advocacy perspective, and Florian Eichler will be talking about natural history studies and model systems. So our work group roster is uh, was quite amazing. They're actually all members of the board, Medical and Scientific Advisory Board of the Global Dare Foundation. And for anybody online or who's actually attending here today who would be interested in uh, joining our work group or potential board in the future, we'd, uh, we'd really welcome you. We, uh, uh, love the fact that it's an international community with people from Amsterdam and the UK playing major roles in addition to a fledgling group of researchers here in the, in the United States. So as an uh, overview, um, ultra, uh, adult resin disease is an ultra-rare um, autosomal recessive disorder, and it's primarily caused by biallelic loss of function variants in the phytonol-CoA hydroxylase gene. And as a result, there's a compared, a compared catabolism of a dietary branch chain fatty acid called phytanic acid. And the accepted hypothesis in the field is that the accumulation of toxic stores of phytanic acid in various tissues is causally responsible for disease. And as Adeline mentioned uh, this afternoon, we're talking about adult onset disorders. And from, uh, you know, from the literature, you can see reports of people ranging from six years of age to 60 years of age first presenting with adult resin disease. But in general, on average, the patients are presenting in their 20s and 30s, primarily with uh, retinitis pigmentosa or loss of night vision. And then there's concomitant with that a uh, loss of, in many cases, sensory neural hearing uh, loss as well as anosmia. You're seeing a late onset uh, polyneuropathy and ataxia. And if the disease is left untreated, um, it can be fatal due to the onset of cardiac arrhythmias. Um, phytanic acid itself is, a, is an interesting molecule. It's derived from the catabolism of chlorophyll in ruminant animals such as cows, as well as zooplankton and krill. So humans cannot appre uh, produce appreciable amounts of phytanic acid by uh, chlorophyll catabolism. And in fact, humans can only obtain phytanic acid from the marine or terrestrial food chain. So we have our friend here, chlorophyll, chlorophyll in the upper right, and you'll see the side chain called phytol. And that could be liberated from the chlorophyll molecule by gut fermentation and microbes in, uh, a plant, in, in uh, ruminant animals in their stomachs, as well as digestion of phytoplankton by you know, zooplankton and krill. As a result of liberating phytol, 
uh, it's known that it gets oxidized to phytanic acid in all land mammals surveyed to date as well as in, in marine organisms. And so phytanic acid is the culprit here. And that's, uh, humans really just uh, get this from the diet. So they do not, uh, they do not endogenously produce uh, phytanic acid. So phytanic acid itself provides no known health benefit to humans. So the way I like to think of it as the 800 pound hippogriff in the room is why not just eliminate phytanic acid from the diet and everybody can uh, go home early and uh, catch their planes. So uh, another guest in our, uh, our advisory board is Professor McGonigal, who you might recall from the Hogwarts School of Medicine. Uh, for those who have taken your hippogriffic oath yourself, you who have went to uh, Hogwarts. And she would say, why not just eliminate it, get a simple spell, change into vegetables, and all is, uh, all is well and done. And so she was a, a great deal of fun on our advisory panel. She recommended us read this book, Phytanic, uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them. And uh, this inspired our work group to think of a cookbook called Phytanic Feasts and How to Avoid Them. And you're seeing our dear friend Ann Mosier is doing the bulk of the work of uh, profiling phytanic acids in, in food. So it's been a wonderful continuing to work with her. On a more serious note, through the history of adult rest and disease research for many decades, the diet has been the, the center of the uh, therapy. Uh, but we do know now that the effect of dietary intervention is not completely understood. There is good uh, evidence that, that slows the progression of vision and hearing loss. And there's also good evidence that it can be able to stave off these cardiac arrhythmias that can be fatal. But the other aspects of disease, it's a little bit more murky simply because it is an ultra rare disease, which very limited numbers of cases have been reported. And in addition, it's really important that phytanic acid stores in adipose can be mobilized in response to stress, such as fasting, illness, and exercise. And, and Christy DeMarco can tell you about her own personal story. I was just was talking to Mark Englund a bit at the break before, and he actually was telling me about some of the, the patients themselves who underwent surgery and um, actually uh, died uh, due to the fact that they had uh, of a cardiac arrhythmia due to the fact that the, during the fasting phase, they just accumulated so much phytanic acid from sto that's stored in the adipose for years in their life. So just the diet itself is not the cure-all. So in terms of research challenges and successes, the Global Dare Foundation is spe spearheading uh, patient registry e uh, efforts uh, Christy is a force in nature, as are all the other patient advocates that are here that really do inspire me and everyone else in this room. Um, we do have a widely accepted basic underlying mechanism of disease, which is phytanic acid toxicity. But therein lies the rub that we don't really understand completely why phytanic acid is toxic. We know that it probably has something to do with mitochondrial dysfunction, but even that is not fully elucidated. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a 5-H no mouse model exists that uh, Florian will speak about that was developed in, in the Netherlands, and it reflects neurological aspects of the disease, but it's still a work in progress. So there's, there's still a lot of um, you know, um, research to be done, and he'll describe some of that in his talk. Um, AOD itself is a multi-systemic disease where the state of clinical outcomes measure vary according to the compartment of interest in this stage of disease progression. So it's a different story if we're talking about vision loss versus the peripheral neuropathy versus the cardiac arrhythmias. So we have to keep that in mind. And right now, no clinical trials have been conducted or are planned at this time. Now, for the clinical challenges and successes, we do know that plasma phytanic acid levels are a robust biomarker of disease and provide the theoretical basis for newborn screening. So this is where you get into the world of anecdotal uh, stories, like Christy will, as, as told me that she knows of a family where they have a six-day-year-old uh, infant who actually was uh, screened and tested for phytanic acid levels in their, in their blood, and it turns out that it was indeed elevated. And there's going to be some efforts now to try to do some retrospective uh, studies on blood spots. Um, the general thought or gestalt is that the phytanic acid levels may not be uh, elevated on day one after birth, but in states where they have a second screening at the second week of life, there might actually be an opportunity to um, catch people with elevated um, phytanic acid levels. So that's all in theory, but it's something that to 
to, to think about. So the phenotypic severity depends on levels of residual gene activity and potentially the causal gene. We talked about this Phi-H gene, this Phytinol-CoA hydroxylase. That's 90% of the cases. About 10% of the cases, there's a defect in this PEX7 gene. For those who are into pexology of the world of peroxisome biogenesis disorders, PEX7 is actually the transporter that will bind to Phi-H, that enzyme, and transport it into the peroxisome where it's involved in the magic of alpha oxidation to break down phytanic acid. All right. So there's a, uh, a small community of experienced, dedicated professionals across the world that focus on ARD medical research. So we do have the best and brightest on the team, which is amazing, and uh, just an amazing collegial group as well to have you know, shared expertise in all areas. And so it's been a joy working with them. And right now, the research community is in the earliest stages of planning treatment guidelines. But that's something where we really want to go, and you'll hear that from both Christy and Florian. And diet and plasmapheresis are well established as having some benefit per, for patients, but are not curative and may not be feasible for everyone. So when we look at this Refsum disease heat map overview, which with my um, impaired vision I put in slightly larger font, uh, you can see a little bit of, that we were pretty optimistic that in general, for uh, the first time that we presented, we see some greens over here, which include the, the preclinical scientific development, and we're thinking that regard that we have pretty good biochemical biomarkers of disease, uh, so we can uh, so we can actually. Uh, use them to diagnose and potentially uh, look for um, uh, treat, treatment interventions to see if we can lower phytanic acid levels in tissues in the patients. Um, in terms of advocacy, where you know Global Dare has just started, but it's really had a major impact on our field. And for therapeutic development, um, unfortunately, even though we do have something robust in the phytanic acid limited diet, we do not have any targeted therapies right now that are going to be aimed at um, you know, lowering phytanic acid burden in various tissues in the body. But there are a number of uh, ways you can envision that from everything from gene therapy to mRNA replacement therapy and so on. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of room for optimism and growth. So at this point, I'll pass the torch to my colleague here, Christy DeMarco. Thanks, Joe. As you can see, I don't have any um, PhD or um, medical degree um, uh, next to my, my name. Uh, but I have gotten a crash course in Refsum. Uh, I was diagnosed uh, three years ago. And uh, what I really, I think, bring to this work group um, uh, in addition to the folks around the table, is I, I, I've been in, in banking for for 24 years, getting multi-million dollar projects executed. Um, so I know how to get stuff done. And so being able to organize the team and um, help drive things forward, um, and as Florian and Joe will attest to, I'm the squeaky wheel that constantly wants the grease. Uh, so, um, but uh, it's, it's a pleasure being here. I'm really excited to have Refsum uh, talked about at this conference. So um, let me go to the first, first page here. So I um, uh, started Global Dare Foundation about three and a half years ago after I received uh, my diagnosis. It took me a couple years uh, to get a diagnosis. I think I got a couple of diagnoses before I actually got my Refsum diagnosis. Uh, they actually thought I had MS. Uh, I w presented with you know, neuropathy and some vision loss, and they thought I had MS. Some spots on the brain, I think, is also is what uh, they were telling me. But that obviously wasn't it. It wasn't until I got genetic testing that I actually found out that I had Refsum's disease. Um, what I found out was that there was some really great re research done in the past, um, but no one was really doing anything. It's good 15 years since anyone has really picked up the torch for, for Refsum and done any research or um, advancements. And so, you know, I found the only way we, you really can get stuff done in this field is to start a patient group. And so that's what I did with a couple of other um, patients as well as some family members, whoever I could kind of pull in <laughs> uh, to get the, get the work done. So we started Global Dare Foundation, and the mission is simple, right? We, we want to improve the quality of life. Uh, of patients, and so that's what we're doing. We've we started out with um, a, a, a connecting with about 26 patients, and a, after three years, we've connected with 60. Um, so every year, we're growing a little bit more. Um, as as uh, Joe said, it's a one in a million that we from what we know, um, but I think there's a lot of, as I'll show you in some of our patient registry metrics, it's, it takes a long time to get a diagnosis. So I think there's a lot of people out there that we haven't connected with yet. 
Um, so some of the successes, uh, um, Joe said we started a patient registry. So uh, in my professional career, I know that uh, data uh, drives insights uh, and decisions. And uh, uh, so when I, when I was researching how do you get research started, they're like, you got to get a patient registry. I actually tried to get a patient registry started before I started a foundation. I contacted the ULF. I contacted, I actually think I contacted CHOP about their leukodystrophy um, registry. Um, and they're like, no, you, you really need a patient organization before you can start a registry it's a lot of work I'm like okay well I guess I'll, I'll go for the patient organization um, uh, so today as I said so we've connected with 60 patients we have about 50% of those in the registry so that's uh, I want everyone in the registry but I hear 50% is a pretty good uh, percentage for just getting started a couple of years ago um, and, and it really was um, you know our goal wasn't clinical trial readiness you know at this point right all I really wanted to do was bring our patient population into a, a central repository and start to learn some things about the disease. We also had patient input on the questions uh, because there's a couple of things that aren't noted in literature or understood from a clinical perspective and they wanted to understand are these things part of the disease? Is it common across patients? And so it, even if it's just to give us some insights on what areas of research we should pursue. Um, so it's been really great. I'm gonna tell you a little bit, show you a little bit of, of the metrics because I'm a data geek myself. Um, so I like to do a little bit of analysis and I'll show you what that looks like. Uh, food testing program. Has anyone seen fatanic acid on a food label? No. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the past, there was about 150 foods tested, which is not that many, right? And so that is the the food testing that was used to actually inform the initial diet. Um, so you can only imagine a lot of assumptions went into putting together that diet. As an example, they tested nuts, you know, one nut, you know, and that was high in fatanic acid, so all nuts were excluded. Well, that for patients, you know, like that that's a big impact. I mean, you all know food is part of our daily, you know, um, uh, regimen, right? Uh, it, it, it impacts us in lots of ways. And so one of the really low-hanging fruit that we thought was really great to get people engaged and, and be able to make an impact for patients was to test more foods. And so uh, we uh, coursed Ann Moser uh, to help us out in testing some foods. And we, we actually understand there's an additional um, uh, marker to test for uh, biochemically as well for um, phytol fatty esters, which can be broken down into fatan acid as well and so uh, our first year we tested 60 foods we're testing another 40 this year and it's really made a difference to inform the guidance now we have a really great traffic light system of go you can eat whatever you want yellow a little bit of caution and red you know don't eat any of that um, and so it's made a big impact to patients and gotten patients engaged right so anytime you can get um, people interested in what you're doing uh, the more more um, engagement you can get I'll let, um, you know, Florian's going to talk a little bit about the Center of Excellence and the Refs and Mouse Model, but just to touch a little bit on it from a patient perspective, you know, Florian and I, I think it's about a year ago, him and I kind of brainstormed the idea of there, there was this Refsum Center of Excellence in the UK, not really accessible for those individuals in the US. And so how, did, how could we create something like that in the US? And um, me, me being the squeaky wheel, talked to Florian and said, hey, could we bring our, our uh, Center of Excellence together in in, um, in Boston at Mass General and Mass Ioneer, we've got a multidisciplinary team that's come together. And, and to me, that makes such a difference to patients. I know even just myself being able to go for a couple of days and see all of the specialists and actually have them talking to one another, you know, and, and understanding the full picture of the patient just makes a tremendous difference for us. And then, and also, you know, that um, center is well connected with our um, Refsum Center of Excellence in London, so they can do comparative case studies and things of that nature and learn from one another. Um, and the Refsum Mouse Model, there was one, you know, there was a lot of great work done in the past, and like I said, not much has been done in the last uh, 15 or so years, but there was a mouse model created, and that's being picked up. It's been brought to Kennedy Krieger, and we're starting some, we just had some, some discussions last week, you know, around some translational studies that we're going to get started, so really excited about that progress. Um, just to give you a little bit of the data analysis I've done on the patient registry data. Um, so in the, we have about 17 countries that we, we know patients, um, we are connected with patients, but 10 countries are represented in our registry. We've got 33 patients so far. Um, most of them, as you can see, 74% are, are generally diagnosed through genetic testing, not through clinical um, test, clinical diagnosis. 
Um, the interesting thing is um, uh, pain isn't necessarily a top symptom as far as Refsum is concerned, but 60%, 67% of our patients experience daily pain. Um, and I know from personal experience that's exhausting. So is that is that something that we can do for patients? Um, and then what was really interesting as well is that the clinic in London who's really been driving the, the diet, um, it looks to manage people down to a, a level of 200 micromoles uh, per liter of um, phytanic acid in their blood. But as you can see from the middle chart, um, on average, 50% of the uh, um, individuals have greater than that over a three-year period. So why is that? Is, is that, you know, they're also reporting 96% good compliance, strict compliance to the diet, or are there other factors at, at play? As, as Joe said, you know, we store phytanic acid in our, in our cells and our, our fats and nerves over the course of so many years. Are people not getting good advice when it comes to um, weight loss or exercise or fasting for surgeries. Um, uh, I've definitely heard anecdotal evidence from patients that they're not giving the right advice when it comes to those things. So is that a factor or is there something else? But something to look into further as far as the research goes. Um, we also, um, we don't have clinical guidelines. So, you know, one of the things was to really understand how are people being treated today as well? Like how often are they, um, you know, seeing certain specialists? How often are they having certain tests? How often even do they have their phytanic acid level tests? Which I thought was really surprising that 44% only have it done on a yearly basis when that's the only way we really have to, to manage our, our diet. That would be like a, a diabetic only getting their, their A1C once a year or, or even taking their glucose once a year. Um, so really interesting information, and we'll just continue to collect um, as time goes on. Uh, so for some challenges for quality of life of patients. So late diagnosis is, is significant. If we could improve the, the, the shorten the length of time to diagnosis, that would be significant for patients because the diet does make an impact, right? It does slow vision. It does slow hearing loss. It might not prevent it from happening, but if I could keep my vision for 10, 20 years longer, I'd want to do it, right? So the sooner we could get someone on the diet, the, the person that um, Joe mentioned that got his diagnosis at six, six days, he has really no symptoms, and he's 26 or 27 now. So um, where his sister, who was di he was diagnosed because his sister um, was diagnosed at 10, you know, she has many more of the symptoms. So early diagnosis makes a difference. And so the more we can educate, and, you know, often they're diagnosed with a retinitis pigmentosa diagnosis first. Um, if we can get people diagnosed at that point at least, you know, a newborn screening would be ideal. But obviously, um, Joe mentioned we have a, maybe a potential couple of complications with that. Um, but even if we could educate ophthalmologists to be looking and screening for this, um, and, and if, if folks aren't interested in doing a genetic panel, at least do a phytanic acid level, because um, that's a good indication of the disease. Uh, lack of clinical knowledge, we're hoping to, to, to help solve that with the centers of excellence, but we have no clinical guidelines and even any consensus level guidelines, so, and, and that's a challenge for patients, right, because they're getting different, different care wherever they go, um, and think of the uh, developing countries, they're not, they really, there is no, no guidelines out there to direct um, physicians on how to, how to care for patients, and so that um, obviously provides a, a lesser quality of life. Uh, Photanic acu uh, acid accumulation. So, um, you know, the we know that it accumulates over time, and and the impact on patients is significant, right? Because just think about your everyday. You know, you're tr you're you're as you're often trained as a as just a human. Fat burning is good for you. Well, fat burning isn't good for me. <laughs> you know, um, I've got to minimize my fat burning. I've got to minimize. Um, I've got to be really careful when I exercise. I have to be really careful when I um, go for surgery or if I'm sick. I have to be very careful. That's a huge impact to patients. So, you know, what, how, what, how, what, what can we learn about, um, about uh, the toxicity of phytanic acid and ways that we could potentially help patients from that perspective? Um, and, you know, as Joe said, the, the, the diet has limitations. You know, it doesn't might slow things, but it doesn't prevent things. So how can we, uh, how can we make um, steps towards um, better therapies in the future? So that's, that's it for me. I'm going to hand it all over to Florian. Great. Uh, thanks, Chrissy. Thanks, Joe. Um, and I'm delighted, actually, to have learned so much from, uh, from Christy uh, about this and uh, hope to bring 
all the resources uh, we have in, in Boston to this disease. It's very nice actually to have a series of adult leukodystrophies here in this last session because I see a lot of similarities in thinking about CTX and ADLD in, in, in this context um, uh, really um, makes you think of similarities. And as um, Christy said, um, part of the goal of um, organizing and um, creating a center of excellence in Boston is to really build on what has happened in the UK uh, for many decades and, and learn from uh, uh, guys in St. Thomas Hospital. And we're very fortunate to have close relations with uh, Tony Rabitsky, Radha Ramachandran, who've uh, taught us so much together with their dietitians there. So really build centralized expertise in Refsum disease uh, um, using that uh, knowledge and that and raising the profile of Refsum disease for earlier diagnosis. Building community amongst people with Refsum disease in the U.S. and their caregivers. I will say that most of the patients that come to my clinic come because of Christy, and Christy is really the driving force here who is bringing so much of the community together and having patients talk to each other, inform themselves, and bring knowledge to us physicians is really making all the difference in terms of care and management. Uh, nevertheless, we have the opportunity to uh, bring several um, specialists together and coordinate clinical appointments across disciplines, improve standard of care. We have um, ophthalmology and uh, ENT at Mass Ionia right uh, next door, uh, a wonderful uh, neuromuscular um, specialist, uh, Dr. Sejadi, physiatry, and then metabolic specialists who are really keeping an eye on phytanic acid levels together with uh, dietitian Dominica Nichols. So what we're really trying to do here is um, is um, bring clinical care and research together as we are seeing patients and we're gathering knowledge. We're also establishing an IRB to collect data, collect information, and clearly we're still at the very beginnings of doing this. Uh, but by also seeing patients, I'm always uh, keenly aware of, of identifying unmet need and knowledge gaps, the things that we might be reading about adult refsum disease might not be the things that are ailing patients, and the spectrum of this disease might be far uh, larger than we are currently aware of. So um, collaborate broadly and internationally, and I think it's really nice to have the group in the UK that are also helping us along. So one of the things I like to do when I encounter a new disease is to do an inventory and often starts with the literature, what has been known to date, what has been published. And although this disease has been known uh, about for a long time, there's really been a, a, a very sparse literature, I'd say, and a, really a, a stuttering of papers over the uh, decades. And um, I had a very talented high school student, Christopher Eaton, who uh, uh, joined and was very enthusiastic about um, performing a literature review and had identified 247 uh, patients across 67 papers, and uh, similar to the graphics that Christy showed, uh, the, the most prominent uh, symptoms were retinitis pigmentosa in uh, close to 70% of patients, ataxia, uh, and peripheral neuropathy, uh, sec uh, second and third, and then hearing loss and other organs affected, and uh, in, in the, along the themes of, of um, Joe introducing the um, Hogwarts uh, um, enthusiasm, I, I, I decided to put in this hardcore hat. So this is all coming from Joe, so I, I also credit him for all the nice slides here. Um, research challenges here are um, um, clearly a, a, a long understanding model systems of the disease. There is a PHYH, a null mouse that was uh, developed by Sasha van in uh, Amsterdam and then reestablished at uh, Johns Hopkins. We were very lucky to have Joe Scafidi now working on this and bringing all his talents uh, to this. And this is a mouse that uh, is with Phytol supplementation showing a worsening of phenotype. You can see that in a dose-dependent way, there is an increase in phytanic acid levels across um, uh, highest in, in liver um, and c contributing to um, a worsening of uh, liver disease in this mouse as well as um, ataxia and the peripheral neuropathy also worsening. Uh, there is a, also a loss of uh, Kinji cell neurons uh, in, in this mouse as well. Importantly, there is no sign of uh, retinitis or eye abnormalities, and so there will be things that this mouse will be helpful for. There are other things that there will be limitations around. So we really have to understand 
and how to optimize dietary exposure to study also this mobilization of uh, phytanic acid out of adipose tissues. Is this going to be the right model in a mouse to study this? Uh, but it is clearly of central concern to patients and conducting in-depth phenotyping of the mice relevant to the human context. Research challenges extend uh, beyond to uh, testing therapeutic hypotheses. I think we really are still at the beginning of understanding uh, the basis for phytanic acid toxicity in mouse and cellular models. Um, I th um, similar to maybe some of the other genes that we've heard about in the last few sessions, uh, this might very mu well be a f um, less a disease-causing gene as a susceptibility gene where you um, have a susceptibility but here with more pronounced metabolic uh, component and what are the aggravating factors, what are the modifiers that are contributing uh, here. Um, so metabolic stressors and liberating phytanic acid stores in adipose tissue strikes me as a low-hanging fruit here. If we can understand that, we can understand physiology and really run very um, uh, short-term um, experiments and, and uh, understand how to maybe bring about successful trials in shorter periods than uh, otherwise in, in chronic adult onset diseases. Um, we can evaluate genetic therapies to enhance phytanic acid oxidation in the liver. Uh, there are some ongoing uh, uh, projects in gene augmentation and um, mRNA replacement to reduce phytanic acid burden across the body. But uh, risk burden uh, ratio might, uh, risk benefit ratio might be uh, different in this disorder and uh, uh, gene therapy may not be the first thing to pursue. So developing alternative approaches like small molecule therapies to enhance um, minor alternative alpha um, omega oxidation pathways uh, could be helpful. I think in uh, all cases we want to understand the pathophysiology behind this. Are we targeting certain specific cells? Or are we thinking about non-cell autonomous um, um, pathophysiology and having a mouse model and to, to do this uh, certainly is a first important step, but we might uh, need other model systems along the way. So many challenges ahead, but it's uh, great to have uh, Christy and Joe and many others here that I've uh, shown along for the ride. Thank you. Joe, thank you for your um, for your thematic uh, addition to the slides. Those were fun. Questions from the audience? Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, Christy, I have a question for you. I am such a fan of everything you have done in such a short period of time. You were taking us all by storm and are such an inspiration. That's not a question, but <laughs> that's, Thank just, you. that's just a statement. Um, my question for you is you have gathered so much important information on how patients are managing their symptoms and what's really affecting them. But oftentimes that information is siloed away from doctors and the advice doctors are given. So how do you propose we can help to, to integrate the patient experience into how we counsel families going forward? That's a good question. So you're thinking about the, the patient registry data we're collecting and how does it help inform uh, the clinic clinicians and things like that. That is something that I've been thinking about. Like how do I actually do something with the data that we're, we're collecting? And one of the things that um, I've talked about with Joe um, is it looking at the ability to publish that data in some way. Um, you know, you know what, what level of scrutiny is the data required to, to be under? It is IRB approved, you know, through Sanford Cords. Um, so I, I feel like we should be able to use the data to publish it. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it, it would be great to be able to do that. And we are looking at, you know, it's all, there's also... Um, I always say that there's just so much to do, you know, trying to find, like, when, when do we do it? Do we wait for a certain period of time? We've been collecting it for a couple of years now. It's a certain number of patients we should wait for. Um, but I, I, I agree we should be using the data in some way to help inform um, uh, clinicians and others and, and potentially look at areas of research, as I was saying. So thank you, Linda. 
I have a, a question and a comment too. Um, I think that that you know some of the groups, some of the work groups are thinking about sort of standard of care recommendations and sort of consensus statements. And I guess would it be possible for your work group to think about um, sort of building on the patient reported information to sort of um, make consensus care recommendations, sort of like translating effectively those those patient um, impressions into uh, something that into doctor speaks so that doctors, you know, know what to measure, when to measure uh, based on expert opinion, uh, given the lack of probably more global evidence. So, I mean, that was one, one of the reasons why we put some of those questions in the registry, right, is to understand, you know, how are, how are patients being treated today and is that, you know, providing good outcomes. Um, the h hard part I, I'm not sure is whether we know that the care that they're getting is good, getting good outcomes. Like I, I, fa I found it was very interesting that, um, as I mentioned in my talk, that vitanic acid level is only tested once a year in 44% of the patients, which seems rather, I, I get mine done monthly, which, you know, maybe that's more. I'm a data geek, so maybe, you know, I, I'm interested in finding out. But I, I feel like if you're going to exercise or you're going to look to lose weight, like you would want to track your levels more often to see whether spikes in those level, levels are actually causing symptoms. Um, so I don't know whether it would, it would at least let us know how people are being cared for and whether that would be insightful um, into the potential standards of care. Um, we are working on those standards of care um, in our uh, the UK clinic. They they've got the biggest cohort of patients. It's twenty or more patients that they care for, and so I think they've got a standard of care. They just have never published one, you know. And so we're kind of pushing on publishing that. And even if it's just a consensus guide at this point, you know, that's better than nothing, because um, patients are often educating clinicians on what to do. Maybe I'll just add two, two, two quick things. So I think the, the heterogeneity actually of the phenotype is, is much greater than uh, evident in the literature at this point. So I think we're sort of still in a, in a phase of, of data gathering and, and uh, defining uh, the, the course of this uh, disease. And the second thing is that in different countries and different places, there's differences in practice. And plasmapheresis is very much dependent on where you live in certain countries. Germany, Argentina, they will do it more often. And uh, so how to standardize things and give guidance is, is difficult. I think at this point, we need to describe what's happening, describe the outputs and outcomes. Um, and, and that, I think, is already an important step forward. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think, I think the thing is, is that, as Joe mentioned, without the right um, guidance, sometimes patients are as in, in a situation like surgery, if someone goes for surgery, if they're not given the right guidance, it could have drastic effects. Yeah. You know, so by not having any of the guidance out there, that causes for, for concern with patients' um, overall health. So, okay. Any other questions? Yes, Dr. Denny. <laughs> Sorry, I got too excited by this talk. Um, my other question for you is, have you thought to reach out to other providers that are outside the typical leukodystrophy sphere, the ophthalmologist, even the anesthesiologist, to raise their awareness of Rebsum? Because I think we could potentially facilitate diagnosis in anyone that would be at risk at a much earlier time course before you have catastrophic sequelae of disease. Yeah, the, the ophthalmologist is the um, one that we're looking to target first because they're the, generally the ones that see see patients first, right? They they generally, in their teens, early 20s, get diagnosed with retinitis pigmentosa. If if the doctor just asked a few more questions, like, I mean, I, you know, most patients uh, on the registry information, you would see that, you know, 70% of the patients have shortened fingers or toes. That's like a visible sign of the disease, right? They could you know, easily, you know, ask, not, not that many ophthalmologists ask people to take their shoes and socks off. I mean, we might be like looking at them like they're crazy, but you know, hey, it, to me, like a, a Dr. Bart Leroy, who's on our medical and scientific advisory board, he's like, he always asks all patients to take off their shoes and socks, you know. Um, but yeah, I think educating where we have started also with um, blindness foundations around the world and educating them, you know, on Refsum and getting Refsum on their, their websites. And, um, you yeah, know, because if, one in a million is a is a big 
one little tiny um, you know, needle in a big, huge um, haystack. But if we narrowed it down to the retinitis pigmentosa community, it might be a much smaller haystack. And we could find it's probably maybe one in 300 in retinitis pigmentosa community versus one in a, in a million um, in the broader community. So, um, but absolutely, we're, we're looking. Just manpower. I need more manpower. <laughs> I have a full-time job on top of this job, so. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, we're going to applaud our um, speaker of the last session. And before we disband, I just wanna, I just wanna offer some thanks. I wanna offer some gratitude to everybody who gave up two days of time with family and work and other activities to participate. I wanna offer gratitude to our, our team here uh, at CHOP and the overall GLIA uh, group that, that helped prepare for, you know, and create the, the rubrics and the work group um, questionnaires. I want to really thank all the work group leaders um, for, uh, for all their efforts and the work group participants for all their, um, their uh, input. And I want to also uh, send out a, a very special thanks to uh, our, both our advocates and our industry partners who worked with us and who are, um, you know, forming a collaborative team with us to, to advance care and therapies in this disease. And we will be in touch with the work group leaders about next steps um, because we're planning on turning the, the work from this uh, conference into um, a consensus statement so that we all have a clear and shared sense of the goals and the needs moving forward. And I look forward to ongoing work um, within the work groups uh, in the months and years to come. Thank you very much for coming and have safe trips home. <laughs>